Arc 9, Gleaming, Chapter 12 Antares, Goddess said. I felt a little bit of fear and awe as I stopped re-wrapping my bandage and turned to face her. Good work, she said. You're mercurial, but you can be pretty fucking useful. If you wanted it, I could bring you to my world and give you a lesser country. A country? Wow, Rain said beside me. I don't think I'm mercurial. I said, frowning a bit. And I'm grateful for the offer, but I'm a city girl. I'd rather help the megalopolis, and if it comes down to it, make sure people here support you too. It wouldn't work that way. Something's bothering me. So far, you and your team have been on top of things. Tell me something about the current attack. We didn't get all of them. There are two more to deal with. Blindside, you can't look at them can't aim at them. They would be the reason my danger sense is limited. Probably. Stymied? Interfered with. I can't extend it past a certain range. It's worse since I've moved in this direction. A motion of her arm indicated the direction traveled. That's the access tunnels, isn't it? Byron asked. Our teammates. Teacher had sent Blindside straight there. We need to go, I said. Stay, goddess said, her voice firm. My jaw clenched. I nodded. Sorry. Tell me about the other, she said. Two of teachers powered got through. At least. The other was kingdom come. He detonates himself into a shower of blood and meat. Anyone who comes into contact with it is his puppet. He reforms after. I think I've met him, or one of his blood-stained puppets. They wouldn't align to my purposes. One of teacher's many counters to me. He's a mercenary. It's possible that he might accept your offer of a country. He sounds religious, Rain said. Name like that. Could be, I said. We should go. If Blindside is in the access tunnels, you'll stay for a few minutes. I may need you for something else, Goddess told us. The access tunnels are the communication outlet to the outside world. They may also be the override to the bomb anklets. This is important. My danger sense, blind as it is, tells me we have other priorities. If your teammates were in danger, I think I would feel it. Stay. We had done more than our share of the work when it came to taking down Lung and the pharmacist, and we were, putting it lightly, exhausted. I didn't like staying, but I didn't mind the chance to recuperate. I felt like I'd been wrung out, then baked too long over an open fire. I hadn't even properly used my muscles, and I felt completely and utterly drained. Goddess walked over to discuss things with Lung, and others were organizing into battle lines and squads, breaking away to go wrangle remaining guards and staff. I saw Natalie among the wrangled. I hesitated a moment, wondering if I'd do more harm than good, then broke away from Rain and Byron. If I was close enough for Goddess to find, then that had to be good enough. But I couldn't leave Natalie. I'll be right back. Get my attention if there's trouble. Sure, Byron said. A reality with parahumans was that most who triggered were young. People as young as twelve could trigger, with the upper range being thirty. There was a possibility for a few years of leeway, trending more toward the rare parahuman being younger than a parahuman being older. The guys in this particular prison clique were young. It was shocking to see people reign in Chris's ages. Don't hurt or bother them, I told the prisoners, my eye stopping on Natalie for a meaningful moment, trying to communicate something to her, that I was on her side that if she had anything to say, now was the time to say it. She said nothing, maybe to avoid drawing attention to herself. And the prisoners, for their part, were equally silent. I felt put on the spot, and I felt so drained physically, mentally, and emotionally that I could have been bowled over by hard words. Tension kept me upright. I hadn't gotten a response, so I elaborated. Goddess may need them as bargaining chips, or to get access to parts of the prison. If you screw that up, 
touch them or scare them and they get panicking instead of thinking rationally, then it screws us all up. Believe me, I put my heart into the mental command. Buy this, even though I don't sound nearly as authoritative as I might want. Don't make me use my aura in this volatile place. I don't see why you get to tell us what to do, a boy said. He had the sharp chin, widow's peak with a curl of hair at the forehead, and natural bad boy glare of a classic kids' show villain. But he had to be my age. He also, judging by the group's dynamic, had a few people under his wing. Underlings. He was the leader of this sub -click. Do you really want to test me and find out? I asked. I sounded more steely now, a bit more of my old self. He stared me down, then dropped his eyes to my arm. I wasn't sure if he was seeing an injury, a clue that I wasn't invincible, until he gestured. That symbol on your arm. Worked into the metal at my shoulder was a golden circle inside another circle, centered at about the midpoint between bicep and shoulder. The five parallel spikes stabbed up from it. Gold morning, I said. Then you were there. That's the thing people put on their sleeves if they were there or if they played a part. Some don't put anything on their sleeves, but they were there. Lung, goddess, I said. Why? You put it there for a reason, right? Everyone has their reasons for wearing the armbands, I said. I worried I sounded defensive. Again, I asked, why? I'm not going to test you or test her, he said, out of respect for that. There were a few nods around his group. One or two looked unsure, like the stupider, less together members of the group weren't sure if it was for real. I wasn't sure I believed it was for real. Good man, I said, deciding there was no way to hammer it out. I met Natalie's eyes momentarily before turning away. Nothing from her in the way of signals. Damn it. I went back to Rain and Byron, walking past a group that was preparing for the possibility of a frontal assault by teacher. Others were preparing to deal with the maximum security individuals who had apparently been given the pharmacist's drugs. An attack from within, an attack from outside, and then there was teacher who had the ability to hit us from oblique angles. I wanted to ask Kenzie for a status report, but that meant approaching Monokeros. I wanted to ask the boys, but they were talking to Cole Belcher. I checked my phone three times in the course of a single minute, even though I knew that all communications were jammed. It was a force of habit, a creeping anxiety as we went longer and longer without any input from the other half of Breakthrough. I had a lot of anxieties in this moment. The small-scale victory with Lung and the pharmacist only went so far. Byron and Rain exchanged a few muttered words as they walked over from where Cole Belcher was. You apparently made an impression, Byron said. I frowned. With Cole Belcher? He said you said you'd get him out. I thought we had a problem when he called us over, but he changed his tune. Us being right about the danger of the cafeteria helped, Rain said. I didn't say I'd get him out, but I let him believe it. It could have backfired, come back down on your head, if he didn't think I at least tried, if this whole thing wrapped up and then he ended up frustrated with only you as a target. It worked out, Rain said, almost like he was assuring me. Then, quieter, he said, one of the few things that has. I followed their line of sight as they both turned back to look at someone. Seer, in his civilian clothes, mask off. The man was of a similar type to Cole Belcher, but without the long stubble on his face sticking in every direction. His hair was longer with some gray already in it. The circles under his eyes were black for reasons other than the coal-spit face paint. The tattoos gave him away. Sir, I observed. He's not a fan of us, Byron said. We're all on the same side, but that doesn't mean he doesn't want to get back at us. At me. Rain said. I don't think it's an immediate problem, but if we have any choice in where we go, we should go wherever he isn't. Agreed, I said, 
as I looked over at Lookout and Monokeros. They were with another group, Lookout hanging a half-step back while Monokeros talked with some scary-looking women. Monokeros was currently listening, as another woman did all of the talking. The talker was pretty where her skin was intact, but had what looked like scars from a bad burn extending all the way down her neck. Another woman stood beside her, top already removed, torn up into shreds, and the shreds plated into a cord. The cord was being knotted into a hangman's noose. The other two had noticed I was looking. What about her? I asked. Why did you not want me to approach Lookout? Lookout came on a little strong with the lady in blue, Rain said. It made her suspicious. She's suspicious of you, too, you know, but she knows she can beat you. Yeah, I said. Monokeros, though? If you've got a canary you're worried about and a cat that's restless, and you're really good at managing your animals, which we know she is, maybe you give the canary a cat babysitter, Rain suggested. That doesn't make me feel better, I said. It doesn't make us feel that much better, Rain said. But we can trust that the lady in blue knows what she's doing. We know from what Swan Song says that Monokeros is really messed up and touchy, and we don't disturb that scene while it's peaceful. I frowned. Monokeros was smiling now. I was creeped out by something in how she presented herself, but I couldn't tell if it was because of something ugly in her peeking out, the contrast in her charmer attitude with the tattoos like the triangle at her forehead making me think of... of certain individuals, or if it was because I knew that she'd gone full ritual killer, killing heroes, kids, hopeful young vistas, shielders, and finales. Kids who had faced the worst day of their lives and came out the other end wanting to help people. She was corporate, like Tristan and me, Byron said. Goldenrod. Yeah, I acknowledged. Byron went on. Started her own team, talked it up, but it never seemed to get off the ground. Too many kids went missing, but they still didn't zero in on her. The masks, the secret identities, they make it so the kids cover up her tracks for her, making it harder to draw the connection. Families, too, Rain said. Um, Jessica said something about this to me at one point, that people with powers tend to have worse relationships with their family. If they had good support systems, they'd be less likely to trigger, I said. Yeah. Byron said. Exactly. They didn't catch her until the second kid who left a message with people letting them know she was interviewing with a team. They brought a different thinker for the interview with her second time around. The first one was an inquisitor type, sensed wrongs, guilt, saw memories that haunted people, used them or summoned them. Summoned, I said, and she had nothing to summon. Ah, you know the story then. I was wondering if it was just the talk shared between the corporate teams, Byron said. No, it was the talk in general, among capes at least. A horror story among capes. Byron nodded. Monokeros smiled. It was the kind of smile that was practiced, then reused so many times it looked natural. A model's smile. The smile of a hero who lifted off their brand, like the corporate and sponsored heroes, and maybe the small family teams with an up-and-coming generation of youths. She reminds me of... of someone, Byron said. Not all the time, but there... A crash interrupted him. And with that crash, a dozen powers nearby flared into effect. I was already in the air flying up to where I could activate the wretch without annihilating two of my teammates. It was Goddess. With her power, she was tearing a building to the ground. Once people realized it was her, they relaxed. I took their cue, floating back down to the ground and my two teammates. What's she doing? Byron murmured. With the disorientation of the fight and the change in the landscape around us, it took me a second to place where we were and what that building might have been. It was one of the prison buildings, but not an apartment, and given the proximity to the yard, equal access from both sides. 
the cafeteria, with all of the anti-goddess meds in it, Rain said. That's a bit of a relief. Simplifies things. I nodded, silent. Better. Goddess turned her head around until she found our group. She beckoned. As glad as I was to stay put, I was glad to be moving. We had an objective. While Rain and Byron walked, me floating just ahead of the pair, Goddess turned, beckoning to others. To Lookout and Monokeros. Then to Damsel, to Ashley's sister. I looked back for Natalie and saw her in the company of the other staff that had been taken into custody. It was a dangerous atmosphere, with the guard-prisoner relationship reversed and a lot of dangerous prisoners around. Monokeros was a certain kind of evil, but she wasn't the only evil person around here. If one of those people decided to hurt Natalie, would anyone stop them? Breakthrough, Goddess said. She looked at Damsel, who was approaching. In a sense. Most of us, Lookout said. Then she leaned over to greet Byron, Rain, and me with a, Hi! You can have a luxury vehicle, and you can get your luxury vehicle with all of the extras, Damsel said, raising her chin a little, claws moving at her side. Both are good. I don't care, Goddess said, annoyed. My danger sense is telling me something's coming, and it's not the kind of danger I have a lot of experience with. Destroying the drugs didn't help. I think Teacher is doing something, and you have the most information about him and what he's doing. Solve it. We need more information than that, I said. What is your danger sense telling you? How does it function? My power is a feeling, she said. It can come from a direction. It tastes of intent. It has flavors depending on the kind of danger. This tastes hollow, and it feels big. There's no direction to it. The opposite, the lack of direction, is the danger. Have you felt anything like this before? I asked. I felt something roughly this big once. It was when the world was ending, the golden man. I drew in a deep breath, looking at the others. They seemed about as alarmed as that as I was. You've said it's big, world ending, but this is a small world, one penal colony. Rain suggested. When I was pulled into a battlefield, that world was small too, Precipice. The scale is similar. Broken trigger? Byron suggested. The powers that have gone wild? Goddess asked. It could be. But even that would feel it has direction. An enemy or a power source. We've heard of incidents where one person became a very large-scale effect— the kind that would cover this whole colony and then some, I said. I think the catch is that the most precogs and danger sensors can't see triggers coming, even broken ones. Goddess shook her head, but she didn't offer anything specific that would clarify matters. I felt my heartbeat accelerate some, just from seeing her this concerned. I've felt this directionless threat before, she said. It was after I came into my power, before I'd exercised it and learned its limits, someone came for me. A monster, but the bitch looked human. She sent me to Shin. To give this feeling a name? It's inevitability. A doom through a nearly complete and total lack of options. Inevitable doom? Affecting this whole world? Rain asked. Hollow? Hollow with a bloody aftertaste. I've never felt a hollow doom before. Goddess said. Maybe one of you has. Figure this out, now. I'm an expert in worlds ending, traps, and being doomed. Been hearing about it for years. Sometimes my whole life, Rain said. Has it been inching closer all night? I stopped looking when the purple fire blinded me. There was nothing before then. I started looking after, and it was there. Are there more questions? If you can't give me an answer, I'll ask others. There was a pause. We shook our heads. Goddess used her telekinesis to lift herself off the ground, flying past the mud to another group that was at the admin building. No reports on teacher? I asked Lookout. No, but I've been distracted. Our guys on the far side are just about out of gas. 
He's got guys masked, but he's waiting instead of sending them in. Back up for the big gun? I asked. Except not a gun, Damsel said. She moved her hand, one blade extended, the tips of the other folding loosely around it. She winked at me. Guns can be dealt with by bigger guns. Uh, yeah, I said. Could it be an endbringer? Rain asked. Jesus, Byron said. Don't even joke. They've been dormant. They can't be predicted easily with danger sense either, I said. I'm trying to think of things big enough. It'd be embarrassing to be the kid who grew up in an Endbringer cult who doesn't think of Endbringers when we're debating possible apocalypse scenarios. Seven plagues? The four horsemen? I like death, Damsel said. He has style. Back when I was a hometown hero, my... We joked about the Undersiders being the four horsemen. Guy in black with the skull, girl with the locusts, girl with the howling hellhounds and spiked collar, and the guy who controlled people. You lost me with that one, Byron said, and I've actually read the Bible. Depending on interpretations, the guy in white is seen as either conquest or famine, Rain said. Oh, like conquest from the Toronto segment of the Maggie Holt series, Lookout said, all excitement now that she was back in the conversation. She took a step forward, and Monokeros reached out, seizing her by the shoulder. Everyone present reacted in some way to that, even Damsel. You stay with me, camera girl. Goddess's orders, Monokeros said. She didn't look the slightest bit worried that the rest of us were poised like we might use powers or throw a punch given an excuse. Okay, Lookout said to Monokeros. Then she said, I liked that book, even though a lot of people didn't. I listened to the audiobook, Damsel said. Yes, yes! That's great, you're great, and of course I'm stating the obvious by saying that. Of course. Glad to see someone with a brain. We need our brains focused on figuring out what teacher's disaster scenario is, not in, uh, asserting the obvious, I said. Two people with brains. I'm starting to see why she likes you all. I kept talking. I'm glad you guys are developing a friendship, but let's think. The sooner we work it out, the sooner we can help our teammates. That includes Swansong and Tress. It might be famine, Rain said. Famine? I asked. She said it was hollow, and it was something Goddess never experienced or knew. Inevitable if he sets it up right. And it destroys her. She was probably going after the feeling when she destroyed the food stock, but if we get desperate enough, people are going to dig out the food, contaminated, they'll undress the drug, and... And Teacher gets everything he wants, I said. It's a siege. Not catapults and walls siege, but a starve the other guy out siege, Rain said. People back at the compound were always taking measures to plan for scenarios like this. There's nothing but wilderness around us, Byron said. To feed an entire prison? Indefinitely? Knowing that you can't roam too far when the bombs could reactivate at any time? Maybe, but I don't think it's that easy. I can totally see Teacher picking off people who go hunting with portals and hit squads. Okay, I could buy that. It made sense. It doesn't make sense, Lookout said. I have the keys. He might have broken down the front door, but so long as I'm lensing the space map, it's my door. Any doors he puts down are going to end up fizzling. It might be your door, but there's nothing stopping him from dropping a mountain on top of it and then taking his time working out a solution later, Byron said. Like you did with Lung, Damsel said. Clever. That was my brother, actually, but yes, kind of. We need goddess, I said. And we need to deal with this without getting tied up with the Max Sec guys. Kingdom come, blindside. I'll get her. How do you defeat someone with world-spanning powers? You make sure she never gets a chance to fight. I flew over to where Goddess was talking to Seer. I saw his expression change as he recognized me. I ignored it, focusing on Goddess instead. We have a guess about what he's doing, I said. If he keeps us from leaving, there's no food that isn't contaminated. Everyone here starves. 
or we eat and we might ingest the drugs that the pharmacist planted. I saw something in her eyes, alarm, bewilderment. She took over an earth. She did whatever she'd done to take over her cluster, and that couldn't have been easy. Then there was gold mourning, but the entire reason she was here and not in her world was because she had been pulled into the fight. I could 100% understand how she might not have made many calls then. It could seem like a strange, bad dream, realer than existence in the years before and after, but so hard to parse that the mind turned away from it. But this might well have been the first time she'd ever come head to head with the fact that she was well and truly outmatched. While she was well and truly in control of her actions, past, present, and upcoming, how does he do it? We don't know, but you said it yourself. It felt like... No way out. We evacuate. He has a small army ready on the other side of the door. We, the non-goddess good guys, have multiple teams there trying to stall teacher. The Max Sec guys are probably under orders to attack us from the rear if we try to run for it, and the access tunnel... Stop, she told me. Fucking enough. The access tunnel leads to a means to communicate with the outside, and links the prison resources to outside resources. It gives him a way to tap into the ankle bombs your army is wearing. My teammates, goddess. I don't care, she retorted. Her voice was less of a shout as she spoke again, more of a hiss. We evacuate. Figure this out, yes? I was still. My thoughts stuck as I tried to figure out a way to reconcile it. So many of the options available meant throwing away lives. Her stare was cold. She found world leaders and went after them one by one. She sank ships. She killed hundreds, even thousands. The eyes of someone that had killed thousands. All around me, killers, terrorists, kidnappers, and worse, were staring at Goddess and me. Figure it out, she said with more emphasis. She stared into my eyes. I was stuck, my thoughts tied in a knot as I processed the options available to me. Follow the law. When the law isn't available, do what's right. When what's right isn't clear, ask for help. The team? I could manage the team. We'd figure something out. But that did nothing about the people who were still in various forms of trouble. We still hadn't heard from the A-team down in the access tunnels. Natalie was still in the custody of Goddess's squad. Lookout was still in Monokeros's grasp. This was the trap. All of the puzzle pieces from Teacher's Riddle were coming together in this. The non-lethal weapons. The anti-air weapon he'd employed against me. They could well prevent Goddess from taking flight and making a break for it. And the attacks she'd described. Multiple fronts, multiple angles, multiple levels. We couldn't ignore the access tunnels and the control of the bombs they promised. We couldn't ignore the front door, or our rear, or the issue of basic needs, like needing to eat. Give me an answer, Antares, Goddess said. Can you figure this out, or are you going to get in my way? I'll work on figuring something out, I said. She nodded slowly still staring into my eyes. Sorry to be so intense, I said. Good, she said. Which buildings are the maximum security buildings? The short, squat ones at the far north of the complex, I said. He fed his drugs to the people there. They get their food delivered, and the guards make sure they take their pills, Seer said behind Goddess. I'm borderline. Max sec if I've been anything but good, so I know. Seer was staring at me. He seemed to be amused that I was facing down goddess like this and I wasn't coming out ahead. That or he was just enjoying himself, and he looked like an asshole as a separate, distinct thing. Asshole. Goddess, for her part, seemed to be focusing on the horizon, where the shape of buildings was only barely visible against the backdrop of sky and distant trees. Many of the buildings didn't have lights on. 
I could feel her telekinesis like a harsh blast of wind right after a vehicle passing by. The force of the air was even more pronounced along the course of the blast, lines and fractal images briefly visible as air compressed, moisture condensed, and light bent. In the distance, one of the buildings toppled. That'll get them moving, she said. Seer, gather everyone you know. Deal with them. Knock down buildings and render this place uninhabitable as you come back from doing that. We burn our bridges behind us. I saw the smile on Seer's face. I looked away. I took off, heading straight up to where I could hopefully get my bearings, and where I wouldn't have to see a fallen who reveled in being fallen, being happy with the status quo. It made it easier to think straight and set my mind to the task at hand. Below me, Goddess was joined by some of the prison's heavier hitters, not any of the heavy hitters I needed. Lung was at her left shoulder, his eye glowing a dull red as he glanced up at me. The scales had mostly receded. I could remember Dean, in the hospital after Leviathan. I zigzagged through the crowd, trying to see people in gloom and slanted lighting. I was looking for a specific body type, hair type, and face, but the prison coveralls masked physical shapes. Master Stranger protocols felt so hollow in the now. The team was compromised, the medicated food was buried under a fallen building, and that food came from Teacher. I wasn't sure I trusted it or the Master Stranger protocols more than I trusted Goddess. My zigzagging journey continued, haunted by the memory of what had laid at the end of my last such journey. Then, I'd been searching for the one face who might be able to help, and I'd been crushed on so many levels by the failure to find. In this, I wasn't even sure the face was an answer. I spotted the others. I landed, and in my current state of mind, I forgot how much the heat, the aerial acrobatics, and the earlier fight with the teacher hit squad and the major malfunctions had drained me. I nearly dropped to my knees. Nothing like my fancy landings of days past. What are we doing? Byron asked. She wants to go out the front door unless she gets another, better answer before she gives the order. Teacher's going to be waiting for her. Byron, you remember the tools her people had? For dealing with flyers? Non-lethal weapons that could capture the fallen. And let Teacher get them under his thumb, Byron said. Shit, you're right. We need to get Goddess out unscathed somehow. From her tone, I think she's willing to make any sacrifices necessary to save herself. Makes sense, Damsel said. I'd be willing to do the same if I was in her position. Uh, yeah, I said. Not sure about that. So how do we save her skin, ideally without sacrificing ourselves? Damsel asked. You guys need to get to the others, I said. If they haven't come back yet, there's a reason. I'll catch up. We get the team together, make sure we're all on the same page, and then we make our effort to escape. We lean on... I almost said protocols. It struck me that Monokeros, as dangerous and deluded as she was, could very well know the protocols, know what I meant, despite my efforts to be subtle. We lean on each other, I said. We know who we can trust. Myself and myself, Damsel said. She paused. And maybe the little one. Woo! Look out, Rain said. If we unlens or whatever... Is it possible that we could use one of Teacher's doors to make our exit? I don't know, she said. But just from what my phone says, I'm pretty sure he closed all the doors. I saw Rain grimace. Talk while you run, but time is short. Go, I said. And what are you doing? Byron asked. Looking for Cole Belcher, I said. Cole Belcher? I think we can use him, I said. Do you... The ground illuminated as though a spotlight was being directed at it, but the light was neon, the edges of things highlighted and then multiplied. I looked around, and I saw the source. The first of the Max Sec prisoners, the dangerous ones that needed to be kept away from Genpop, 
the ones who teacher had reached out to personally. Go! Avoid those guys! Avoid eerie glowing ground! He went that way! Rain raised his voice and pointed as the ground began screaming. I took to the air, and I could see how the distorted lights were whisking and whirring against one another like worms in a tangle. There were shapes like people inside, writ large. I thought about going after the guy with the shaker effect. I decided it was too dangerous, too easy for me to get bogged down. Hit like glory girl, hold nothing back as the wretch, judge like the warrior monk, problem solve as the scholar, and don't lose sight of who you fucking are, because that's a metric shit ton to keep track of, Victoria Dallin. Rain had given me a direction. I was being so unfair monstrous even. I could remember times when I had been scared, even terrified. Gold morning, day after day in the hospital, after crawler, the day Amy had triggered when I'd been the one hurt. I didn't have a chance to finish the line of thought. I found Cole Belcher. The head of the guy's side of the prison had his soldiers with him, and they were gathering at the flanks, near the side of the entry building. Some staff would still be inside, probably behind the shutters, protected by thick walls. Up until Sayre came back, raising the place to the ground so the bridges would be burned and Goddess's army of prisoners would have no way to go but forward. I could count them. Seventy or so parahumans. The prisoner coveralls designated the security level and the building they belonged to. It took a moment of hovering before I saw Colbelcher. His face paint was striking enough to make him obvious even in the gloom. I landed, and he didn't flinch as I appeared in front of him. I saw him smirk. You're out of your cell, but you're only part way out, I told him. I'm just happy to be stretching my legs, he said in his godfather high voice. You come to talk to me for a reason? To deal, I said. I indicated a direction. Not much time. Hear me out? We walked a few paces away. With the chaos and the max sec prisoners facing down Seer, there was enough volume that people wouldn't be overhearing without sensitive ears. Still, I'd have to keep those ears in mind. I knew Lung was out there, and he was Goddess's left-hand man at the moment. What's the deal? Colbelcher asked. I did you a favor. I need something. Something isn't free. I did you a favor, I said, my voice tense. And that's only good manners for a newcomer to my block. I like you, girl. Don't make me change my mind. If you want something... The neon images the Shaker had created before erupted skyward. A giant of flesh with a sea of snakes at his waist formed from the dirt outlined in neon. Endbringer-sized. You gotta give something. I'm being pretty generous as is, hearing you out, and in my assuming it's not coincidence that other people got the wardens and the bombs all stopped blinking. My teammate. Our collective effort. Great. I still want something. Convince me. He smiled at me as he said it, meeting my irritation with sickly black spittle between the teeth kindness. There's a civilian with the wardens, a pretty guy with a forehead curl here, I gestured to indicate, was with them the last I saw. He led a group of late teens, early twenties guys. Flints. Fucking great, that's not ominous at all. Flints, then. Her name is Natalie. She has a lot of inside information and connections. I need you to do for her what I did for you in my roundabout way. And? And you didn't murder anyone, did you? I had an unpaid ticket, he said, sarcastic. I was going to offer you an exit. We're all getting an exit, girl. There's no more prison, see? With a bit more leeway and a helping hand in staying clear of teacher's control. Because that's... That's being brain dead and building ray guns or something for twenty hours a day until he decides he needs your power. You're going to help me get free and clear, girl? 
I was, but not if you're a murderer, not if you're a rapist. I wouldn't be a boss if I was. I had a rival. They decided I didn't get my second chance, came after me hard. I came after them harder. They played it up in court, said I went. A squealing interrupted him. The giant with a dress of worms was tearing chicken wire fence out of the ground, metal scraped against metal. They said I went too hard, he said. Broke the guy's jaw, which is true, it needed to be wired shut. I hurt his back, lifetime of pain, bullshit. I didn't touch his back. His arm? No. Lung damage? Nah. I didn't really have any time to spare. I knew he was probably playing it down, but if it wasn't murder, was I really okay excusing that kind of violence? It wasn't lawful, right, or good to be the person who decided he got away for this crime. But if I didn't do anything, everyone would get away, or everyone would be under teacher's control, which was worse than prison. It was having the mind shackled. I'll check up on things after, I said. If you're lying, I come after you. I look after this Natalie as long as you lack after me, he said. She knows how to get in touch with you? Yeah, when the phones are back online. A monstrous thing to do, I thought. A continuation of my thought from earlier. I could remember how scared I'd once been, when things had been worse than I'd ever experienced, when I'd been alone, more or less, or powerless. Natalie was in that boat. I was going to lengths to give her the chance to do something, because she was one of the only three people I could count on with the protocols. Monstrous. To put that on her shoulders, to demand something of her. But she was a teammate, and the only other people we could lean on were a guy who didn't know the protocols, talented as he was, and a girl who talked to mice. Monstrous. Cryptids at the gate, Lookout said, as I caught up with the group. The boys were already in the tunnel. At the gate? Near teacher's group? Lookout nodded. Um, he brought company. My sister, I said, my voice tight. Oh, yeah, her, Lookout said. And goddess's missing person. Arc 9, Gleaming, Chapter 13 The tunnel was a concrete tube, stabbing in the direction of the front gate of the prison, bright lights arranged on the sides at roughly eye level, each pair of lights spaced out from the ones before and the ones to come, all contained within protective cages, many of which illuminated the spider webs that covered them and the moths that had found their way down. The matching pairs of lights made Rain and Byron cast two half-intact shadows where they stood a little ways down the tunnel. In the ring of lights that surrounded the short ladder down, I cast half a dozen. That half-dozen shadows narrowed to two as I approached the boys. A heavy impact elsewhere in the prison complex shook the ground, and the concrete walls absorbed it. The effect was muted, diffused through the tunnel. Lookout followed me down, hopping down from the short ladder with a hup sound. She was small in the shadows of Monokeros and Damsel, who were right behind her. I hope you're not claustrophobic, Rain murmured. I glanced at the walls of the tunnel. It was narrow enough that the lights on the left side were only six feet or so from one another. Because it was a tube, the path was only two feet wide or so before it became a curved slope that couldn't really be walked on. No room to fly or to maneuver if it became a fight. No real ability to throw ourselves to the side if there was trouble. Dropping to a position where we were flat against the floor meant we'd be lying in a row because the sloped floor would just see us rolling down toward the path at the center. No cover to be had. If anything... 
the open space extending both front and back was more concerning than the unyielding concrete and dense earth to either side above and below us. There was another impact. Bugs fled cracks in the walls, tracing crazy paths in their search for hiding places that weren't anywhere to be found. How are we doing this? Byron asked. I have some experience in leadership, if you guys need some direction, Damsel said from the back. I... I started, pausing to double-check myself. I know the team better. I'll give some direction, if that's okay. I have ideas. I saw her shrug. Her gaze was cool, but her mannerisms nervous as she shifted her weight to her other foot, claw hands twitching. Byron, I said, even as my thoughts were trying to judge that nervousness in Damsel. If it's okay, we could use Tristan right about now. Sure, why? Byron asked. He can give us cover, and I know Blindside carries a gun. Byron nodded. He blurred. I could lead if you wanted. Tristan said. I led Reach for a while. If it's okay, given what we talked about just outside the headquarters, I'll take point. Because I said I didn't trust myself. Sure, I said. I hadn't wanted to just volunteer that with so many listening in. Do you trust yourself? He asked. I hesitated, then I shook my head. I don't know. Ahem. Damsel cleared her throat. She raised a hand, the claw tips scraping the concrete wall. I trust myself. Uh, I said. As glory girl and as a member of the patrol, I'd occasionally run into situations like this when dealing with people who were wholly unreasonable or hampered in their reasoning. They never got any easier to deal with. I'm mostly trying to aim for a happy middle ground between self-trust being durable enough to be close to the front where we can see what's going on, and knowing the members of the team. Even if we accept you're confident, you can't take a bullet. Hmm, I suppose. Tristan, can you make us shields? One for each of us? More like the shields SWAT teams and patrol teams have than anything else. It'll be heavy. Worst case scenario, it breaks in my hands. Sure. I nodded, thinking. Damsel... Is it okay if I call you that? Mm-hmm. If there's trouble, can we count on you to give us a side area to duck into? If you put a hole in the wall, will it be okay? Do you know if it'll make it more likely to cave in doing what it does, swirling things around, or will it be less likely? No idea. We don't lose much by trying, Damsel said. Dirtying my prison-issue shoes. Except a possible cave-in of the whole tunnel. Rain said. Give me some credit, Damsel said, her nose rising a fraction. If the whole tunnel collapses, it'll be because I wanted it to. Great, Rain said. And look out, I said. Any camera feeds down here? Drones you can deploy? The more we know about what's going on... She was already shaking her head. No cameras down here. Lookout shook her head again. Connecting down here to everything would defeat the purpose. It's a closed, secondary situation and a secret escape route for prison staff in case of emergencies. Not a very good secret, I observed. No. Um, um, I don't have any ongoing camera footage down here, but I can find the old footage from when they headed this way. Some of it's dead and it might not have any fancy extra perks like thermal vision, seeing backward in time or physical representations of social relationships... You can get your cameras to track social relationships? Rain asked. She said she can take pictures of the past and you're focusing on that? Monokeros asked, dry. Uh, yeah, Rain said. The rest of us nodded. Monokeros seemed deeply bothered by that. If there was a question to be asked or something to be made of it, it was drowned out by Lookout talking, her voice insistent. I'm saying stuff like that. When it's cameras I make a lot of the time, I can get them to pick up other noise and waves and junk. And later if I want to toy with the feed or go enhance, 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 then maybe I can. Okay, I said, interrupting before Lookout could get carried away. 
footage of these guys as they make the approach. Maybe they brought something. Oh, right. On it. Victoria, Tristan said. I turned to look, and the orange motes he was drawing manifested into a shape. It was a little more triangular than rectangular, the point scraping the ground, but it had a bar across the middle, and it had a hole in the front to peer through, if I kept my head at the right angle. Black stone run through with veins of what looked like copper, gold, or a mix therein. It tipped toward me, and I caught it with my burned hand and my shoulder, before catching it with my other hand. Stand back, I said. I glanced back to make sure the coast was clear, and then I activated the wretch. Stone creaked and strained as the wretch grabbed it, and it bucked this way and that as hands gripping the top and then the side pulled at the edges. Part of the bar broke almost immediately. Tristan did something cruder with his shield, drawing it small. He drew out more motes near where I was, and as I advanced, he advanced into the motes, putting his shield out so the stone would manifest and bond to it. Once I knew he was doing that, I picked up the pace. Rain. I said the word instead of calling it out, because the acoustics of the tunnel meant that sound would travel. If Tristan and I go down, use your ranged power to stall and distract. Don't hurt anyone. Get lookout and damsel clear. Yup, he said, like it hadn't even needed to be said, didn't even warrant a full yes. And me? Monokeros asked. Your orders are the same ones Goddess gave you. Keep an eye on lookout. Make sure she gets out safe and sound. I meant he should rescue me, too. She didn't even get it, did she? That she was that ignorant, that fucking unable to see the wrong in what she did, that she might even say she'd do it all over again. A complete and utter monster behind me, her footsteps running. She could use her power on me at any moment. He could, Tristan said behind me. He was the only one besides me who wasn't a little winded by the running. Rain seemed to be doing okay, too. Hearing that voice, the firm shutdown of the monster, it helped. Too easy to get pulled, sucked down a rabbit hole. Guys, Lookout said, my mask is fritzing out. Your mask? Damsel asked. I'm all wired up. I've got cameras for eyes and they aren't working, Lookout said. I floated in the middle of the tunnel, doing my best to orient myself in the air in such a way that if the wretch started pulling the shield around to my left, I could rotate it back the right way. I looked back and saw Lookout scrabbling at her mask, pulling the reflective insert that ran down the middle of her face back. Her eyes, nose, and mouth were visible. Any special vision modes? I asked. Not really. Picking up some of the visual noise as a supplementary thing... It's wired so I can plug other stuff in or see through a video feed like I'm there. But you could parse it if you took that recording back to your workshop and scanned it, I said. A statement, not a question. Uh Uh-huh, she said. Blindside, I said, far enough down the corridor that we couldn't see them yet. Lookout held up her camera, her expression serious. I didn't have long to see before she lowered it for Tristan, then turned around to show the others. It had been a video loop. Most of the cameras that were able to move had turned away. The ones that couldn't, I presumed, had gone black. The images we had were of people at the very edge of the camera. What's the takeaway? I asked. Two people at the edge of the camera. Kingdom come and someone else. A guy prisoner. Teacher had someone on the inside. No footage of the guy? No, he was walking right behind Blindside, and whatever mussed up the cameras meant he wasn't very visible either. He's skinny. The wretch jerked the shield to one side. I flew around, my arm extending to its full length, my fingers gripping the view hole in the shield. Not wanting to fight it any further, I shifted position, ready to move on. We push on. Save Sveta, get Ashley, get Natalie... Make sure we have control over the bombs if we need it. Go for it. I'm right behind you, Tristan said. 
If you have to fight blindside, swing something that won't stop when your arm does, a flail, whatever, or strike from an oblique angle. Switching elements might really work here. Maybe. They could also risk drowning us or washing us away, Tristan said. Yeah, I said. The wretch crushed a part of the shield and I winced. Yeah. I flew forward. Blindside, Kingdom Come, and One Unknown. Somewhere down this tunnel was a computer, console, or other network that allowed for communication with the other Earth. The shield blocked my view, but that didn't change that blindside still blocked aim. I was flying on a course, and I couldn't pitch that course to go cleanly over blindside. I hit an invisible wall, my flight course altering against my will. I brought my legs up, feet planting on the wall, and then flew, strong-arming my shield in blindside's general direction. I hit the invisible wall and canceled out the wretch. The shield carried on, slamming into the concrete wall and scraping a light clean away from its housing. Oh, it's you, Blindside said. They didn't sound like they were so close they'd almost been hit by the shield. Had they scooted back? Blindside moved, feet tapping against the tunnel floor, and I was forced to look away, turning toward the wall. I could gauge from the edges of my vision and judge distance using the angle I'd been moved at. Reminder, if your head turns too fast the wrong way, you might snap your neck. That's not me trying to do it. I don't want to do it. Believe me, it's a problem. Driver flies by, head turns too far to the left, car goes flying. If you go flying, actually flying, the same thing happens. I don't want the blame for that shit. What are you doing, blindside? You work for Tattletale and Lord of Loss, got a heroine shot, and now you're here working for Teacher? I can't picture those two working together. You can't possibly think Teacher's going to fix your problems and not enslave you. Get this through your skull, patrol girl. I don't work for them. I don't like either of them. I work for money, cash, dollars and dineros. Trading dollars and new dollars if you want to be modern. I'll even take some nice horses for barter if I gotta. They tell me to guard the tunnel while they do what they do, I'll do it. Take it from someone who was a crime boss in an earlier life, Damsel said. Sometimes it's easier to leave the help behind than to fork over the cash to pay him. You're going to get left behind. You weren't that kind of person, right? Lookout asked. I never did it, no. But power makes people callous. I might have. Blindside cut in. You're talking about teacher? That man doesn't want to be on my bad side. Half of what he does is make thinkers. The other half is making tinkers, some of which are still pretty darn affected by my power. Power makes people stupid, too, Damsel observed. We have exceptions, like goddess and yours truly, but... Someone like teacher? I finished the thought. He seems like the kind of person who's so smart they do stupid things, Damsel said. Maybe, Blindside said. But he's at least smart enough to know that if he crosses me, he's going to have to watch his back. You know why he's going to have to watch his back? Because I'll be there, walking up to his front, grabbing his dick and balls and cutting him off. Ew, Lookout said. Why do that? That sounds gross and awkward to actually do. You'd have to get his pants off. Stab him in the chest if you have to do something. Or be creative, Damsel said. Or be creative, yeah. Or don't cut and stab people, I said. The whole merry gang, Blindside said, pacing while talking. Should I be happy you're distracting me from the boredom or annoyed? Annoyed, Tristan said. Come on, you're outnumbered. We just fought Lung plus the pharmacist, the woman who sets powers on fire. We won. Yeah, Blindside said. Here's the reality. I've had my power for a while. I know a lot of the tricks. I'm armed, and all of you can't hide behind one shield. You could win, but you might not. Turn around, leave, I won't stop you. When we get what we want and we leave, we'll bring your guys with. Happiest outcome. 
I can't lock on, Monokero said from the very back of the group. You guys are on your own. I saw orange motes start to appear in the corner of my eye. My head flicked around as Blindside ran beneath me toward the group. Incoming, I called out. I heard Tristan's, Fuck! Blindside had slipped past the wall Tristan had been making before it had been confirmed. He dismissed the motes, audibly grunting as something crackled. Voices overlapped. That itty-bitty thing isn't going to... That's a taser... From what I could gather, Blindside had realized their stun gun didn't work on Capricorn and applied it to Rain instead. Poor Rain. Damsel's power crackled, then flared out, the noise deafening in the close confines of the tunnel. Blindside shrank against one side of the tunnel, which meant I could turn my head to see three quarters of the scene. Damsel had backed off a bit and now held her claws out. The distortion of her warped space was being held within the confines of her claws, a roughly spherical shape of what looked like slices of space seen through very tinted glass, vistas warped space, slices and curls of total blackness, and crackles of black lightning. I heard a gun cock. Shoot me, and this stuff I'm holding fills the tunnel. Damsel intoned the words. And your team? Blindside asked. They're not mine. They're a means to an end. Meanwhile, you're an obstacle, which means you're going to end, Damsel said. She couldn't look straight at Blindside, so she turned her chin up, arms out, holding the contained storm of shadows and blurs. If you think I won't put a bullet in any of them, I don't care. You don't care? <laughs> what? Lookout asked. You said I was cool. We bonded over a book. So much for you being cool. The gun cocked again. I'm aiming at the kid now. Don't think I won't put bullets in her legs. I've had to deal with the tweens between in New York, and that helps anyone get over the hurting kids thing. What? Am I in upside-down world all of a sudden? Damsel being hilariously uncool, and people saying the TBT aren't the best? Lookout said. Lookout, Capricorn said. You wanted to be on the front lines. You need to keep your head on the task at hand. Can't get upset at Damsel and excited about some overrated hero group. Okay, Lookout said. There was a pause, then she muttered, They weren't overrated. Put the power away. The noise is hurting my ears, Blindside said. I will shoot the kid if you don't. In four, three, two... The power fizzled out. Damsel had to shake one claw to get one flicker of power to disappear, and in the midst of the shaking, her claw tip scratched concrete. Turn around, go the other direction, Blindside said. At the front of the group, still holding his shield, Capricorn looked up at me. I barely visible in the shadows behind the goat-styled helm. At one hand, his finger indicated the end of the hall. Me? Going on alone? I hesitated, glancing in that direction. I'd be dealing with Kingdom Come and a strange cape alone. Don't even think about it, Blindside said. If you leave, patrol girl, I'll start shooting. We couldn't fight them in close confines without hitting allies. Couldn't use something like Tristan's or Damsel's power without affecting allies. I did believe that they'd shoot someone. All right, I said. Two options, Blindside told us. You fuck off or you stay until KC finishes what he's doing and comes back, which might be a while because he's taking his time. When KC turns up, you're going to run because you don't want him using his power on you. That's a fast ticket to teacher getting his hands on you. Which means we might as well just fuck off, I said. Good girl, Blindside said. You finally get it. Our team, Rain said. They're in good hands. Go, I told the group. Back the way we came. We head for the entrance. Do what we can. But Tress and Swansong... Lookout said. Capricorn looked up at me. Then he switched. Tristan to Byron. 
Was he thinking or hoping that Byron had a clever idea? If he was, he was inside Byron now, very disappointed that his brother didn't have any more ideas than he did. Byron let the large shield drop, then headed back through the group, helping Rain and putting a hand on Lookout's shoulder. I think dealing with teacher is the kind of situation where nobody wins, I told Blindside, flying above so that the limits of my field of vision kept track of where they were. That's my problem to deal with. Yeah, I said. If you're thinking about having the guy in the fish armor flood the tunnel, think again. I wouldn't be letting you go if I thought that was going to work. I nodded, then I flew after the others. My hand caught the ladder as I reached the wall, my arm catching some of my forward momentum. I grazed Monokeros on my way up past the ladder. Are we really abandoning them? Tristan asked. He was already above ground. I looked down the hole. Monokeros glared up at me. We're not going down through there, I said. Come on, we're heading to the front gate. I don't like leaving them, Lookout said. We won't. Sveta's my best friend, and Swansong gave me an apartment with no strings attached. We won't leave them, I promise you. Lookout nodded. I want everyone together again. We get Tress and Swansong, and then we get cryptid, and we'll have Damsel of Distress with us as a bonus. Um, sorry, I'm getting distracted again. Usually cryptid tells me to shut it. Cryptid. It was a disorienting thought, because there was so little about Chris that let me orient my thoughts where he was concerned. He was out there with my sister, and that last element was something that I actively didn't want to think about. Disorientation and aversion both. Revulsion. Hate. Disappointment. Do you have an actual plan, or should someone else step up? Damsel asked. I have a fucking plan, Damsel. I said. Ease up. Talking about leadership in the first place had been a mistake. I had to take a second, clearing my thoughts. There was a way to do this. Look out, I said. We saw the tunnel. We saw where it goes. I know there's no footage there, but is there any way you can map it out and help us figure out where the tunnel is beneath us? We're going in from above, Rain said. What do you think? I asked. I think we could, Lookout said. Um, when I was lensing the space map, I wasn't even thinking of underground tunnels, so I double-checked before and... Speed it up, Byron said. Lookout talked double speed as she finished. I have a strong guess and I can refine it, what with what we saw down there. Do it, I said. Yes! Projector disc, Capricorn? He handed it over. There was an outright war going on near the front door of the prison. I could hear the succession of noises, of distant detonation, pause, detonation, pause, rumble of something collapsing. The pauses were becoming fewer and shorter, and there were more noises that overlapped. Here and there, gunshots could be heard. We get to the terminal for the bombs and we end this, I said, keeping my voice low. We sound off an alert for every ankle bracelet and they'll notice. Neither goddess nor teacher want to lose the prisoners. We can put an end to this fighting and make the prisoners stay put. Some of the prisoners, Monocaro said. Some are leaving with goddess, no negotiation. Sure, I said. I met Monocaro's cold eyes and I felt my skin crawl. I missed out on the tweens between, Monocaro said wistfully. I liked them, from what little I saw of them. They had moxie. Oh, hey, another fan! Moxie is a great way of... Lookout said. She stopped working for a second, looking up. No, wait, hey, that's awful! <laughs> no! Work, Rain said, putting his hand on her shoulder. Tress and Swansong are counting on you. Right. She was a kid in the end. She was, as much as any of us, trying to wrestle with conflicting feelings, with tension. I wrestled with my own feelings trying to anticipate what came next without letting my thoughts get muddled by the blood and bodily fluid streaked elephant that was occupying one large segment of my thoughts. For a moment, it was all I could do to just keep my equilibrium, stay calm, and try not to think. 110%. It's not about being the warrior monk. 
It's about being all of it, getting to where every part of me functions and functions well. Got it, Lookout said. She held up the disc and lines sprung out, painting a fuzzy rectangle on dirt and grass. Something struck with a sound like cymbals as large as a building, loud enough that every single one of us bent over, hands at or near our ears, wincing in pain. That's advance guard, Kenzie said, barely audible as my ears rang. The heroes at the portal. If they were coming in, that was because the people they were trying to stall had gotten through and the heroes were following after. If the heroes were following after, then Goddess had yet another massive advantage. Teacher might be losing this, and if he thought he was losing while he had control of the ankle bombs... Damsel, Rain, can you use your powers? Get us through the ground? I'll do what I can, Rain said. But I sever, I don't really dig. Whatever you can do, I said. I looked over at Damsel. Only because you were good to my sister, Damsel said. What's a little dirt on an outfit this hideous? I'll buy you something, I said. The noise of her power tearing into the earth seemed like it drowned out the end of my statement. I raised my voice a bit. I think I know someone who knows the kinds of clothes you like. I saw a smile on her face before she started swiping out, tearing into the ground and creating a ditch in a matter of a single blast. People backed away as she widened it into a hole. She did have control. It wasn't just holding the blast as a localized storm of energy. The power geek in me wanted to spend hours thinking about what that meant, drawing an analogy between Swansong and Damsel and me and... something else. Was that something I could chase? Something I should chase? Hold up, Tristan called out. Byron had switched out when I hadn't been looking or focusing. Give me a second. I'm going to shore this up. Damsel was panting for breath, animated, seemingly excited to be alive in a way that I hadn't seen in Swansong or in Ashley. Sweat streaked the dirt on her face, and she was illuminated by the orange lights that spiraled around her. Rain dropped to a crouching position, pulling Lookout down as people ran by, women in red prison uniforms. Pure luck that Damsel hadn't been making noise as they came by. I held out a hand, indicating for the others to wait. For Breakthrough to be at its 110%, we needed to get Tress, Swansong, and Cryptid. We'd help Crystal Clear and Ratcatcher, we'd get to the console or terminal, and we'd get control of this situation. I gave the go-ahead to start again, my eyes scanning the area for any prisoners running around. Another ten feet, Lookout said, looking at the disc and the phone she was holding. Get us close, Rain told Damsel. I'll get us through the last bit, cleaner and quieter. Orange lights swirled, reinforcing the walls of the hole that was being dug, while Damsel stood at the lowest portion. She swiped out with her power, with no staggering or apparent pain, glanced up at Lookout, got a motion to go again, and repeated the process. Good, Lookout murmured, peering over the edge. One foot of dirt and one foot of concrete left. Damsel put a claw against the wall of stone, claw tips reaching for purchase and finding none. She lifted a foot so covered in mud that the footwear was impossible to see, placing it on a spike, and then used a blast of her power to ascend to the top of the hole. More control there, too. Capricorn leaned forward, catching at one claw with a gauntlet before Damsel could tip backward and fall the way she'd come. Damsel said something I couldn't hear, walking away from the edge so the way was clear. Rain threw his scythes, drawing a square. I looked over at Tristan, who nodded. You block blindside. I cover the other end of the tunnel, I murmured. We've got this, he said. I flew down, wretch out, aiming for the center of the square. It broke clean, concrete shattering only when it struck the floor. I followed it all the way to the ground, landing with one foot, both hands, and one knee pressing into the dirt atop the shattered piece of concrete. I had my orientation, which meant I was clear to go. 
I flew in the direction of Tress and Swansong, Tristan landing behind me the moment I was out of the way. Into the underground bunker, past a room with ten bunk beds, past a kitchen, and into the larger room, into the situation. A man in a prisoner uniform sat in a modified computer chair, the chair's back to the wall. He had the kind of brow that meant a perpetually furrowed glare, a mullet, and a thick beard. There were computers in the corner, and he'd opened the cases, strewing components around him. Many had been worked into the chair itself, turning it into something more like a throne. He was their access to the console, just as Lookout was intended to be ours, inconsequential. Of far more consequence was Tress, who was partially out of her armor. Tendrils flailed around her, grabbing everything in reach, pushing some away, pulling others closer, flinging the rare one. When the tendrils moved, it was with a speed the eye could barely follow. Something was whipped in our direction, and before I could see what it was, a crackle of electricity destroyed it, LEDs and boards across the tinker's chair lighting up. I saw the tension ease in the tinker's shoulders, only to return there as he saw me. In another situation, I might have wondered if he was an opportunist who found their way down here. With the information from Lookout, I knew he wasn't. Stop what you're doing, I ordered him. Sveta's head turned my way, by a rotation and flexibility that a normal neck didn't have. Her face was streaked in blood, her eyes were wide, and she was lost in herself in a way that broke my heart to see. That heartbreak stopped when I saw a grouping of tendrils move, but it wasn't a good stopping. It was sudden, numbing shock that stopped all other feelings, thoughts, and processes. The grouping of tendrils all grasped the same thing, a lump of a shape in black fabric. Blood streaked the smooth ground where the fabric touched it. What are you doing out of costume, Sveta? I asked. I sounded so normal. There was no response. Where's Swan Song? I asked, still normal. She dropped her eyes to the ground. Tentacles flailed madly. Crystal clear? I asked. More tentacles bunched around the fabric. I stepped forward. I felt the buzz of ambient electricity in the air. I moved my hand and felt it intensify by multiple factors. Something told me that if I reached the threshold where this invisible electric fence divided the room, the electricity would converge on a single point, aiming to repel me. Tristan, Lookout, Rain, and the others caught up. They stopped a few paces behind me, looking over and under my shoulder at the scene. Where's Ratcatcher? I asked. Tendrils twisted at the black fabric. Something crunched inside. She flicked it at me, limbs snapping out like a whip. I activated the wretch by raw instinct, and the wretch intersected the electric field. An invisible hand caught the cloth, and the nimbus of electricity briefly drew an outline around the wretch. Better at dealing with sustained onslaughts. Something crashed behind me. I turned to look, still tense as the wretch held out against electricity and held the black cloth. Rain had kicked the tinker's tech-upgraded chair. Another kick, and the electricity went away. Rain and Capricorn both hauled the guy out of his chair, back and away. I let the wretch drop away. The fabric hit the ground, and immediately tendrils began reaching for it unrecognizable bits of flesh rolled out. You did that on purpose, I said. She looked at me, and I saw nothing of Sveta in that face. Kingdom come, I said. The black cloth. None of the others had been wearing black. They'd been wearing prison uniforms. The cloth was Kingdom come's own costume. He's controlling her? Lookout asked. He's trying, I said my voice shaky with the relief. But the thing about Tress is that she's worked ridiculously hard to get to where she is. It takes a kind of strength, and that asshole doesn't have it. Kingdom Come opened Sveta's mouth, worked her jaw. No words came out. 
she doesn't have full lungs, kingdom come, I thought. For her first year or so, she couldn't talk or explain herself, not that she even knew the language. Let my friend go, reconstitute, end the breaker state, I told him, and show me where Swan Song, Ratcatcher, and Crystal Clear are. They're in the back, Lookout said. She brought her hand forward, holding the disc. The compass had lines extending out toward a door. We'd have to get past Kingdom Come to get there. Going for the exit at the far side of the tunnel? Is there one? Kingdom Come reached out with tendrils, groping at the ground and at piles of things. He worked to drag her prosthetic body across the floor, putting himself between us and what looked like a large computer server with cables running into the ceiling above it. Loops of metal bound tendrils together, and more cables and loops bound the tendrils to the body. Only a portion were free. Let her fucking go, I said. I floated closer. A tendril slapped into the ground between us, slicing through the air with a sound like a sword might make. Thane! A crackle of a voice could be heard from the mess of technology to my left. Stop what you're doing. Pull us out. Tell Kingdom Come and Blindside. Kingdom Come crawled closer to the console, blocking it off. Rain, scrambling to rummage through the tech, found the device. He pulled it free and hit a switch. He hesitated for a second. Clarify. Who's speaking? I mouthed the name. Kingdom Come. Tentacles slapped against the ground. We give her nothing. Find your way back. Kingdom Come dragged himself closer to the server. What's he doing? I floated closer and tendrils struck out, forcing me to retreat. How did this happen? Sveta in the center of the room. I could deal with her grabbing. I dealt with it as the wretch. But she'd been careful to hold, not strike out. It had been the product of years of work. Orange motes began to circle her. I didn't move a muscle, watching. Tendrils reached. Stone trapped them. I saw her react, pulling away, pulling tendrils out and through the gaps provided. Others squeezed at stone, straining to crush it. More tendrils reached, even using the stone as a point to grapple and pull herself forward. More stone trapped them. Others reached out for the server. On the wall, there was a plexiglass case mounted with wires hooked into the server. It wasn't a fire alarm behind that case. Shit, I said, realizing just how they intended to leave Goddess with nothing. I looked back at Damsel and Rain. I saw Rain look down at the bomb that was still at his ankle. The shackle that kept him in prison, currently quiet and black, but so easily it could become death or maiming. Tendrils snaked in. I flew closer, and tendrils almost immediately shattered the wretch. Orange lights danced around the tendrils at the case, but it was too late. The light solidified into a hunk of stone, encasing those tendrils, while more lights solidified into chunks of stone that kept Kingdom Come locked into position, unable to crawl away or mount an effective attack. Still too late. Within that case on the wall, which contained an emergency button that might easily set off every single ankle bomb, I could hear the plexiglass shatter, crushed. Beside me, Tristan took a deep breath. I met his eyes. No time for words. No time for communicating a message. That message being received, the understanding. Only the understanding. Tristan became Byron. All of the rock he'd placed throughout the room, on the server switches, and on Sveta became a rush of water, swirling and flooding the underground space. Her prosthetic body was shoved, twisted around, and the tendrils pulled away from the button. Given the choice between every single one of the prisoners being executed and every single one of the prisoners living and being free, we'd made a call, because some of those prisoners were important to us. The server flooded with frigid water that quickly extended from floor to ceiling, and blinking lights went black. As connections were disrupted, lights all around us went out, 
leaving the space as dark and cold as death. Arc 9, Gleaming, Chapter 14 I tumbled through darkness, and this time there was no frame of reference, even a wrong one. The water was numbing, the darkness all-consuming, and the water around me was moving, more akin to being in an undertow in a fast-moving river than a pool. Was that only foreshadowing for what was to come? The thought was eerily calm, disconnected from the danger and the chaos around me. Fear was contagious, and the fear of the dark was something I'd inherited. There was something about having a mom who often slept with the lights on that made a small child insist on her nightlight. When a first sleepover fell to pieces because of the nightlight issue, that little girl's parents had provided explanations. They were superheroes, their powers used light. That was why. It would be a few years before that little girl would start to feel she'd been told a lie. Not a realization, but a feeling. Fear paralyzed like cold water did. It shackled, limiting action, like debris stirred up by water, computer components, and bits of metal hooking on clothing. Two ways to deal. One could bend to it, succumb. It wasn't a bad option, despite what one might think. Because the alternative was to fight, to push through, and any movement that followed from shackles and paralysis was liable to be rushed to get other people hurt. I'd learned both of those things from my mother. I'd seen her on her patrols, heading into dark alleys with only her weapon for lighting. I'd seen her bend to the fear to the point it was an integral part of how she lived. If I acted now, if I used the wretch in a confined space when I didn't know where my team was, if I flew, I could do a horrendous degree of harm. I flew in one direction, found a flat surface, and pressed myself hard against it until I was grounded enough to have a sense of gravity. The water roared. Someone was trying to shout underwater, but the sound was lost, dulled, and muffled beyond recognition. Something touched my leg, then pressed out, pushed, and I felt the strength of it. Not a human hand or anything similar, a tendril. No sooner did I recognize it than I felt it pull away. My leg was pulled after it by the force of the water moving in its violent wake. Blue lights began to fill the space. Motes of light appeared, leaving trails and lines behind them. The illumination was murky, everything cast in one or two shades of blue and more pitch black. Objects were unrecognizable. The side and top of a table ten feet away looked much like a folder of papers floating within my arm's reach. Both moved violently. I hadn't expected just how turbulent this water would be, or how much. This time around, I had my orientation. But I didn't have the ability to do anything with it. I exhaled slowly, letting bubbles slip through my lips, a way of measuring my time limit. I searched through the oppressive, near-opaque gloom, a world of sluggish and violent movements, of chaos, and I saw nothing. The movement of the water wasn't as intense as it had been in the first few seconds, but for every small amount that it slowed and calmed, I felt waves of stress and strain my breath pushing against the inside of my chest, wanting out and wanting more. Not hard edges. Look, Victoria, look. Where are they? Look for human shapes, for the lines of the human body. Motion caught my attention, almost invisible in a swirl of computer chips and boards. I moved to intercept before I'd fully verified who it was. Rain, swimming through the water. I flew to him, grabbing him, helping him along. I saw his head turn, his eyes wide. I could fly, and flying was better than swimming. Holding him, I flew us both toward the door, 
toward the tunnel where someone would have to swim further than the length of a swimming pool to get to the hole we'd made. They would then have to get up that hole. Tristan drew outlines and made dense material that fit within those outlines. Byron drew outlines, but the condensed material was something that uncondensed, expanding out to fill space, vastly disproportionate to the outlines made. Rain slipped from my grip. He'd stopped abruptly. I turned myself around. He pointed. Hair floating free in the water, and a form that wasn't really trying to swim. I nodded confirmation, and Rain kicked, propelling himself toward the door, the eddies and flows in the water flipping him belly up, leaving me to it, even as my pulse joined the dull roar of water in my ears, each beat a delivery of a swiftly dwindling oxygen reserve. More blue lights surrounded Rain, surrounded us. It still felt like two shades of blue and black, but the blue was lighter, the black filling less space. I grabbed him and gave him a tug to help him on his way, and I saw a glimpse of Byron at the door. He was drawing out moats. Behind him, Damsel was already heading through the tunnel, visible more by the froth behind her, the water and debris turbulent. Bubbles slipped through my lips. How long had it been? Twenty seconds? Forty? A minute? Two minutes? I was ready to get to a place I could breathe now, and I still had too much to do. I pushed urgency out of my mind, with a growing feeling that if I did start to panic, I'd be less able to handle it because I'd put it off. The hair, as I flew to intercept, was Monokeros's. She wasn't really trying to swim. I saw flashing, and for a moment, I thought it was the server somehow still alive. Then I saw the shape, the side of someone illuminated by the flash, a line with slight curves that could have been someone's leg or back, a human kind of shape. I flew past Monokeros to the other shape. The flashing continued, Lookout's flash gun aimed at the wall, a signal. It was a steady series of flashes until the gun ceased to work. I saw her smack the gun a few times. She didn't even realize I was there until I put my hands on her shoulders. Her head turned, and multiple round red eyes appeared in the dark, focusing on me, some narrowing like an old camera's shutter. She raised her hand in a small wave, and some of the lenses went dark. Somewhere in the background there was a detonation. I could feel it through the water, muted as any sound or vibration would be. It still shook my entire body. I drew her close, pulling her tight to my side so we might be able to move faster through the water with less drag. The return hug was bear-hug fierce, shocking after the casualness of the wave a moment ago. I took flight, heading back the way I'd come. I was a little less gentle with Monokeros, gripping her wrist in passing, wrenching it as I went. Even approaching the tunnel was a complete change. The debris had flowed in this direction, and with the movement of water from a larger room to a narrower corridor, the churn was worse. It threatened to tear Monokeros from my grip. Byron was still there, waiting. I didn't get that far before tendrils gripped me. Two living people in my arms. I couldn't use my force field or strength. The tendrils pulled away. It was always Tristan who had done the hand gestures or motions to accompany the uses of his power. This time it was Byron moving his arm, touching a moat, and then moving his arm toward the hallway we were aiming to enter. More water, I thought, as the power took hold, moats disappearing. The lines and dots of blue light winked out of existence, plunging us into a darkness where the two still-lit lenses on Lookout's mask were dots against the blackness, rather than anything illuminating. With that darkness came an impact, enough that it knocked the remaining gulp of air from my lungs. It was cold, so fresh into our reality, and I had to fight the impulse to use the wretch. My focus was on the team. I controlled our pace by flying against the flow, 
tried to keep Lookout and Monokeros closer to the top of the tunnel. I breached open air, and it was startling, because we weren't anywhere close to the hole. Water was flowing out and away. My hand hurt in ten different ways because of the burn and the fact that the water was soaking through the bandage and it was cold enough that it would have hurt on its own, much less making contact with a sensitive injury. I saw the square hole we'd cut in the top of the tunnel, and I hauled the two up. In the moment I was about to take us up and out, Monokeros jerked her arm free of mine. Waking up, maybe, or who knew? Rain was still in the water, half turned to absorb the flow. He was holding position and holding on to Byron, using his power to keep both in place as rocks amid the overflow. Tristan had walled off the tunnel and up until just a short while ago, that wall had served as a dam, which was part of why the water had risen to the level it had. Judging by the hole in the wall and the fact that the wall wasn't intact anymore, Damsel had blown it up. Helping, kind of. I carried Lookout out, then flew down for the others. Byron was next, heavy as he was, soaking wet and wearing armor. Rain was easier. My tech... I could hear Lookout's lamentations. I thought it was waterproof, Byron said. Water resistant, a lot of it, I heard her. I flew back into the hole. Byron, light? The light was meager, but it caught the edges and foaming rises of water as it flowed over the dam, past debris that had been dragged from the room to here. There was a hole in the wall, my first destination. Damsel was within. She'd blasted a hole that pointed back and away from the flow, forming an alcove she could stay within. Thane, teacher's tinker from the server room, was lying in the rubble and dirt at her feet. You okay to stay for a minute? I asked. You okay with making a lady wait when she can blast your head? Damsel started. Her teeth chattered hard enough to interrupt her. Clean from your shoulders? My own teeth chattered partly because of a sympathy reaction. Somewhere in there. There's another lady who can do that. I'm really hoping she's behind a closed door. I've got to help her. If you must, she said, before nodding in a way that didn't match the words. Save her. Huddle for warmth for now, I said. She looked down at Thane and sneered. I'd rather be cold. Huddling with me is a privilege then see if Capricorn can make you a ladder. We'll try, I heard Capricorn. Tristan now. Thick, Antares, Lookout called to me. I looked up. She turned on a flashlight, then threw it down to me. A small one, bright. You're awesome, I said. Help my friends, was the response. I want us all together again. I wasted no more time. I plunged into the dark. Sveta crystal clear, Ashley, rat catcher. Kingdom come if he didn't come part and parcel with Sveta. The water had vented out enough that I could fly over it. I flew into the room with the server and found it nearly empty of water now. Debris at the door was damming it, and I destroyed that debris using the wretch. Sveta, kingdom come? I asked. Tendrils whipped out of the water. They seized me, I activated the wretch, then dismissed it a moment later. Calm, I thought, as my heart hammered. She hauled herself up. She was too coordinated to be kingdom come. Most of her was outside of her shell, though. In a way, she wasn't our Sveta. Raising herself up to eye level, she brought her forehead forward until it rested against mine. Rinsed him off? I asked. I felt the nod. He's over there in the corner, pulling himself together. The B-team is okay. Where's the A-team? Downstairs. Downstairs wasn't good. He covered the ceiling so he was dripping down on top of us. I saw it at the last second, Sveta said. I took the bullet and tried to put myself where I would at least get in their way. Thane had to work remotely. You did good. I don't feel good. I wanted to reply to that but I knew the feeling one hundred percent. One hundred and ten percent. Bricklayer's mantra, I said. 
I felt her nod, her forehead against mine. I've got me. You go get Swansong and Crystal. And Ratcatcher? I asked, turning around in the doorway I was already flying through. She shook her head. Ran, get the other two. I nodded. The light from the flashlight wasn't quite sufficient for this kind of oppressive darkness. A single beam of light weighed against corridor after corridor, room after room of only darkness. I found the stairwell, and beyond the first flight, everything was obscured by the receding water, the level steadily decreasing. I could hear something below. The terrible noise I'd noted earlier, a roar or great grinding. As good a cue as anything. The debris and the degree of the churn at the top level of the water made entry by flight difficult, with an obstacle catching my shoulder on one entry and a lack of forward movement stalling the second. Then I was beneath, and the already small beam of light from the flashlight halved inside, diffused into dark, grimy waters. My skin and clothing were soaked through and gripped with the cold water. The roaring I'd heard earlier was louder here. Louder still as I flew deeper through the water, through a maze of things that threatened to catch at my armor and clothing, scraping at my arms. It was a morass of debris, old construction material left in the tunnel, where it could sit forever, and I couldn't use the wretch because doing so threatened to make things harder to get through. I'd only end up tearing things down and compacting stuff into barriers. I'd run out of breath before I got through. I exhaled a bit, letting bubbles rise to the surface. I'd always found that trying to hold two full lungfuls of breath ended up being counterintuitive. A steady release helped. The current of the water became stronger as I got closer to the bottom, and the amount of sediment increased. I found the source of the roar. Ashley, her back against the edge of a doorframe, stood knee-deep in water. Her power was directed at the hallway, a steady, continuous blast that bucked, kicked, and forced her to retain her control. I thought of fighting the shield as the wretch tugged at it. I floated in water as it was churned by Ashley's power. Some of what her power did was annihilate, but it was random, and most of what she was doing was holding it at bay, steadily removing some of the water from existence. I was still trying to figure out what to do to help when she stopped. The blast ceased, and water crashed into the room she and Crystal Clear occupied, the both of them just barely visible in the froth of bubbles and sediment before they were pushed back. I flew into the room, and the force of water rushing in forced me to stick my feet out, hitting the wall opposite the door. I reached out, found Ashley's head, and from there found her hand. One hand burned, holding Ashley despite the pain, feeling how cold her skin was, well beyond the norm of a human hand in cold water. I did much the same with Crystal Clear's head and hand. I could feel the chunks of quartz-like crystal studding each. I held his hand with the same that held the flashlight, awkward, the fierceness of our mutual grip driving the metal into the meat of my hand. I led them through the dark waters, into the maze of wooden slats and fence material. There was no roar anymore, no distant explosions as Damsel of Distress tore down a wall. Even high above, it seemed like the fighting had stopped. Crystal Clear helped to navigate. We found our way up, and when the coast was clear, I pulled them up at my maximum speed, hauling them to where we could all breathe again. Dripping, panting, we all caught our breath. I started to head forward, and Swansong reached out with one hand. It didn't move well, and I could see her wince before pressing her forearms against one another in an X. Sveta, she whispered. She's compromised. Kingdom come got her. Sveta should be okay now, I said. Rinsed off. Did you confirm with a password? Crystal Clear asked. Sveta's one of the very few people in this world who I don't need to, I said. There's a lot of people out there who probably thought the same thing and they regretted it later. 
he said. I nodded. I would have explained, but I didn't have the words. Ratcatcher ran? I asked. She went up one of the ventilation ducts that isn't supposed to hold a person, Crystal Clear said. We thought she'd get help. We haven't seen hide, hair, nose, or tail of her, I said. Goddess won, we think, and we destroyed the server. You destroyed it? Crystal Clear said. You do realize that you could have just set everything off. They were going to set it off, I said. Given a choice between a certainty and a possibility of making it, they chose the second option. I didn't disagree. They were really going to go that far? Crystal Clear asked. I nodded. Because Goddess won, Swansong said. Yeah, I said. I wanted to be happy about it, but I couldn't bring myself to. Too many close calls, too many questions. My sister was out there, and I couldn't avoid this third confrontation. The third in one night. One fucking long night. I think the situation is as resolved as it's going to get, I said. Teacher loses, he can't blow the bombs, Goddess has her army, the heroes are up there. I think, if there's anything left to contribute to the situation, we help her keep the peace. We help them, Crystal Clear said. We help the heroes. This protocol, I'm invoking it. As if we hadn't fought enough uphill battles tonight. But I nodded. The others had caught their breath. Ashley was rubbing her forearms, moving her hands with a little bit more in the way of dexterity. We entered the server room, and Sveta was there, a face and tendrils that were barely visible in the dark. She was hunched, for lack of a better word, over her ball. A case of bulletproof glass with staggered ventilation, so that a tendril couldn't worm through. A circular lock required some careful manipulation and a clamp of Sveta's teeth to properly open, if help wasn't provided from the outside but it collapsed into a flat position, and, try as she might, she couldn't coordinate to uncollapse it. Can I approach? You got them? Yeah, I said. You shouldn't approach. I stopped where I was, floating. I can't coordinate well enough, she said. I practiced before, but never in the dark. Give it here. The hunk of interconnected slats of bulletproof glass struck my breastplate in what was essentially a soft pass from Sveta. The noise made my much-abused ears hurt. I squeezed the orb, using my forearm instead of my right hand, and hard edges scraped against hard edges. It slid into its spherical shape, two pieces of plastic nipping off a bit of my arm as they came together. I opened the lid, and Sveta reached inside before pulling herself in. Tendrils had to be coiled together, piled atop one another, filling much of the space. With my hands full, I had only a glimpse of her expression. Sveta's hell. I locked her in. Thank you, Tress, Ashley said. Doing that? I know we haven't always been on the same page. I'm still glad you're okay. It was noble, Tress, Ashley said. It was stupid. For an instant I forgot what I was, and I can't do that, Sveta said. Other people can't afford for me to forget. I positioned myself as best as I could before he seeped in. I felt some violent motion within the sphere, as if a torrent of physical activity could illustrate the feeling. With a very different tone of voice, Sveta said, I'll need my armor. I'll get it, I said. I started to hand off the sphere, then stopped myself. If you're okay with... Yes. I let Swansong hold her. A silent crystal clear pointed the way to the armor, and I knelt by it, moving the debris that half buried it. Most of that debris was paper. Can you... Sveta said. What? I'm sorry, but can we leave the tentacles? The ones Rain made? Say they were too heavy to bring. His intentions are good, but... Got it, I said. 
I moved the flashlight to my mouth before figuring out how the new arms connected as part of the greater suit. If it's a problem, you should tell him, Crystal Clear said. I will, but the last 24 hours have been utter insanity. We need to make sure people are safe. It's going to distract him. I know this is bad and it's against every rule in the superhero magazines and Saturday morning cartoon shows, but... Lie? Swansong asked. Please, for now. He worked hard on that, I said. I know, but... Sveta said, her voice muffled. Can we compromise? Bring them, but have them detached? The material is good, even if the intent is over-eager, Ashley said. I heard a tuck sound, Sveta's forehead striking the lid of the sphere. I should, shouldn't I? Your body, your call, I said. That's the issue at its heart, isn't it? I heard her. With the muffling effect of the sphere and how quiet she was, it was hard to catch all the words. A forearm of pale flesh, a loose length of dense black netting that connected it to another forearm of pale flesh, all in sequence. Some metal framework within provided a loose skeletal system with levers and pulleys. The locking mechanism involved getting some concentric rings lined up and sliding a bolt through them. I hefted it over one shoulder, holding it there in a fireman carry. With my free hand, I combed fingernails through wet hair. Wet costume, armor, and Sveta's body were all heavy. Crystal Clear lifted the tentacles, wrapping them around his shoulders like a scarf. We reached the hole. Tristan had made a ladder. The group was huddled. Thane and Monokeros stood off to one side. We emerged, each of us in turn, with me steadying Ashley so she could ascend with her hands both full and not at their peak. Lookout sprung to her feet, and Monokeros reached out for her, missing Lookout's shoulder. She bounded to Ashley and stopped short of giving Ashley a hug. Ashley adjusted her grip on Sveta and pulled Lookout into a one-armed hug, arm at Lookout's head. Interesting to see how Damsel observed that, the fidgeting with claw fingers, eye contact not leaving that scene. I wasn't sure if it was a terrifying interesting or a positive one. Figuring that out required resources I didn't have. In a similar vein, I saw Rain look at the tentacles Crystal Clear carried. He didn't remark at anything, instead turning to survey the situation almost the opposite of what Damsel was doing. The prison was quiet. Not a shout, no movement. Many buildings had been pulled down, the staff buildings in particular. We lucked out with the bombs, it seems, Ashley said. Not luck, Tristan said. He indicated Thane, who sat slumped against a wall, a short distance from Monokeros. The situation in emergency controls went bad. Thane said. He talked like he had a mouthful of tobacco, all mush and sloppy syllables. I had to work remotely. Not nearly so fast as I would be, but I turned off the fucking bombs. Even though teacher wouldn't want you to? Rain asked. Of course even fucking the fucking teacher wouldn't fucking want me to, Thane said and he put enough clarity and emotion into each fucking that it didn't make a mess of the sentence. I'm wearing one of the damn things. He shook his ankle to demonstrate. He told Rain and Byron when we took him back to lash him to a light fixture, Tristan said. Not that this is the best outcome. This. The bombs were ineffective now. The prisoners were free. United under an effective leader. We need to save Cryptid, Sveta said within the sphere. And Natalie. Yes, Lookout said, please. I could look across the group, and I could see the people who had very little fight left in them. Me, Ashley, Sveta. Rain had taken a bit of a beating, but that was usual. By contrast, Lookout and Capricorn looked fairly eager to go. I knew that they had their own issues that Tristan was on edge from earlier in the night, still battling some demon I didn't know the name of. 
Lookout's demon was named Lookout, accompanied by a yin-yang extension of that struggle, currently in the form of Monokeros. The worst of it's over. Let's focus our energies on those two, do what we can to minimize the damage, I said. It's not over, Crystal Clear said. Let me assert my authority on that. Is that your vision? Lookout asked. Is it something you see? That's not the authority he means, I thought. He means the Master Stranger Protocols. I had to mentally reorient my perspective. This isn't over? It felt over. If my phone wasn't broken, I'd really, really like to get a reading of how your crystals work and how you see through them and... Rain nudged Lookout's shoulder with one elbow. And yeah, she terminated early. It's not something I see, Crystal Clear said. It seems pretty obvious, but I don't know how to handle this. It's freaky to see. It's not something you see? It's just that you see as freaky? Lookout prompted him. Yes, he said. That doesn't make sense, she said. I'm going to hand wave it and say my crystal vision breaks the rules when it comes to seeing stuff. Oh, duh. Your leader if you need to be crystal clear, I said. Then, for Monokeros's benefit, to cloud the Master Stranger protocols, I explained, You're with Foresight. They were first on the scene. I'm okay following orders. You make the calls. If you say we should back off and make contact with our team another way... I'm not going to say that, he said. That might be the way to go. I don't know. I'm working with limited information, with a really distorted view of my own, and I hate that. What I do know is that the situation is unsalvageable like this. Agreed, I said. We need one sane person to report to the people in no. That means we get people out. If you're talking about going against Goddess, we might have a bit of a problem, Monokeros said, and her voice was low. He isn't, Tristan said. The situation's a mess, the prison is totaled, and some complete scumbags are now going to be free. We need to talk to the key people so that they can rein those guys in. The guys who aren't going with Goddess. He sounded so natural saying it. Not one hint of a lie or falsehood. All the same, there was a pause as Monokeros locked eyes with Tristan. Whoa! Crystal Clear barked the word, loud enough to startle us. He threw himself between Tristan and Monokeros. What was that? You used your power on him? I tensed. Monokeros awed people, like my awe power turned up to maximum. She gained protections against that target, as well as insights into their personality and mind. It was the last thing she had used against Tristan. I wanted to see if he was being genuine, she said. He's loyal but not genuine. I'm not stupid, Capricorn. You know deep down inside that everyone is going with Goddess. Shit, Crystal Clear said. Once the dust settles, she will come for you and any others who aren't on her side. As soon as it's not pointing her to any immediate threats, her danger sense will tell her if there's any corner of the world where enemies lurk. She will find them and bring them in line, starting with the closest or the most severe. I saw Crystal Clear draw in a breath. Fingers ran along a crystal near his eyebrow, nervous. Do what you need to do, tell us what you need, and I, at least, will trust you, I told Crystal Clear. I wish I had a big plan. Maybe I'll come up with one. You won't, Monokeros said. She took a step forward, limping. She'd hurt her leg earlier. Crystal Clear ignored her. But for now, I think my number one priority is making acquiring me as hard as possible. I'll see who I can round up. You do what you need to do with your team, and whoever gets to the authorities first tells them everything. There aren't even any good authorities to go to. The wardens are in shambles. The major teams are either here or dealing with their own disasters. It won't work, Monokeros said, 
You won't get away. I'm going to try, Crystal Clear said. Cryptid said we should decentralize, Sveta said. I think it makes sense. We've got Ratcatcher out there. Cryptid's doing his thing. When in doubt, when law and right and wrong don't factor in, reach out, I murmured. Yeah, Sveta said. Let's reach out. Let's get our guys and Crystal Clear. You get your guys. Someone has to be able to find a good solution. Goddess has, Monocaro said. Please, Damsel said from the periphery of our gathering, still sitting with her back to a ruined wall. Shut the fuck up. Monokeros made a small giggling sound. My skin crawled. It's fine, she said, sounding very cavalier. The whites of her eyes showed very distinctly as she lowered her face to an angle. It was a model's pose for a portrait shot, a little out of practice, the hinges and bolts a little too loose in how she held herself together. But still a model's look meant for the dramatic effect. You should run far, far away, Crystal Clear. And I'm going to leave, too, to report to my Empress. The rest of you should do what you want. It's done. I'll tell her you did good work. Thanks for that, Ashley said, her voice laced with sarcasm. Come, Monokero said. Look out with me. Look out didn't budge. She gave you to me as a gift. It's a little bit like getting a book as a gift with the cover ripped in half. I have to grin and bear it. The entire team tensed. I might have put out a bit of aura, but I couldn't be sure. What the fuck? Rain asked. You did not just say that about our teammate and friend. It's fine, Lookout said, her voice light. She took a step forward and Ashley reached out for her. Lookout shrugged free of Ashley's hand, spinning around. It's okay, really. Please don't grab me like that. It's okay if she does it because she's that kind of person, but I know you're better than that, Ashley. Ashley let her hand fall to her side. I've got to do this, Lookout said, and I want you to trust me that I'm okay doing this. Okay, Ashley said. Not okay, Sveta raised her voice. The rest of us voiced our own protests. Come, Monokeros said, like she was talking to a dog. Lookout went to her with a bit of a skip in her step. Tristan was quickest to close the distance. Monokeros stumbled a little as she turned around, putting a hand out to her side, indicating Lookout. She's using her power, Crystal Clear said. Tristan stopped in his tracks. I'm using my power. Monokero said. She lowered her gaze again, so the glower of her eyes was barely visible beneath finely plucked eyebrows. The horn of the triangle tattooed on her forehead pointed at Tristan. She moved her hand, revealing a shiv that she had been keeping in the sleeve. Look out. Look out took the shiv. You don't want to do this, Ashley said. I told you what would happen. If they move a muscle to follow us, if they say a word, if they use a power, I want you to put that shiv in your neck as many times as you can before they make you stop. I'll be really, really proud of you if you do. The group was frozen. Really? If you can get it in there and give it a good twist, get it in there so it goes in one hole you've made and sticks out another, then cut out what's in between... I'll be extra proud. It doesn't really work that way, though, Lookout said. Her voice was small. I do more than I am asked for homework and the teachers get annoyed. I work hard on my projects and my team gets upset because I'm overworking myself. Every minute I'm working hard, and it is hard. There's this feeling in the back of my head, like I can imagine the warm, fuzzy feeling when they're amazed and happy. I've made them happy. That's what pushes me to do it but it never works out the way I hope because I hope too much. You want to impress me, don't you? Monokeros asked. I found myself shaking my head slightly as Lookout nodded. You can feel me, big in your head and your heart. 
Hold on to that feeling and believe, Monocaro said. Tristan started forward. Ashley stopped him, grabbing him with both hands to haul him back, force him to land on his ass. Close, Monocaro said. She said it to Lookout. He almost took a step forward. Lookout nodded. I want you to believe. If they step forward or give you any reason, and you do as I've told, then this will be the time that matters. Believe that. I believe you. Yeah, Monocaro said, barely audible. This one last time. Unless they let you and me walk away. The shiv fell from Lookout's fingers. Monokeros twisted around, but Lookout was backing off too. She drew her flash gun, pointing it at Monokeros. That... Lookout fired the gun. A bright flash that seemed to illuminate the entire side of the prison complex the pistol was pointing at. Won't work. I'm immune to my targets, Monokeros said. But she backed away a step, then lunged forward another step, bending down for the shiv. I was already flying. I wasn't alone in my charge. Monokeros hit me with her power. It took all of the fight out of me, blinded me, and sent my thoughts spiraling into irrational tangents. Instinct and impulse recognized people hurling themselves toward her, and a bizarre, white phosphorus bright impulse made me not want to share that space close to her with them. I turned. Lookout fired again, and the feeling went away as quickly as it had come, just an instant before I could lash out at anyone nearby. In the wake of it, I felt like a small part of me died, burned away. Not because of any lingering aspect of the power, but because I hadn't ever wanted to be influenced like this again. Blinded, Monokeros kept a hand out toward us. I saw others react as she hit them in turn firing blind. But she could only affect one person at a time. I put my hand around her throat. She hit me with her power, that white phosphor, all-consuming feeling of being overwhelmed in a good way. Again, the feeling of death as it passed. Swansong was there, saying something. If Antares lets go of you, I will take your head clean off. Then do it, Monokeros said. No, I said, no, we aren't killers. I didn't use my powers to force her to move. Shoulder to shoulder, my hand at Monokeros's neck, Swansong's hand gripping her by the ear, we made her walk backward. She started to speak, and I squeezed until the words stopped trying to get out. She'd talked enough. Her feet reached the edge of the lip of the hole we'd made. I've got it, Swansong said. You're sure? She nodded. Don't push her so she falls down to the hole and then falls through. That feels too barbaric. I know, Swansong said. Swansong held onto Monokeros's ear as the rest of Breakthrough formed a loose circle around the hole. Swansong had to crouch, one hand and both feet sliding on the slope as she got closer to the hole itself. She let go. Monokeros fell through. Capricorn's lights were already marking where he was closing off the tunnel. If anything in this was salvageable, it had to be we'd either tell people to watch out for Monokeros in the access tunnel, or that we'd just close the portal altogether, or leave it lensed. Not a death sentence, but if we could put her in a world without people, without innocence, where there was only nature and subsisting on her own, I was okay with that. My first genuine friend that doesn't have my DNA, and you know that's a high bar when it comes to quality. I turned to look at Swansong talking to Lookout, a small laugh from Lookout. And if you want to know for sure when people are proud of you, when people think you're amazing, then you should know that this... I turned away, turning a deaf ear to the scene. It was for them, not for me. Sveta was in Rain's hands. Tristan stood off to one side, keeping an eye on Thane. I turned my focus to Crystal Clear. He was standing way off to the side, almost a hundred feet away, 
staring off into the distance. Shouldn't you be going? I asked him. You wanted to get away. He shook his head. The crystals caught the meager light. No? Over there, he said, pointing. That building? Three hundred feet away. The building had been hit by something that had caved in one wall, wiping out the floors that separated the first floor from the second, so it was just a husk. What about it? I asked. I got that far, Crystal Clear said. And then... It was like something major had happened. A turning point in history, you know? I kind of know, I said. I had a whole mess of mixed feelings as I realized what he was saying. Trepidation was about fifty percent of that mess. It came from you guys, but it bounced, because I get a feeling it started somewhere else. I can see it with my power. She aligned you. That's a good way of putting it, Crystal Clear said. Oof. Oof, I said. I gave him a light punch in the shoulder. Come on, stick with us then. I wouldn't mind the backup. We didn't hurry as much now. If there were moves to be made, then they would be leisurely or opportunistic ones. There was no use running, not when we were all tired, not when I was carrying a prosthetic body and Rain had a pair of prosthetic tentacle arms. Besides, I wasn't really looking forward to seeing one inevitable individual in particular. We made our way past the shattered entrance building of the prison past looted rooms and parahumans standing watch over scared staff. I saw the assistant warden we'd reached out to earlier and approached him. Parahumans moved to block my path. They seemed to recognize me and then backed off a little. We'll do our best to help you out, I told him. Do you need anything? The look in his eyes was haunted as he shook his head. An inmate at his own asylum with the patience as the wardens, and maybe, just a little, there was a lifelong fear come to life, that the parahumans were taking over and there was nothing he could do about it. Keep your chin up, I said. Out of the portal and into another world, an interim world. Here, people were camping or laying out tables and other things they'd taken from the prison. There were a few improvised medical areas, and my heartbeat quickened on seeing them. I had to double and triple check to confirm. No Amy, for one thing. That was ninety percent of it. No friends, either. No rat catcher with grievous injuries. No Natalie. Not in the medical area, at least. It was a short hike to get to the other portal. We were offered a ride by someone that had taken a guard's car, but we refused. The group needed to stay together. It was what Lookout wanted and needed right now. The prison had been burned to the ground. The interim territory was a camp, a place to fall back to. This? This was the front line. All of the prisoners were gathered, organizing themselves. The heroes we'd brought along had come around to working with Goddess. I could place them by the teams they belonged to most of them. I saw a goddess, and I saw that she was talking to heroes. They weren't heroes that had accepted our invitation. She'd reached out, using her new power battery. I saw Lookout wave, and I saw Natalie gathered with prison staff. I spotted Ratcatcher on my own. She was standing on the back of a pickup truck, ropes binding her hands to the spoiler. I got Crystal Clear's attention, nudging him and pointing. I saw him nod. There were enough parahumans around us that we couldn't talk. The noise was too much. He tried anyway, saying something about how she was too big a pain in the ass. No Natalie, no rat catcher. Was it just the wardens now, fractured and distracted? Just us? who had barely enough of a sense of protocols to doubt this reality? We could say no to Monokeros, but were the others convincing themselves in the same way I was, thinking of how bad she was for Goddess? On that topic, of Goddess, I saw Cryptid in Goddess's vicinity, talking to... to my sister. 
He wore a monstrous form, narrow but with a chest and spine so distended that it was almost like he was a dorsal fin or clownfish with four legs extending from the sides and planting on the ground, like stout arms mid-push-up. His body was writ in mottled pink flesh, with a row of boils down the back. Only cryptid could be that weird. If I'd had any doubt about his identity, he wore the sash he usually did to protect his modesty and carry his stuff. What was unusual was that for the first time since I'd known him, he was changing where people could see, from this to something else. I saw flesh sag and sloth, and it wasn't this fin-shaped plague-disgusted thing. Goddess finished talking to the team she had just recruited. Arms folded, she surveyed her soldiers, and her soldiers, even the roughest of them, seemed to look up at her in turn. She turned her head and looked over the horizon. Earth Gimel's megalopolis glittered. I watched with a heavy heart and a growing feeling of trepidation as Cryptid and Amy joined a small handful of others, forming something of a line. Amy at Goddess's right hand, Cryptid a couple of spaces over, growing black feathers, his neck extending. He looked at us, and then he looked away. Mute, yet capable of saying everything with a single look. I looked back at Lookout, and I saw that she'd been happy to confirm the others were okay, and now she was geeking out with Rain and another cape I didn't recognize. They were pointing at the prosthetic suit of Sveta's I still carried. Only Sveta was really paying attention like I was, watching Amy and watching our teammate. She had been traumatized on a level by what had happened with the Irregulars. That story was repeating itself, at least on one small front. Betrayal, inexplicable. Communicated in one look. He was with Goddess, as we were, but he was no longer one of us. Arc 9, Gleaming, Chapter 15 We had enemies here. We had put Monokeros in an extended time out, and there was nothing saying that any of our enemies here could decide to do the same thing to us, or worse. There were fallen, tertiary members of Prancer's group, old birdcage villains like Monokeros who could be a danger to anyone, and any number of ex-prisoners who might have unkind views when it came to heroes. The rain wasn't as intense or driving as it had been before, but it was still a factor, still freezing most things. Prisoners were using force fields to shield themselves because they didn't have jackets, and the prison uniforms, while warm, weren't outdoor clothes. The ground was hard with frost and ice, except for where the passage of dozens of feet warmed it and turned it into mud. I glanced at Goddess's makeshift platform. The portal that led from Gimel to the interim world had been set on a hill with some lesser structures on it. The land leveled out. The platform was a large rock that had been cleaved in half, forming a flat sheet of rock with a crisp edge that would dull with a few more winters and rainy seasons. I could see the top half in pieces further down the slope, now serving as seats or perches for various capes in Goddess's battle line. The rain traced a loose fractal pattern as it wicked off of Goddess's bubble of telekinesis. On that platform, beside Goddess, I spotted Amy, and I immediately looked away. On the train with Tristan and Ashley, weeks ago, I'd seen Presley out of the corner of my eye, and it had reminded me of Amy. That had been enough to fuck with my mood and my head. Now she was here for real, not for the first time tonight. In the corner of my eye. Keeping her in the back of my mind weighed on me. Keeping her out of mind meant I was unpleasantly surprised when she came up. 
I could rationalize and reassure myself, and those reassurances about her character and the girl I'd grown up with fell to pieces when I thought about how she had repeatedly breached my boundaries. When she'd used her power on me in the first place, if only that, I could have maybe forgiven. When she'd used it on me a second time, following my explicit no because I'd been scared and I'd been dissolving alive? When she had repeatedly, constantly showed up despite my express wishes? There was a kind of fear where the heart raced. There was anticipatory fear where the heart pounded, a singular body-jarring thud at what felt like a slower rate, though it wasn't. My chest felt as though everything had seized up, and I couldn't feel my own heartbeat in my own chest. Enemies. Thinking about enemies was easier than thinking about... whatever Amy was. Lung stood at the furthest end of the makeshift stage from Goddess, tattooed arms folded. Someone had picked up his mask for him, and he now wore it. The metal had dark mud still caked in some of the creases, and from the angle of his head, he was watching me with eyes that still glowed. He didn't look pleased with his immediate company, which included Seer, and he didn't look pleased with me, either. To wait, take a detour, get medical care, or go straight to Goddess. Straight to Goddess meant getting past the Fallen, and past the Fallen could never be a thing that occurred without incident. Straight to Lung, angry as he was. Straight to Goddess, who we would have to tell about Monokeros. Straight to Cryptid, who wouldn't look me in the eye. Straight to Amy, who stood at the edge of that stage, lurking in the corner of my eye, not looking at me, going out of her way not to look at me. That didn't make it better. Crystal Clear's voice interrupted my thoughts. I'd forgotten I was with the group. I'm going to go see if they'll let me talk to Ratcatcher. I'm supposed to be keeping an eye on her. Or a crystal. Keeping a crystal on her, Lookout said. Crystal Clear smiled. Yeah, I guess. Can you keep an eye out for Fumehood, Antares? I will, I said. I floated a little higher so I could see over just a few more heads in the crowd. Crystal Clear jogged off, costume boots tromping in the mud and the puddles that had formed on frozen dirt. I miss my gear already, Lookout said. I feel blind. I can't believe I didn't get any readings from him. Blind was right. It was still dark, even with the light of powers and the lanterns and freestanding lights that had been brought over from the prison. The storm above didn't make it any better, diffusing the glow of all the electric lighting. What's broken? Rain asked. Everything's a little broken, or it's moist. Half of it won't work at all. Diagnostics and reboots aren't helping, and the other half doesn't work well anymore. Water between lenses, balances and tolerances are all off. Ugh. My phone doesn't work, my flash gun is a 50-50 about if it's gonna work, and my other stuff is on the blink, cutting out. I know the feeling. I miss my body, Sveta said. Oh gosh, sorry. Here I am complaining and... It's okay, it's fine, Sveta said. There was a smile on her face, and her voice was light. Complain all you want. You'll fix it, Swansong said. You'll both be fine. I turned to face the group and observe, glad to have my back to the stage. Freezing rain pattered on my hood. Lookout shook her head. I'll fix some of it. Some. Some is broken forever. The broken forever stuff is like my easier, cheaper work, like my mask. And less cheap stuff, like my projector disc, but still, that's a lot of work. And I don't have my regular workshop anymore, so it's harder to find the time and get stuff done. You might have a workshop where we end up, Rain said. We don't know where we're going from here. Maybe we all end up with a small country to run. That caught your attention, huh? I asked. I... he started. I've kind of always fantasized about having a place of my own. Even my fantasies don't ever get nearly that big, but it's easier to imagine because I've imagined smaller-scale versions of it. Give me a cabin or a quaint house with a good-sized backyard and I'll be content. 
Standards reign, Swansong said. Think mansion or tower. You need room for servants. Ah, Rain said. Cute young men in elegant black uniforms who run to obey when you snap your fingers, Damsel said. Two claws clacked together. And young women, Swansong said. Damsel arched an eyebrow. You think so? Are you more worldly now, or is this a strategy? Distracting male visitors? Swansong shook her head. We're talking about Rain. Rain would want women, I imagine. You say imagine, but I cannot imagine Rain in a manner with maids, Byron said. Sorry, Rain. No, I'm grateful enough you pay enough attention to know I'm not a maid guy, if anything. It would be maids and a singular manservant. A Jeeves type, if you will, Swansong said. If you're to go that route... I'm really not going to. It's a good idea to have a same-sex servant who has the right sensibilities when it comes to your hygiene, fashion, and other needs. I don't want any servants at all. I'm saying my standards are perfectly good where they are. A house just big enough for me. A whole country is an interesting thought exercise, but if Goddess wanted me to run a country, I'd still lean toward having a small house and no servants. Servants rub me the wrong way, after some of what I saw growing up. Swan Song made a disappointed sound. Um, so, hmm, you wouldn't want a Jeeves, that makes sense, Lookout said, before her tone of voice changed to a maximum unsubtle. What about an, um, a you-know-who? Uh, wouldn't you want room for at least one more person in your cabin, even as a maybe? You-know-who and I haven't talked enough lately, Rain said. He paused. You know... I don't think I've ever really imagined myself having both a house and someone I really care about as part of the same scene. Well, once, but that was special circumstances, and it wasn't a happy sort of special. Now I'm curious, Byron said. I'll tell you and Tristan later, I guess. Anyhow, I wonder if it's because it felt like even that was asking too much. Set your standards as high as you can, Swansong said, while Damsel nodded beside her. Then live up to them. If I set my expectations low, then me being in prison is tolerable. Things sucked before, and the only thing I wanted was out. I got what I wanted, and I'm happy about that. I am, was, actually genuinely reasonably okay with being here. And now we're free, Swansong said. She looked around. Or something. Something. They were talking about future and dreams, and all I could think about was the uncertainty before us. Either the Chris thing was all in my head, or they hadn't been looking at the right times to see it. We need to get through this first, Sveta said. Thank you, Sveta, for saying it. She went on. Look at Goddess. She's tense. Teacher isn't done, and we still have enemies out there. We have enemies in here. I said, my voice quieter. And that's something we need to be careful of. Rain looked over his shoulders. Lung's end of the stage was closest to us, and the fallen were closest to Lung. They didn't have much of a tribe, exactly. The other gangs that they'd roped into their circle to defend against the good guys were too low-level to contribute much to the prison population. Dealers and bikers. It meant that they were mostly limited to a gathering of ex-teacher followers. I don't think they'll start anything. You've got to have balls and be stupid to pick a fight when the rest of the crowd could come after you, or if Goddess could get upset. Shitty as he is, I don't think Seer is that stupid and that brave. The Fallen weren't my only concern. I looked at Cryptid, who was still transforming. More feathers now. It was a form that looked pretty much exactly like his earlier shape. The twisted-up wingless bird with the hooked beak, and a neck that looked broken, head dangling. The point where the beak grazed skin where feathers were pushing through, more spear-like than feather-like as they were slick with moisture, and where the beak grazed it left a line of oozing blood. What's cryptid's form there? I asked. No idea, Sveta answered me. Others shook their heads. 
He likes birds for the grieving, sad, pensive thinking realm of things, Lookout said. I've never seen him change, Rain said, observing. And he's changed a few times today. Twice earlier in the day, before anything even happened, then to this bird form. He changed later to whatever he was just a few minutes ago with the ridge of cysts. And now back to this? Did he... Rain stopped mid-question, looking at me. Did he get help from Amy? I asked. The words sounded wrong in my mouth. Panacea? I don't know. He might hurt tomorrow, Byron said. Maybe, I agreed. It might have sounded callous to say it out loud, but the pain he'd suffer tomorrow was the least of my concerns. Every time I looked his way, I was trying to find some eye contact, some signal, anything that would suggest he was working with the group. I felt like I was seeing the opposite dynamic at play. I saw him limp up behind Amy. The head swung like a pendulum, and he had to catch it with a talon hand to keep it from hitting Amy. Amy said something to him. My skin crawled. Look out, I said. Yes? I know you hate being left behind, but... No, she said. It would make it easier to gloss over the Monokeros thing if you were with Natalie and not front and center in front of Goddess, I said. Not my only reason. No, she said. I don't want to split up. Even if staying with the group in the short term means Goddess might get worried again, assigning you another babysitter? Even if, Lookout said. I found myself at a bit of a loss for words. I could argue logic, but this wasn't born of logic. My issue wasn't born of logic either. Half of the reason I wanted Lookout to hang back was because I didn't like how Cryptid was acting. If he was in a bad place, if he was thinking about hurting himself to try and do something, or if he really wasn't part of Breakthrough anymore, then I didn't want Lookout in the midst of it. She should come, Sveta said. It's best if we stay together, Lookout said, sounding solemn and sincere. But thank you for thinking about me. Can I call in a favor? I asked. I made a rectangle with my index finger and thumbs. Or use the It's Complicated card? Let me do this. Let me explain later. I have a gut feeling about this. I have a heart feeling about this, Lookout said, stubborn. It couldn't be easy. Antares, Swansong said. She stood up to Monokeros. She's strong. I know. I'm not disputing that. She stood up to Monokeros because she's worked really hard with dealing with obsessive and overwhelming feelings, Swansong said her voice quiet. And because she really wants to stay with the group. She wants the group together. I bit my tongue. I looked over my shoulder at Chris. He still stood by Amy, growing taller and taller, the feathers filling in the space to the point that barely any skin showed, and the skin that did show had large, goosebump-like growths on it that indicated the feathers pushing through. Amy had her tattooed hands clasped in front of her, dot on her shoulder. Amy's hood had been pulled up and to the side, used by dot for warmth. Goddess's power kept them protected from the rain. The group being together or not together was the problem. Stay close to Swansong and Damsel. Keep that emotional training in mind. This might be a tough situation. Got it, Lookout said. I nodded to myself. Fuck. I ran fingers through my hair to fix it, then adjusted my grip on Sveta's prosthetic body to ensure it sat squarely on my shoulder. Of course the fallen stepped into our way. Rain Man, Seer drawled the words. We were talking about you. I'm hurt you didn't come say hi earlier. Yeah, well, didn't see the point, Rain said. Respect is the point, Rain Man, Seer replied. We're not people you want as enemies. I don't want the Fallen as friends either, Rain said. The respect thing is already decided. You don't deserve any. The heavyset man smirked. We have business with Goddess, I said before Seer could answer. It was, in a passive way, my way of backing Rain up. 
more voices in the conversation made it hard to retort to cut Rain down, and I wasn't sure Rain was the best guy when it came to wordplay and coming off as intimidating with words alone. The lady says she doesn't want any hassle. If we let just anyone up there, then everyone's going to want to come by, say how they can be useful, try to elbow their way in. It's important, I said, and it won't take long. It was Tristan who added his voice to mine. Refuse us access and you can be the one to explain why she didn't get the information she needed. When had they switched? The drowned rat in gold armor can fly, can't she? She goes alone. Me? I could, but... We're sticking together, Seer, I said. I don't think you were even assigned this job. You're just trying to make yourself important, pretending to be a gatekeeper. Do you really want to test me, little girl? He asked. He locked eyes with me. Rain Man, you should tell these ignorant fools to think twice about what they're doing. Why would I do that, Tim? Because, Rain, you'd better believe we know where your slut friend lives. Tristan put a hand at Rain's shoulder, as if to stop him from advancing. Rain wasn't quite the type to charge forward to swing a punch, though. Some expert advice for you. If you have one person you want to keep in line, Rain, then it doesn't work if you hit them, take a belt to them, stick their head in a water barrel. It takes forever. But if you get them as a pair, sisters, mother, daughter, man and his wife, boy and the girl that will forever be too good for his useless self, it's easy. Tell the first one that if they don't listen, you'll hit the second. Tell the second that if they don't listen, you'll hurt the first takes no time at all to break the both of them. I think the fact that you have to do that makes you all look pretty fucking pathetic, Seer, Rain said. You call me pathetic, I call you the same thing, Seer said, and his voice was a growl. Difference between us is that in a matter of hours, you're going to be on your knees, sniveling and begging for us to stop hurting the girl. Could be that you're there, could be that you're on the phone. I won't even ask, and you'll still be begging to take back any insult you said about me. That's how that is. And the other way around? There is nothing you can say or do that will change my mind about how shit you are. His words were followed up by some shuffling movements and chuckles from the four or five fallen and assorted others that were keeping him company. Rain started forward. Tristan's hand was still at his shoulder and it might have been what stopped him from doing something regrettable. Tristan became Byron, and Byron leaned in to say something to Rain. Can I shoot him? Lookout asked. No, I said. Can I? Damsel asked. I thought about it for a second. No. What's going on here now? Another person joining the conversation with a retinue at their backs. Cole Belcher. He'd found clothes, and now wore a heavy jacket with a hood, zipped up all the way, a ball cap, and jeans. I had no idea how he'd found anything that fit him, but he'd managed. A bit of black drool extended from the corner of his mouth to his chin. He was of a similar frame to Seer, but a little more put together now. Family, Seer said it like it was an epithet. A boy not respecting his betters. I saw Cole Belcher's eyes. He was crude in dress, in speaking style, and in apparent intent, but there was calculation going on there, and he assessed the situation here. He hadn't earned his position as top man on the guy's side of the prison by pure luck. "'Tell you what, Tim,' Cole Belcher said. "'Let me talk to him. Consider it a stipulation.' "'Stipulation?' Rain asked." We still don't know what's happening next, Cole Belcher said. But they need to shore up numbers, and there's me and my people all without a place to go. You're joining them, I said. Maybe. Depends. If our empress there is giving us each a territory of our own, doesn't make sense to. But if she's grouping us together, could be we join in, work with. Bad idea, Rain said. We can hold our own. Cole Belcher said. 
but I won't be lowest of the low. I go in as an equal, and I bring six powered boys from the prison and one powered son with me in exchange. You want to be a brother of the family so you can tell me to back off and let you talk to these pukes? Seer asked. Seems like a waste. Sure, it's fine, Colbelcher said. We have a pre-existing relationship. Seer shrugged. He gave one of his guys a push on the shoulder and they walked off. They were still close enough to get in our way if they wanted, not necessarily in earshot. You kind of disappointed me, Cole. I said. Disappointed? Must be we got our wires crossed. His higher voice had a wry, mocking tone as a bass line, as if everything he said was sarcastic. It was hard to tell if he was serious about the wires getting crossed. Maybe I was too subtle, I said. You said you wanted me to do for her what you did for me. And? I asked. And you got me out. Or close enough. Now I'm really out. I'm bristling for a fight. It's all good. Won't deny that. Did I misinterpret your intent? No, you read that right. Except she's still there with the other civilians. You didn't get her out. Natalie? Lookout asked. She looked up at me, head craning back. I nodded. On the stage above, Goddess was walking toward us. Half of her attention was on the horizon. I let her go. She got away for a bit. Then they caught her. I can't keep letting her... He stopped as Goddess came within earshot. All voices in the vicinity stopped outright or went quiet. Even the rain was silent, bouncing off the telekinesis. Amy stood at the other end of the stage, framed by Cryptid's black feathers, his rear legs to her left, one of his front legs planted on the ground to her right, head dangling so that his beak was near her elbow. Couldn't get rid of her. I can't seem to be rid of you, Goddess said. The weird alignment of thoughts threw me for a momentary loop. Sorry? This meeting, Goddess said, indicating Cole Belcher and the rest of us with an extended finger. Seer fucked off just enough that he was too far away to be included in the group. Two groups that concern me. Where the fuck is Monokeros? She wasn't just tense. She was pissed and tense. She pulled a knife on lookout. It was over the top and unwarranted, I told her. We put her in time out. Two of Teacher's thralls are in there with her, Blindside and Kingdom Come. You should get them carefully, and get Monokeros if you absolutely have to, but I really recommend keeping her there. I will retrieve her later, but it'll have to wait. There are other concerns, Goddess said. My danger sense is emanating from your group, from you in particular. It's identifying Cole Belcher and his group in a similar way. Tell me why. I don't know why, I told her. We may just be those types of people, Sveta said, her voice slightly muffled. A little closer to being dangerous than average. Gee, thanks. I said. Is there anything we can do to help? Lookout asked Goddess. You know, if you give me a computer, I can gather information, or I can pull up records on people you have here, see if we can find the right tool in the toolbox for your particular problems. You're among my problems, according to my danger sense, Goddess said, her voice hard. Teacher has more coming. Not an army this time, but a trap. Mama Mathers? Rain asked. Yes, I won't put my hand into that bear trap. We meet strength with subtlety and subtlety with strength. Cole Belcher, I'll have you as part of the army that sweeps over that part of the city. Destroy everything and destroy her with it. I could do that. Work with Seer and Knock Knock. Keep them in line. Do this and I'll reward you. I'll get everyone organized. Be ready to move quickly. The wardens may choose that time to attack. Once we know she's gone, you'll fold back and catch the wardens by the rear. Immobilize, don't kill. I'm not much of a killer, Cole Belcher said. I'm not much of an immobilizer either. 
If you can't do it, I'll ask someone else. I can do it. Let me find people. I think I know someone who can move large groups. I assigned one to Knock Knock, Goddess said. City Slicker. That's the one I was thinking of. We'll get it done, Cole Belcher said. Goddess didn't respond, didn't change in expression or move her head or hands. She stared at Cole Belcher and he shifted his weight a little, before raising his heavy chin, emulating a soldier standing at attention. If a soldier could be of the greasy, drooling black baseball cap sort. You have a choice, Cole Belcher. My power is telling me there's something about you that I should be wary of. I have no idea what you mean. You're promising power, fame, fortune, a territory of my own, and a slice of normal pie after two years of living in this shithole we slapped together here? I'm all about that. I'm yours. I'm loyal. Perhaps, she said. She turned her head, found someone, and indicated for them to come. It was crock shit the lie detector. The tattoos of scales on her arms were standing out slightly in relief. Say it again, that you're loyal and that I don't need to worry about you. I'm loyal. You don't need to worry about me. Crocoshit nodded. He's fine. He doesn't feel fine, Goddess said. If something happens, Cole Belcher, if something occurs to you, a thought that you haven't fully formed, a memory that surfaces, an idea you're not quite ready to have yet, consider it very carefully. It may matter more than you think, and your entire fate hinges on the decision you make. Yes, ma'am, he replied, his voice nasally. He horked up something and spat it off to the side. The spit was like a gunshot, silent but bullet-quick and violent, with a chunky black splatter that smoked visibly. His voice was slightly less nasal as he finished. I'll think carefully. She dismissed Cole Belcher with a sweep of the hand. I'm in alignment, I said. We all are in breakthrough, Natalie accepted. Natalie? Our lawyer, the civilian. She looked mildly annoyed that Natalie had even been brought up in that context. She glanced at Croc. They're fine, Croc of shit said. They feel like an ambient danger, Goddess said. Stay where I can see you, Breakthrough. You should know, we disabled the ankle bombs, I said. Your army should be safe. Hmm. Goddess made a noise, not even a full word. I could see a sheen of sweat, where hair was sticking to her head near her temple. More sweat shone at the back of her neck. Are you okay? Sveta asked. This was easier the first time, Goddess said. A decision I made as a teenager to take over, solve all of the problems. Eternal youth through my cocoon man, beauty, endless wealth and power. It was fine. It sounds great, Lookout said. Then it was all taken away. Each and every one of my enemies expects me to take it back, which forces me to do just that, because a third of them would eliminate me. A third would enslave me to use me, and another third would castrate me and take everything vital to me, all of my power. That castration wouldn't guarantee I'm saved from the first two groups. We were silent. I feel it. My danger sense makes me aware of the proportions and how close they each loom. Do you want a hug? Lookout asked. I want my enemies crushed and gone, Goddess said. Be ready to assist in the fighting if they get this far. Yes, ma'am, I said. The wardens will strike in a matter of minutes. They're partially protected from me, so timing will be critical. Teacher will also time his attack, delivering the Mathers woman, in the hopes I stick my hand into the trap. Be ready. Maybe you could die in the fighting and simplify things. If it helps, then sure, Lookout said. I'd rather not, I said putting a hand on Lookout's shoulder. I was joking, Lookout said. Hmm, Goddess said. She fixed her hair and her collar. I wasn't sure why, since she could look like anything and nobody here would mind, and then she lifted herself off the ground. Wardens inbound. I hope it's not weld with the wardens, I said. Tell me about it, Sveta replied, voice soft. 
or Vista, or Miss Militia, or anyone, I said. I grit my teeth. Are you guys ready? I don't have stuff, Lookout said. Maybe if there's a computer somewhere nearby, I can track things in the city, or do a quick repair of my phone. We'll check inside, I said. Capricorn, Rain, Swansong, Damsel, you guys handle the front line? Leave me and Sveta and the prosthetic body? I'll see what I can do to get things working, Rain said. Please, Sveta said. No promises, Rain said. So after I made a big deal about not wanting to split up, we're splitting up? Lookout asked. I frowned. Sorry to be needy, she said. I just, you know, <laughs> I'm a bit weird after the whole tear your throat out thing. You're a bit weird always, Rain said. But so are the rest of us, so you're in good company. Yeah, Lookout said. Listen, it's okay. I'll manage somehow. I'll get stuff fixed and I'll have a neat trick. Maybe I can supercharge my light gun and we can blind an entire attacking force, then... Lookout, I interrupted her. We're short on time. Let me go get a computer from the entrance building. I'll bring you tech. Good? Good, Lookout said, breathless. Good. I took off. We were fighting the Wardens now. We were fighting Mama Mathers. Us against the world. And it didn't feel triumphant. It felt like we were up against the whole fucking world. Multiple worlds. I was spooked, and I wasn't happy. I didn't like this, even as I could take it as necessary. We didn't have a choice, just as Goddess hadn't. I saw Crystal Clear with Fume Hood. I dropped to the ground. One foot slipped in mud, the other hit ice-hard soil. Five-second recap, I said. Wardens are coming, be ready to fight. Teacher's bringing in the big guns. One is Mama Mathers. If she doesn't come from the city, it's going to be up to all of us to deal with what she does, capture, and kill her, despite the insanity effect. Crystal Clear made a face. He'd be vulnerable. Five-second response, he said. They wouldn't let me talk to Ratcatcher, but she seems healthy, if irritable. I tried to check on your lawyer, but again... No contact. I said. I'm getting a computer and then I'll be back. Good luck. Natalie. I flew toward the building, finding Natalie while I was on my way. Lights were few and far between, so the entire group of staff was huddled beneath a lip of a rock, one light shared by a hundred people. Natalie was fairly close to the front, near the assistant warden, her fingers pressed together and to her mouth for warmth. Nothing I could do. I'd tried to create an opportunity. Ratcatcher was easier to find again, since she was mounted on one of the trucks in a group that was being used to produce light, headlights cutting through the mist of freezing rain, people's breath, and people's body heat. She saw me, and then she looked away, the rain-soggy cone of her paper mask making the direction she was facing abundantly clear, similar to what I'd seen with Cryptid and Chris. A rebuke? No, this wasn't a rebuke. I saw the nose move as she angled her head to check where I was in the sky, looking askew at me, then the nose moved again. Pointing. A staff building. I changed direction. She'd done something before getting caught. What? I didn't even know her power for sure. Rodent control? It was supposed to be thinker. I wasn't sure what I'd expected. My heart had been frozen in my chest for what felt like fifteen or twenty minutes, and now it pounded. The building interior was dark, with many lights burned out or broken, and the contents of offices, of trash cans, and the papers that had topped the desks were now strewn everywhere. Hello? I called out. She'd been in the tunnel and she'd run. She'd gone through the vents and... she'd come here? A small building with offices and files. Chairs, a bench, plants. No animals to be seen, no rodents. I shivered. Paperwork, file folders, filing cabinets with drawers pulled out and thrown into walls with enough force to make dents and holes. Nothing about or in the dents or holes that I could see. More benches for sitting and waiting, with metal loops embedded in the walls for prisoners to be handcuffed to. 
paperwork, more paperwork, another potted plant, a vending machine that had been raided, the chips and candies that hadn't been eaten now piled on the ground beneath the shattered glass pane. A few feet away there was blood, not from the vending machine. The blood was part of a trail of splatters leading to a dead guard, one of the metal loops for handcuffing prisoners now embedded in his chest cavity. I felt for a pulse, and I knew there wasn't one. My heart pounded harder than before, feeling the lack of pulse. What could he have told me? I reached the end of the hallway, found the stairs, and flew in a zigzag to navigate the flights. The building only had two floors, and the damage to the second was negligible, nothing strewn around, most offices locked. I shivered a bit more. Lookout was expecting me to deliver a computer. I was... I was chasing a vague hint from a girl in a paper mask, if it could even be called a hint. Hello? I called out again. Back down to the first floor, I stared down the length of it. She'd left the tunnel, and she'd done what? She'd been caught, just like Natalie. She'd caused enough of a fuss that they'd tied her up, despite the fact that she was aligned. Was she aligned? The tainted food. The drugged food. Natalie had had her bound hands pressed to her mouth. Had she been warming her breath? Or had I caught a glimpse of something in the way of a message? They'd crossed paths, met, collaborated. I flew down the hallway. The stuff from the vending machine. Bags of chips that were half air and half chip. Boxes of candy. Many were damaged. Some were dirty in a way that could have meant they'd been walked on. I held the candies and I hesitated. It was hard to convince myself to. It felt disloyal. Master Stranger Protocols I imagined Natalie with her fingers to her mouth, like it was a mimed order. Driven by an impulse, feeling like I was potentially about to take poison, I took the most dirty, most damaged package, opened a hole wider, and then tipped a few of the gummy candies back into my mouth. In the distance, it sounded like Goddess was tearing a mountain out of the ground. I chewed, tasting the chemicals and preservatives of the candy, something I'd never been a huge fan of, and it tasted delicious. I swallowed, turning my head toward the ceiling in the process, and I closed my eyes. Was it just candy? A part of me wanted it to be. A part of me wanted an excuse to feel less uneasy. The conflict was brewing, and good people were going to get hurt. Goddess was... <laughs> fucked in the head. Fuck her. Fuck this. I hope your fucking danger sense is making your head spin, lady in blue. I grabbed the other candies and chips, favoring the broken bags. When my hands were full, I speared them on the spikes of my costume. Style be damned. How had they managed it? The building had been collapsed. Rats. Mice. It might have been Natalie who gave Ratcatcher the direction. Ratcatcher who did the lifting. Had they known they were going to be caught and laid this as a trap? Something that anyone coming through might pick up and share? Cole Belcher would have been near Natalie if he'd been protecting her or watching out for her as part of the deal. Had he taken some candy? Had he eaten some, or did he have it saved for later? Was that why Goddess didn't like her sense of him? I could see him being loyal but not aligned, or aligned but carrying tainted candy. More the former, since he didn't seem the type to save something for later. I reached the first large group near the interim portal. Chips or candy? I asked. What? There's a big fight brewing, I said. We need to get energy up, and there's not much food. Do you want chips? Candy? Chips? Fuck yeah, a guy said. Share, I said, with emphasis. With luck, he'd have one or two, it would kick in, and he'd start sharing it out of spite. I sure was. Another group. It might have been Auger, though it wasn't members I recognized. They'd come to help defend the portal and stall for time. I just threw them the candy. The woman who caught it saluted. 
Share, I said. Goddess should be getting pinged pretty hard right now, if this is working like I hope. Another hero group. I tossed them two small bags of chips. Hopefully, it got us another set of non-goddess allies. There was a chance that some of this wasn't treated. I just had to hope that most or some of it was. We were picking a massive fight. A small gang of criminals. I threw them something, and I didn't wait for a response. Rain streamed down around me, drumming against my costume, loud against the plastic of the chip bags and the bags and boxes that had the candy. I saw my team. No computer? Lookout asked. Were they all broken? Something better, I said. I tossed her a bag of candy, then tossed another to Rain. Uh, Rain said. The sentiment's appreciated, but... Eat. Energy, I said. Mind trading, Kens? Rain asked. You don't like grape? Not this type, no, he said. Only because I like you, she said. I felt like my heart was beating so fast it would give everything away. I focused on the distance. It's bad, Byron said. You can't see it right this second, but she's altering landscapes. Yeah, I said. I heard. There was another blast. Another sound like a mountain was being uprooted. The ground shook, and this time my feet were touching it to really feel the impact. Not a mountain, a building with some foundations. I saw it move. From a distance, it seemed to move very slowly. I knew that it would be moving at a dangerous speed if one was actually at the scene. Kenzie, her mask still open so her eyes, nose, and mouth were visible, her face otherwise enclosed by the helmet, looked up at me. I raised an eyebrow and saw her nod slightly. Ash, want grape gummies? That sounds atrocious. Atrocious in the best way. Kenzie said. Swansong took two. Damsel did the same. I watched as the candy was shared around. Kenzie cracked Sveta's ball open to give her some. Nice fashion, Swansong told me, indicating the packages that had yet to be delivered, speared to my shoulder. I prefer less colorful accessories. There were few enough that I could pluck them free. I held the assorted packages in two hands. Ah, Swansong said. She met my eyes. Good candy. Others did the legwork, I said. Relief surged through me. Guys, Sveta shouted. The momentary peace was disturbed. One of the buildings in the distance had changed trajectory. Two stories of apartment building flew end over end as it soared toward us, shedding a stream of concrete fragments. Look out! I shouted at the top of my lungs. I put my arms out and I flew. I caught Lookout and Swansong, and Lookout had Sveta. I almost had a grip on Damsel, but she slipped free, moving her hands to avoid slashing my hand and arm open rather than cling. My flight was uneven, and my burdens heavy and awkward enough that I didn't feel confident flying up. Tristan and Rain were running, trying to get clear. It was already so dark, the night so chaotic, that I couldn't fully process what happened as it hit. The casualties, the devastation, whether other teams had been caught in it. The rush of air threw me off course, and my grip on my team members was broken. Everyone rolled, tumbled, or otherwise sprawled. Damsel used her power to shoot at the incoming projectile. I could see most of the team. I dropped the candies. If only I'd kept them on my armor. The lady in blue. It had been her, reacting to danger sense, hurling a building. Now I could see her flying toward us. She landed, shaking her head as she did. The dust seemed like too little for the impact and the size of the chunk of the building. It might have been the rain or the darkness obscuring some of it. I could see Lung, other teams, people I had definitely not given candy to, were converging on our location, supporting the lady in blue. I could see Amy in the background. She did nothing to help. She was silent, passive, a ghost to haunt me. 
my costume shifted around me. The lady in blue lifted me into the air by my costume. Not all people who could affect inorganic things could only do that. Sometimes, just being adjacent to something organic made it hard to manipulate inorganic materials. I fought with my flight. She held me firm. I activated the wretch, then deactivated it as soon as I saw that lookout was too close just below me. One by one, she plucked up the members of Breakthrough. Her head turned. Dirt and mud sprayed sky-high as she used her power. Dealing with another attacker. Someone I'd given candy to? The dirt and mud hadn't even finished raining down when she used her power again. I saw the shape of him, leaping to one side. He was more visible in the cloud of dirt, rain, and mud than he was ordinarily. Black feathers on black background. I could feel the dim impulse that she pushed out, the punctuation mark, the power to control. He moved faster. I felt it again. This time, he dropped to all fours. Harder! Crocoshit shouted from the sidelines. You almost had him! The lady in blue used her power again, more forcefully than before. Cryptid leaped. I saw the moment of hesitation, the moment of realization that there was nothing inorganic on him to grab. She ripped up the earth instead. He was thrown into the air, lost in the flurry of mud. I used my power, hard, to distract, to break her focus. Appearing sooner than should have been possible, Cryptid was right next to her. The ground broke under his feet, point-blank this time. It didn't go any further than the cracking of the ground. Cryptid's talons found the Lady in Blue's midsection. He tore her open, sternum to pelvis, and his talons hooked into vital organs. He pulled them free, and all of the strength went out of her. For how much damage had been done... It took four or five surprising seconds before her power canceled out. We dropped out of the air, and I flew to catch lookout before she could land too awkwardly. All around us, people were shuffling closer. Amy was among them. Cryptid was at the center, his broken neck twisted around, his head dangling. His beak was like a curved blade, gleaming in the rain, pointing at the small of his back. I could see what that was supposed to mean now. Crocoshit hadn't been telling the truth. Goddess's power hadn't almost worked. Croc had been among the people I'd given candy to just before I'd reunited with the group. Fitting. I couldn't bring myself to enjoy the irony. Chris, Lookout said. Cryptid looked at her, then seized his head. He moved it side to side, shaking it in a no Did Amy do this? I asked. I didn't do anything. Amy's voice cut through the dark and the patter of the rain. Organized. Struck a deal. I swallowed hard. Deal? She wouldn't look me in the eyes. Everyone! I couldn't remember her shouting. She'd never been one to do it. Everyone! You have a choice! We are going to Earth Shin! We are going to be in authority. I couldn't bring myself to speak. Sveta did it for me. Amy. Amy shook her head, glancing at Sveta. There will be rules. This means submitting to my power. It will not be as goddesses was. You'll follow a code of laws. You'll maintain control and peace, and you'll protect populations. You'll be reasonably good, or you can stay here. You'll be freer, but you'll also be a target for heroes. She planned this. I looked at Cryptid. She planned this with him. Dot was perched on her shoulders, clearly excited, but Amy's expression was impossible to read. What the hell are you doing? I asked. She met my eyes. She looked almost angry as she looked away, as if she had the fucking right. Come with us or stay. It's your choice, she said. She looked at Cryptid. Is that okay? Cryptid seized his head and moved it in a yes motion. 
Amy's expression was both angry and sad as she surveyed everything. Freezing rain streaked down her hood, and her breath fogged. She met my eyes. Red Queen, Lookout said under her breath. Dot called her that. My skin crawled. The Red Queen started to walk away. Cryptid was at her side. Some prisoners were fairly quick to leave to follow. Ones who knew her from the birdcage? With them went followers, and once a critical amount had left, a majority followed. Only the heroes really stayed. Only rubble, dust, and mud now. Scarcely any lights on this hillside. What? Chris? Lookout asked. She giggled, sounding uncertain, and Swansong pulled her into a hug, so Lookout's face was buried in Swansong's side. It would have been a full-body hug if Lookout hadn't been hugging the orb. What just happened? Others were arriving now. Natalie was with the prison staff. Ratcatcher was with Crystal Clear and Fume Hood. They seemed to be free of the influence of the Lady in Blue, who had been practically torn in half, now lying ten feet away from me. After seeing my... seeing Amy like that, the grisly scene was somehow one of the least shocking things in the midst of all this. He was just waiting for an opening? Rain asked. Shh, Swansong. The assistant warden drew closer. We'd been some of the people on point through all of this. He wanted answers. I didn't have any. Amy? We need to... to do something about this, I said. Are you up for it? Byron asked. I shook my head. Images of Amy and the sounds of her voice were weighing on my mind, interrupting half of my thoughts. I reached out for Sveta's ball. Lookout handed it over. Sorry, I told Sveta. I hugged the ball tight. Sorry. I felt her forehead thunk against the side of the orb. Okay, Byron said. I'm officially passing the baton. We both know you're good at this part. He blurred. Once I realized what he was saying, a second or so later than I should have, I could understand it. I nodded. Yeah, Tristan said. He started striding toward the assistant warden. Without turning to face us, he intoned the words. Damage control. Gleaming. Interlude 3. Day 0. As soon as the words left Tristan's mouth, he regretted them. He saw the looks on the faces of his teammates, and the magnitude of what he had just done hit home. Liar, Moonsong said. Tristan had dealt with his share of adrenaline before, but in this moment he wasn't sure if he felt the adrenaline from the fight bottoming out, or if he felt the adrenaline of this moment ramping up to a ridiculous extreme. The system shock, the shock of being called out, and the tension of the moment made him tremble. No, you're lying. Easy, Moon, Figurehead said. He reached out, and she pushed his hand away. There were tears welling in her eyes, and he couldn't even call them crocodile tears this time because there were tears forming in his own eyes. If he changed back now... No. The line had been crossed. If he took it back now, it wouldn't change the fact that Byron would know. Byron would start thinking about what to do. Tribute was filling others in. Steamwheel was mostly out of costume, wearing only her mask. Her suit had been disintegrated, hadn't it? Furcate stood off to the side, staring. That hurt. It threw him. He couldn't tell Furcate he realized. They'd never been someone he could really talk with, but they'd been an ally. He couldn't tell Nate. He couldn't tell anyone. Figurehead dropped to one knee, hand clapping down on the metal of Tristan's armor. The half-hug and supporting touch was walled off by thick, elaborately decorated metal, to the point he could barely feel it. 
Tristan? Moonsong hissed his name. He could feel his heart stop. Look me in the eyes. Tristan reached up, fumbling as he tried to pull off a helmet he had put on and taken off a hundred times. His movements were so ineffectual that Figure had helped, and Tristan accepted without complaint. There were no bystanders, and the group was clustered in close. He was my brother, Tristan said. I love him, but he's not in here anymore. His vision momentarily blurred as a tear covered the surface of one eye. He rubbed it away. She didn't rub anything away, letting moisture streak her cheeks beneath her mask, dark with makeup. He saw her expression. Anger dominated it, and that anger terrified him. Every survival instinct he had meshed with that quiet horror, seizing him. He pushed it to his expression, raw and unfiltered. He had no idea what to do, and he let her see it. The anger faltered. Try again, she said. Please? If he released Byron now, what would happen? They would both live in fear. He could imagine the scenarios. Even the pair of them being out would be a hell of dread and mortal worry. He tried to convince himself to step to the edge of the cliff he was expected to jump from. For his entire life, he'd made the jumps. He couldn't. I can't, he said. Coiffure rose to her feet, ginger in her movements, and walked over to Moonsong to hug her. That was good. Coiffure was good. Naturally kind, heroic, and cool. Moonsong had her shitty side, but he didn't want her to suffer. He especially didn't want her to suffer alone. Nobody deserved that. Byron. Tribute, Figurehead said, interrupting Tristan's thought. Call the bosses. Call everyone. Everyone. Something in that word crystallized the horror in Tristan. He shivered involuntarily. Everyone. The team, the staff, students and teachers, other teams. Hell, there was the girl at the pasta bar just down the street from Reach's headquarters who was clench for by, bringing her A-game for flirting. She'd been visibly devastated when they'd come in with Brianna. Byron hadn't noticed that she'd taken their drinks but hadn't been around the rest of the night. Teenager stuff, in the best and worst way. Tristan would have brought attention to it, but what good would it have done? Byron would have accused him of being underhanded and trying to undermine the relationship with Brianna. What would the pasta bar girl think now? What would she say? What would anyone say? Family. The thought made Tristan go cold. Breathe, Figurehead said. Okay? We've got you. Tristan nodded. Their cousins. Their aunts and uncles. The old ladies at the church. Everyone was so many people. Deep breath, Capricorn, Figurehead said. You didn't actually breathe when I told you to, you just nodded at me. Tristan drew in a deep breath. They would ask. Everyone would ask. The thought had crystallized and he was getting his head around the shape and the scale of it. They're coming, Tribute said, a phone still held to his ear. Mr. Vaughn and the rest of the staff, they want to know if we need emergency services. Coiffure? Figurehead asked. Coiffure shook her head. Coiffure shook her head. Her hair was still limp, trailing on the ground. No, then. Nothing. Figurehead started. There is nothing we can do. There was a commotion. His first thought was Moonsong. It wasn't. Furcate. Furcate. Clawed costume shoes with metal decorations scuffed against the road top. Furcate bodily collided with Tristan. Their arms wrapped around him in a hug. Again, as it had with Figurehead's half hug of support, the armor prevented Tristan from feeling the body contact. Furcate moved their mask, pulling at it so it sat sideways. The side of their head pressed against Tristan's. I'm so sorry, Furcate whispered. 
The words shook him. Everything seemed to. Me too. He murmured the words. They were honest ones. He would have to explain to everyone. He would need... Explanations. Expressions. Tones of voice. He couldn't act. Acting could be seen through. He knew that. It required something else. Tapping into real feelings and letting them show, as he had before. Bearing his soul when he wasn't sure he could bear to. He was lost in thought, and he didn't even realize that Furcate was stroking his head until they stopped. Cars were pulling up, navigating the potholes and other damage from Paris's bombardment. Mr. Vaughan had a driver, which he normally reserved for events and for emergencies. It let him get in the car immediately, getting ready in the back while the driver focused on the road. A touch of makeup, a change into nicer clothes, and preliminary phone calls. Oh, this probably counted as an emergency. Tristan accepted a hand in getting to his feet. He had the support of most of the team, Moonsong accepted, but Quafia was looking after her, and she needed looking after. He'd never, even after his trigger event, ever felt any emotion quite so terrible as what twisted in his midsection. Do you want me to handle it? Figurehead asked. Tristan shook his head. No. You're sure? I'm sure, Tristan said. The words felt overly mechanical in his mouth, at odds with what he was feeling inside. He had to insist because he couldn't imagine coming to terms with any crisis by letting others handle it. Head on. He had to take on the issue starting with the man at the top. If he could sway Mr. Vaughan, then others would follow. The issue was with swaying Mr. Vaughan. The guy wasn't stupid. Something happened to Byron? Mr. Vaughan asked. Are you okay, Tristan? I'm not hurt, Tristan reported. You didn't tell him? Figurehead asked. The question disoriented Tristan until he realized it was aimed at tribute. Tribute explained it, Mr. Vaughan said. I wanted to hear it from you all. He looked so grave, so serious. Which wasn't to say Tristan wasn't also. He'd always related to Mr. Vaughan. Tristan had even imagined that if Byron hadn't fucking strangled him and they hadn't gotten powers, he might have ended up in a similar position, doing similar work. Sir, Tristan started. No need for anything fancy, Capricorn, Mr. Vaughan said. Tell me what happened, if you can. A conspiracy to start. They weren't even explicitly supposed to be here. He had raised the subject of going after Paris again with Mr. Vaughan, and he had been given unofficial, deniable permission. We were scouting areas where we knew Paris might turn up. From our research we knew some of his patterns, Tristan said, his voice still mechanical, hollow. It was strict recon. His reconnaissance got us before ours got him. A conspiracy. Mr. Vaughan knew part of it was a lie, but he wouldn't press. Reach would get in trouble with the likes of Youth Guard if it sanctioned minors going after professional killers, as much as it wanted the credit for arrests. The rest of the team knew that part or all of it was a lie, but they didn't want to get in trouble with Mr. Vaughan or Reach. Both sides would want to keep this quiet for selfish reasons. Both sides would want to go to Tristan if they needed to keep the story straight, which would let him control the story. Byron got killed, Furcate said. It was Paris that did this? Later into the fight, he started hitting a lot harder. He had a trick, shooting giant nails like cannon blasts. Byron and I were in sync for a lot of the fight, and then we weren't. I don't know if he got disoriented, but he stayed a second too long. I can't change. Don't you dare blame him, Moonsong was heated. Calm down, it's okay, Coiffure shushed. I blame... Tristan started. His voice quavered, and he had to steel himself. I blame myself. I should have pushed to run. You utter asshole, Moonsong said. Come on, Song. Coiffure said, let's, 
We won't say anything we regret. Moonsong shook her head. Capricorn, Mr. Vaughan said. He put hands on either of Tristan's pauldrons, the elaborate ram's head armor panels at Tristan's shoulders. A light shake communicated the touch through the armor. Why don't you get in my car? We'll talk privately there. Dr. Wall is waiting at the office. I've called your parents, and they're on their way. And Paris? Steamwheel asked. Paris, Mr. Vaughan said, and his voice hardened. We'll call the PRT. We'll let other teams know, too. He crossed a line. Intentionally? Tristan hesitated. Paris. Paris had been in the back of his mind as he'd made the decision. He'd known Paris would come up, and the community's way of dealing with Paris would change. Thinking about it rationally, though? He thought of Nate, miserable and vulnerable in the hospital room. Of Furcate getting hurt. Of the innumerable people who Paris might have interacted with in his day-to-day. -day, the little acts of hate. Intentional. Tristan lied. Mr. Vaughan nodded, his expression grim. None of the usual professional warmth was visible. We'll talk things over in the car, Capricorn. I'll walk you through everything. Everyone else, there are cars if you want to ride. It may be best, in case he comes back this way. All team activities, missions, and events are cancelled until further notice. We'll pull in the adult capes that we have on the roam and on commission. The effects kept on rippling out. Tristan listened for a second more, realized he wasn't really registering what was being said, and climbed into the car, closing the door behind him. Present. The car door opened. Two people got out. Maya Wynne and her assistant. The rain still fell. Tristan wished he had Byron's cold immunity, because he was starting to feel it. He had talked to the only person in charge of the prison who hadn't been compromised, and he had talked to the hero groups. Nothing set in stone. They were uncertain, and they wanted to talk among themselves. There was always a chance that things could go awry if the wrong voice was forceful enough at a time others were uncertain. Some would be waiting to see how this went. Jean Wynn. Citrine. Victoria's voice was quiet. And the number man, Sveta added. Cauldron. Tristan blinked. That was a name he hadn't heard in a long time. I've heard that name. The number man, I mean. Supervillain banker, Sveta murmured. He bankrolled almost half of the villainous groups on Earth Bet, serving a secondary role as a broker, protector, and distributor of funds, launderer. He was an assassin, acting as one arm of the bogeyman of the Cape World group. The Irregulars were keeping track of him for a while. Tristan looked at the assistant more closely. Not quite nerdy enough to be nerd chic, the man had a nice belt buckle, wore a pea coat and narrow slacks, with a muted plaid shirt beneath the coat, strong chin with a cleft, boring hair. No, not nerd chic but he wore clothes that fit him damn near perfectly, helped by the athletic body beneath the clothes. When most guys didn't wear clothes that fit them, even fairly nondescript clothes worn well could draw the eye. Tristan had always had a thing for dorky guys with shells that he could then crack open. And then there was Wynne. Citrine. Her clothes were nicer than Kurt's the kind that wasn't available on Gimmel unless people were willing to pay a premium for otherwise premium clothes from elsewhere. There were different tiers of premium, too. Stuff like a rash guard or a nice pair of pants were expensive enough that they needed three to five days of construction work to pay for them. For a nice sheer top with a pattern on it and what looked like gold leaf? Admitting that he knew next to nothing about women's clothing, he felt like it was a special case where barter was necessary because Earth Gimmel's currency was still in uncertain territories. Tristan tried to remain still and calm as he recalled all the little details. Tattletale had dished on these guys, and so had Barcode. Victoria had talked about Citrine before, and the number man, well, he was a myth. 
That is one way to tie up a loose end, Citrine noted, her attention on the body that had yet to be touched. Tying up this loose end may have created a hundred more, Tristan said. As is always the case, Citrine said. She extended a hand. You would be Capricorn? He pulled off his gauntlet and shook her hand firmly. Yes, pleased to meet you. I'm Mayor Jean Wynne. Good solid handshake there, Capricorn. Ah, you too. Thank you. I was raised by someone who would break a bone in my hand if my handshake was anything except perfect. I'm sorry? He was the best thing for me at the time, she said. Sometimes we need a bit of decisive, pointed violence. Her hand indicated Goddess's corpse. A pair of black birds flew down to feast, maybe ravens. They were large enough. An officer waved it off. The awkward share had been a lead-in to bringing up that topic. There was something callous about that. Jesus. She wasn't even pretending not to be a villain. Antares, Citrine said, greeting the group. Rain of Fire, Swan Song, Ashley Stillens, Lookout, Natalie Madison, and of course, Tress, Sveta Karelia. I hope you don't mind, the number man said. I took the liberty of looking up your information. I remember the fact we didn't know it was a point of contention last time. It wasn't a question of courtesy, Sveta said. I didn't want you to look it up. I wanted you to know it. Then I'm sorry, he said. I don't think you're capable of feeling anything, let alone remorse. You don't do what you've done if you have any remorse. Not often, the number man said. Remorse is a funny thing. The mark it promises to leave can so easily be drowned out by the need we feel in the moment. I think there's an element of choice in that, Victoria said. Pretending there's no choice and that it's a force of nature sounds dangerously close to a justification. If the strength of our needs justified anything, there wouldn't be any remorse. If we were all capable of accurate self-assessment. If. Sveta spoke up again, audible through the reinforced ball that contained her. I can't escape the idea that if you were capable of accurate self-assessment, Kurt, you would have offed yourself politely years ago. Is that a threat? Opinion. I don't think I'm capable of assessing you and coming to any fair judgment. I'm biased. You know, on account of how you turned me into a monster. Tristan met Jean Wynne's eyes. What are you here for? he asked her. Answers. I don't get the impression you'd buy any bullshit or white lies, Tristan said. You would have to be very good lying. If I think you're trying to pull one over on me, then I'm going to walk away and I'll get my information elsewhere. If we're honest and upfront, then that should count for something, Tristan said. Something beyond what we deserve for being experimented on, got to give Sveta and Weld a nod here, and for being the ones to stick our necks out on this. Too many people held back. You, the Wardens, Tattletail. You were scared. Not in the way you think. You want to make demands? We want many of the same things you do, he said. He let some latent frustration seep into his voice. And I swear if you take us for granted, we'll leave right now. If you don't think we will, you should be the one to walk away. Because you did pledge to do it if I lied to your face. Citrine looked at the number man, then back to Tristan. What do you want? Cauldron studied powers. I want everything possible that you have on case 53s and on case 70s. If you have any clever ideas on undoing the damage reserved for your high-end clients, you provide it. That got him a few surprised looks from his team. Antares folded her arms, eyebrows raised. Sveta was looking up at him. All right, Citrine said. All right what? Power research documentation from several governments. You may need translators. Our own field notes... There's no reason to keep them in our back pocket. PRT power testing notes from all known case 53s and 70s. Can... Victoria started. She looked at Tristan. Go ahead, he said, shrugging. Can we get all PRT files? Victoria asked. 
My collection has massive holes in it, and I know the wardens feel the loss. Aren't you greedy? Citrine said. I can provide the means, not the ends. That's fine, as long as I know they're out there somewhere. They are. I'll point you to a server and give you the tools to access it. Distribute the information as you see fit. In terms of mutual goals, we need backup from the city, Tristan said. I know it's politically inconvenient, but we're catching the worst on it on every front. The public, resources, information, lack of connection to people in power, the danger and the chaos. We're already making plans to elevate the other teams. The Wardens haven't been in a position to be a public face or a middleman since the portal disaster. We can provide information when we provide it to the other teams. We'll encourage the law enforcement and parahuman patrols to cooperate with you, insofar as the mayor can do that. Will that be all? She asked that last question like she was hinting that her patience was wearing thin. So long as you don't throw us under the bus, Tristan said. Yeah. Fill me in. I've massaged things with the assistant warden. I explained the sequence of events, and he was reassured by Forsyth's counsel at the scariest moments in the night. He's on our side, except for the sheer number of prisoners they just lost. He's scared. He needs reassurance. He just lost his job, Victoria said. He's worried he's going to be painted as the villain or made out to be the scapegoat. Understood. We caught wind of the plot when we traced Cheat's people and they turned out to be teachers. He was responsible for the attack on the portals and for the attack on this prison. It didn't feel like he went all out, even if he did it smart. He wanted the prison sealed off so he could collect everyone within, and we think he wanted Goddess with them. She slipped the trap. The collection process is using Mama Mathers and scapegoat, Rain volunteered. We know that much. He's made several oblique attacks on key capes. If he's using the portals, I have a way to mess with him. I could make devices, Lookout said. It could help. Keeping certain individuals out of his reach, for one thing. Thank you. You're... No, Tristan interrupted Lookout. Not for free. If you're trying to look better in front of your team by driving a hard bargain, you should know that there are limits, Capricorn. I'm not driving a hard bargain or trying to look better, Tristan said, his voice rising. We drove. We looked good. We put on a damn good performance out there, all considered. We talked it over as a team, Victoria said. We agreed we're willing to cooperate with you. So far, we're only asking for information and cooperation. You talked about that when you appeared on television. Things are coming apart at the seams. We've got something resembling a needle. You've got thread. Can we please cooperate? Victoria asked. Even Sveta agreed it was necessary. Citrine drew in a breath. I'll help so long as it doesn't hurt elsewhere. We're interested in the devices that could block off teachers' portals. What do you want? A pony? Lookout asked. Tristan felt a twinge of alarm. Kenzie being happy and laughing was all well and good, and even a joke wasn't out of place, but it seemed uncharacteristically young for Lookout, and when he paired that with decrypted betrayal, he'd have to talk to Victoria, Sveta, Rain, and Swansong later. Lookout laughed a little. No, sorry, I'm kidding. Um, funds, Swansong suggested, as serious as Lookout was being silly. Materials. You have a person named the number man, Tristan added. Funds. Easy enough, Citrine said. But the pony comment is a good opportunity for me to gracefully segue. Oh no, Lookout said. Did I do something? Again, just slightly off. He didn't consider himself a Kenzie whisperer like Ashley and Victoria seemed to be, but he wanted to talk it over with them. On the topic of things little girls dream of, not a pony, but a unicorn. Monocaris, Victoria said. You know her. We're interested. We'll barter if need be. She's a monster, Victoria said. We can keep a leash on her. A lot of people seem to think that, Sveta said. Goddess did. Teacher might have. We're confident. And we're sorry, Tristan said. 
He shrugged, and then he lied. We had to put a permanent end to her. Mona Keris was still in the hole. The last they'd seen, as they'd collected Kingdom Come and Blindside, Mona Keris had been trying to stack things high enough to reach the lip. When they'd left the prison dimension, Lookout had confirmed everyone was out, rekeyed the exit portal behind them. The lie threatened to end the bargaining, to make Citrine walk away, to cost them the notes, the PRT files, the funds. Noted, Citrine said. If she'd noticed the lie, Tristan was fairly confident she would have had to read another member of the team to see it. She gave no indication. One less loose end to deal with. Let's talk sequence of events, Citrine said. Tell me what happened. What happened and what we told the warden differed, Tristan said. We thought it best to paint a picture that the mass control was briefer and more fragile than it was. It will sit better with the public. Breakthrough, by our narrative, was captured later and broke free more decisively. My narrative. Is that a problem? Victoria asked. No, Citrine said. Walk me through it. Victoria handled the talking, focused on a task in a way that helped to pull her out of the mire, even as her body language was nervous and defensive. Tristan looked over at Goddess. More scavenger birds were clustering close to the body. It looked like the medical examiner was at least preparing to collect it now. Byron had compared Goddess to him earlier. It wasn't wrong. Her fatal flaw wasn't so different from his own. Like a vehicle with no ability to reverse course. The only difference is that I was given a chance to turn around. You turned around just in time to get disemboweled. Day 2. This would get easier, right? Couldn't he harden his heart? Mama sobbed. Both of her hands clutched his right hand, gripping it tight enough that it might have done damage if he hadn't had that tiny boost of power. He could hear the pain, and he felt like it was killing him. We should go, Anita. We'll be at the hotel. We'll see him tomorrow morning. Come, Tristan, Mama said. Come to the hotel. There's a cot. Tristan didn't know what to say to that. Papa was the saviour. He has had his fill of us, Anita. He's grown used to his independence and he needs his own space and privacy to grieve. And I want my space to grieve with you and nobody else. Mama released Tristan's hand and pulled him into a hug. The gesture made his own tears fall free just when he thought he'd run out. Eat. Drink. Meet with your friends. We will meet in the morning and talk about the funeral. Tristan's breath caught in his throat as he opened his mouth to respond. He saw something similar in his mother's face. Papa cupped the side of Tristan's face in one hand. Mr. Vaughan offered to handle things, Tristan said. We will do this as a family, Papa said. His gaze lingered a moment too long, too hard. That in itself almost took the air out of Tristan's lungs. He swallowed hard. Does he suspect? Tomorrow morning, Tristan said. He dreaded it already. He stood in the doorway to his room as he watched his parents walk away, raising a hand in a small wave every time they looked back his way. Two days. Two days and not one minute to himself. Himself. Independence. He knew why. They were concerned about him. About what he might do while he grieved. He shut the door. From the moment the door closed, it took about ten or fifteen minutes for him to pull himself together. Byron, he whispered. I had to. For Byron, it could easily be the first moment that he knew for sure that this was Tristan's doing, and not a mistake or a glitch with the power. Tristan crossed the room. On the bulletin board, amid notes from Tristan to Byron and Byron to Tristan, there were pictures. He pulled one free, not removing the tack first. A bit of the picture tore. It was a small photo, smaller than standard. 
a young Byron was standing with a clear pout on his face, arms folded. He'd dyed his hair green, and standing beside him was a younger Tristan, hair a bright red. Where Byron had been pouting, young Tristan was grinning wide, posing by flexing his arms, tiny muscles standing out. There'd been eleven. Byron had dyed his hair and Tristan had followed suit, and he'd done a better job with the bleach job prior to applying the dye. Byron had not been impressed with Tristan. I had to, Tristan said, to the photo and to his silent company. We were both... We were going to pieces. I was miserable, losing weight. I know you noticed I couldn't sleep. He wanted to hit something and keep hitting it until he couldn't move anymore, but he was so tired he couldn't bring himself to move. He wanted to party, and yet at the same time he couldn't imagine spending more time around people. More time around people while being completely, utterly alone. Completely and utterly by his own doing. And you, he continued to whisper, out of a concern for bugs because he wasn't willing to rule anything out, not when the stakes were this high. The self-harm by the repeated escalating self-harm, starting with the pen? I'll assume that was self-harm and not you trying to hurt me, but it was scary, by. One of us was going to lose it eventually, do something stupid. The way you were going, I wasn't sure you were going to last the rest of the year. No rebuttal. Only the exaggerated pout, skinny arms folded. Out of a desire for words, for anything... He turned the photo over, hoping for a caption or note. Nothing. I was thinking about it. I was thinking that maybe you were thinking about it. As you got close to Moonsong, I couldn't help but worry that you were thinking more and more about the future. What you would have to do to have that future you wanted. House, white picket fence, dog, wife, and kids with a really high chance of getting manipulative bitch genes? He paused. Sorry, he amended his statement. But I was thinking it, and our thoughts are all we really have to ourselves. I don't know what you were thinking, but you were getting more and more controlling. You were strategically taking out things I value. It's hard to convince myself there's not an end game, and that we're not in a Cold War race to see who can find a plausible way out first. He pulled off his shirt pausing halfway to dab at his eyes with the fabric. He pulled it off the rest of the way, balled it up and threw it into the hamper. Nothing but net. There was no joy in that small thing. Only an oppressive feeling, crushing down on his chest. I saw Furcate kill their other self during the first Paris fight. It put the seed in my head. I tried to shake it, but I couldn't. By the second fight, I wasn't planning anything. I thought about what the scenario might look like. I might have helped it along subconsciously. Then, in the middle of everything, I saw things line up. Nobody had visibility. Paris was probably the best person to take the fall because he's scum. Please understand. It was an impulse. It was maybe my one and only chance ever. A massive choice, my existence on the line. He smoothed out a wrinkle in the photo. I can't take it back, he said. Because if you weren't thinking about how to take 100% control before, you have to be doing it now. It was about survival for me, and I've made it about survival for you, doing this. The things common to the both of them ran down the middle. The picture he held was among those things. He touched papers on Byron's side, as if he could find a line that matched up with what he wanted and needed to hear. The silence weighed on him, condemning. No response from the photo. He felt an irrational kind of anger at that. Slowly and methodically, Motions out of tune with the flare of anger, he began removing tacks. 
Byron's reminder about an IOU for a movie choice on movie night fluttered to the table. Tristan's hand struck it hard, the impact loud, pinning it down. Both the violence of the motion and the noise had surprised even him. He resumed work. One by one, he removed the notes from Byron's side. If it's down to one of us surviving, I've got to side with me. Day 24 You're really up for this, Capricorn? Coiffure asked. I need this, Tristan said. All right, she said. She smiled. She was wearing her training costume, the same general shape but without the bells, whistles and decorations, what Steamwheel called tinsel, the zigzags of metal that stood out on the bodysuits. Tristan didn't have a bodysuit. His armour was all metal, all decorated. He strapped his armour on, setting everything in place in its proper order. There was a ritual to it, and he liked the ritual. There were days that were rituals, each meal a single step in a larger pattern with a long-term purpose, each point of hygiene, the phone calls to the parents on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Others came in, finding their seats at the end of the room opposite the door. Most had snacks from the vending machine. Steamwheel, figurehead, tribute, furcate. Sparring, figurehead said. Figuring out where my head is at. The fans are starting to ask where Capricorn is. I've been wondering that myself, Moonsong said. Tristan's heart skipped a beat. You took on a role as team leader. We got used to you in that role, Moonsong said. She was keeping Coiffure's kid brother company, the two of them eating the same candy. She paused beside Tristan as she crossed the room, reaching out to lay a hand on his arm. Her smile was an encouraging one. Let's get you back on your feet. Tristan nodded. Moonsong headed over to the benches. Coiffure's little brother sat between Moonsong and Furcate. Slow motion to open? Speed up? Coiffure asked. Sure, Tristan said, smiling before he pulled his helmet on. Crimson motes. Crimson motes. They appeared freely and after his expectations that he would be badly out of practice, the ease with which they moved caught him off guard. Coiffure produced a hair whip, freeing a flail chain and spiked head from her silver mane. The chain was lengthy and the hair itself long enough and strong enough to produce a lazy whipping motion. Tristan ducked beneath, though it was swung so high it would have barely grazed his helmet. The little brother cheered for blood, probably the most enthusiasm for cape stuff that Tristan had seen out of him. It was typical for the team to warm up with a back and forth, speeding up as they went. Because it was a back and forth, it was his turn. He materialised his rock, aware that there was no other form to swap to. Wherever he placed it, that was where it would be. Coiffure's hair flail slammed noisily against floorboards as hair went limp. The sound echoed through the empty arena. Spikes. Jagged, like pyramid-shaped triangles drawn out long, some connected as one triangle after another to form the angular breaks where the lines had drawn curves. Some were connected in chains of three and four, all black, with crimson material visible through gaps where one connected to another or wetted the spikes to a surface. That might be harder to sell to the design team, Coiffure said. Tristan couldn't respond his throat tight. Of course it changed. Holy shit, Tribute said. He hopped down from his seat, approaching one near him. Tristan felt it. Trib, back! Tribute reacted, stepping back. Moonsong used her power, and Tribute's backward step became a bound. The chain of spikes moved, the red bonds acting like muscle, the black spikes rigid, spearing, stabbing, and scraping at floorboard. All through the arena, the spikes moved, scratching, reaching, stabbing in the direction of people they couldn't reach. Coiffure destroyed one, swinging out with her flail. The one she hit on the backward swing survived the hit, then stabbed down, pinning the chain to the floor. 
It yanked, pulling Coiffure closer to another spike. Tristan kicked it. With the damage that was already done, a firm kick with a metal boot destroyed the spike, breaking it away from the ground. He did what he could, but it was really the team that stepped up. Tribute gave strength, Steamwheeler had a gauntlet in her backpack, and Figurehead scanned with his first impressions figuring before wading into the fray. Tristan fled the room. Down the hall, past the staff officers, into his own room. He gasped for breath and he couldn't find it. He'd practiced techniques, but this... this was something beyond. For just an instant, he'd been left to wonder if the intelligence behind those things was by, somewhere in there, gone mad enough he'd hurt his old friends. Tristan looked across the room, trying to keep his breathing straight. All of Byron's things were packed away into a single box, slid into a corner. Moonsong had taken some, on a night she'd visited to chat and reminisce. A gasp of a laugh escaped. There were moments they were almost friends. There was a knock at the door. Tristan looked up, and he saw Kay mask off. It changed based on our relationship to each other, Tristan said. I did... I did something. No. That was your power, and powers can be cruel. I... It's my fault. No. Sometimes the powers do this. Sometimes I don't get any good furcates for weeks on end. It's not... Tristan started. What was he supposed to say? Any words he uttered, any proof he gave, it would be as good as sealing his own fate, and it would devastate Kay. Could he hurt them that badly? Irrationally, he knew the right thing to do, but with the small sorts of pain he would inflict so clear in front of his face, looking at him with worry, he couldn't bring himself to say it any more clearly. Kay unwrapped a candy. Open. He opened his mouth. He made a face as he tasted it. Lemon, I thought we got you onto something else. We all need something to fall back to, Kay said, when we lose track of ourselves. If we run into a tie and we're supposed to decide among ourselves, we have a fourth number we track. Physical health, mental health, girlness, and the tiebreaker. The candy. Reminds me of the woman who raised me. Kay said, sucking on the candy. If I ever don't feel like it, or I don't feel reminded of those days, I'm not me. I don't have anything like that. Not Nate? Not... no. I like him, but... But I killed the person I was supposed to fall back to. Day 57. He panted for breath. In all of the fantasies, he hadn't ever imagined it being quite this sweaty. He didn't even have his breath before Nate was kissing him again, pushing him down against the bed. His hand ran through the thin line of Nate's chest hair. Nate smelled so good. No products really dominated. There wasn't a heavy sweat smell. It was just Nate. Tristan broke the kiss, panting for breath again. Nate leaned in to kiss him again, and Tristan had to pull his head back. I'm out of breath. Give me a second. What got into you? I missed you. Nate's fingers stroked Tristan's hair. Those words made Tristan choke up just a bit, which didn't help with the fact that he'd barely had a chance to breathe. Nate bit his lip, then reached down for the button of Tristan's jeans. A reversal of months ago. Tristan helped with the removal of the jeans. He kicked them off. The moment was very still. He felt Nate's hand. Nate leaned in close, kissing him. The hand moved to Tristan's neck instead. Sorry, Tristan said, as the kiss broke. No pressure. I can't. No worries, Nate said. It's been a hard, a tough few months. It doesn't feel right, I think. That's why... Shh. What would feel right? It sounds lame, but can we just hold each other? Any time, Nate whispered, stroking Tristan's hair. 
always. Day 60 Tristan knocked. Tristan, come in, please, sit. Tristan obeyed, entering Dr. Wall's office, shutting the door firmly behind him, then seating himself on the couch. Such a cliché that there was an actual couch. I know we didn't make an appointment. My door is always open, provided I'm not already talking to someone. Tristan nodded. The fingers on his right hand trembled. He seized them with the fingers of his left, and the nervousness seemed to multiply. His two clasped hands trembled together. He unclasped them, and he smoothed down the lap of his pants before gripping his knees. What's on your mind, Tristan? Everything, Tristan said. Well, that will only take about ten billion years to the twelfth power to get through. Do you have the secret of immortality, or do you want to narrow it down some? It was said in a joking tone, but Tristan didn't feel much like laughing. I did it, Tristan said. He looked at the therapist. What? I killed my brother. Dr. Wall nodded. Maybe you misheard me. I said... I heard what you said. I've been expecting this visit for a while. Tristan shivered, whole body. Survivor's guilt, Tristan. It plays tricks on our minds. We replay scenes over and over again, imagining things with a different emphasis, so we exaggerate details. I'm honestly shocked that it took you two months to come here and say this. I'd even say it's a mark of extreme emotional stability. Tristan laughed, incredulous. What? No. No, I'm anything but emotionally stable right now. I'm saying I killed my brother, deliberately. The smile fell from Dr. Wall's face. With it, Tristan's heart plummeted down to where his balls were. He'd expected this. Okay, Dr. Wall said. Serious talk. That's a lot of weight to be carrying on your shoulders. Tristan was silent. How long have you been wanting to come here and say this? I've been thinking about it for a month. Dr. Wall nodded. I almost told Furcate. It's probably for the best that you didn't. Yeah, Tristan said. He laughed, and it sounded fake to his own ears. Yeah, there's... there's preparations to be done beforehand. Preparations? I can't... he's in here. He's been in here for two months. I can let him out, but not before I've done something to ensure that it's not going to get switched around. With me stuck inside for forever. I need to write letters. I was thinking... Tristan, Dr. Wall said. Tristan swallowed. His head was shaking. You're a promising hero, Dr. Wall told him, his voice level and soothing. And you're clearly in a bad place. Anyone would start to fantasize after being so close to their sibling at the time of death. It's not a fantasy, Tristan said. Hands jittery, head jittery, legs jittery. He thought he might punch Dr. Wall, and he knew what a disaster that would be. He'd need cooperation to write the letters, ensure he was protected when he let Byron out. You're a promising hero with a lucrative career with Team Reach ahead of them. I can tell you that nearly every hero that I've worked with has gone through a dark period. Their minds play tricks on them. They replay memories in their heads until the footage becomes distorted, and honestly, we don't love talking about it, but powers play their role. Yours recently changed. You've been adapting, doing okay in the field with the new power. We're hoping it will change again. Tristan didn't have a response. You don't like the new power, I know. No. You're still mourning your brother's passing. Yes. No, it's not that he passed... Listen, Dr. Wall said, voice firm. Anyone in your circumstance would want a magic bullet cure to what ails them. When people aren't coping or are finding their way to coping, they construct fantasies. In yours, if this is a fantasy, you get your brother back. You have a resolution to a memory that would haunt anyone, and you can punish yourself for a situation that your unconscious is telling you is your fault. Tristan stared down at his hands. 
I can't imagine anything more tragic than getting your parents' hopes up. Getting your own hopes up. Bringing controversy to the team and your teammates, and potentially letting word get out that would give Paris an escape clause in his court proceedings for your brother's murder. Only for nothing to come of it. A trick your grief has played on your brain. Tristan shook his head. Except I could let him out now. A noise made Tristan's head turn. He was jumpy. Could you? Dr. Wall asked. What? Could you let him out right now? Could you let him out right now? Could he? He'd shied away from that part of his power for so long he worried it had atrophied. It was hard to even think about with all of the compounded dread, each day worse than the last. To think about doing it without the protection of a pre-existing deal, a promise from powerful people? Guess not, Dr. Wall said. Tristan shook his head. I can, but I need precautions first. I screwed this up so fucking badly. I got rid of him, but he takes up more of my day, my thoughts, and my routines now than when I gave him half of my time. Sit down, Tristan, the therapist said. He'd stood up, and he didn't even realize it. He stood on the spot, the mechanical instructions for sitting himself down momentary blank and blacked out. He didn't sit. If what you said were true, there isn't a binding contract we could devise that would supersede the criminal charges. We can't give you a magic contract that would protect you. You would likely see some form of punishment, including removal from the team. The team would no doubt be devastated. We both know Byron threatened to go to the media in the past when he was concerned with your behavior. He would do it in the future. Tristan shook his head, eyes on the floor. Yes? Tristan stopped shaking his head. He would. Maybe. We know he would. It's a pattern we've seen before. Yeah. There's a lot we need to talk about, and a lot of work we need to do, but we can get you to a better place, where this is well behind you. Deeply uncomfortable, Tristan started to turn away. I'm gonna... I think you should stay. I'm going to go, Tristan said. You have a bright, brilliant future ahead of you, Tristan. Talk to me, or talk to someone here at Reach before you do anything. We're on your side. You're not alone. Not alone. He'd felt so alone for so long, even the words were a comfort. He shrugged, then turned to the door. It was ajar. He'd closed it on entering, and now it was open. He shut it behind him as he stepped into the hallway, pushing to make sure it couldn't just pop open. Belatedly, he realized he hadn't said a farewell to Dr. Wall. It didn't matter. Fear stabbed him in the gut as he looked around, checking around the corner. When? When he'd shouted? He'd heard a clicking noise earlier. Who was it? What did they hear? Fear gripped his heart. If he didn't own this, if he didn't release Byron with all safeguards in place, they might condemn him. A trickle of sweat ran down the side of his face as he looked around. Nobody was in the exercise area, and why would an eavesdropper go straight there? No staff in the nearby offices. Fuck, fuck, fuck! Who? Nobody was here. It was part of why he'd gone to Dr. Wall. There was a distant noise. He jogged in its direction. Moonsong. He felt his blood run cold. The light streaked down the hallway, illuminating the colourful tiles. Hey, Moonsong said. I didn't know anyone else was around. Do you want something? She indicated the vending machine. He stared at her. Are you okay? She asked. No, he said. She offered him a sympathetic look. I don't feel okay a lot of the time either. I know we haven't always gotten along, but if you ever wanted to talk or whatever, go do something, reminisce. I'm okay with that. He shook his head, then realized how it might be taken. No thanks. Not right now. Take care of yourself, Tristan. You too, he said. 
they parted ways. She went outside. He went to his room. The television's channel zero zero was to the surveillance cameras. He found Moonsong and watched for a minute. She seemed normal. Seemed wasn't good enough. He pulled his old laptop out from beneath the bed, coated in dust and hair, and put it into his backpack. Not a reach laptop. Those might be monitored. He couldn't use the reach internet connection either. He'd go to a coffee shop or library. Insurance. He'd need insurance. Day 72. Helicopters cut through the air. Searchlights illuminated a squat industrial building. The light had a blue tinge. The building itself was terracotta. Figurehead gave the orders. We go in quiet. We move as steam wheel orders from comms. Twelve gifted kids on a special trip with their study group, one teacher, and one guy with a weapon and a whole lot of anger. Figurehead used a stick to draw in the dirt. An overhead map with the layout. He placed bits of gravel down to represent the kids and then put down a quarter. He tapped the quarter. Shooter. Why us and not the police? Tristan asked. Because when they sent a PRT hero in covertly, he blacked out. Same as what happens to anyone with powers is near anyone who gets powers. Given that the situation isn't resolved, we have to assume it was the shooter. All right, Tristan said. He looked at the others. He saw smiles and nods. It took a minute before all instructions were given. Tristan was careful. They probably talked it all over beforehand, Tristan thought. Go, go, go! Figurehead hissed the words. The entire group, Steamwheel accepted, ran down the slope and along the shadowy area where the fence-mounted lights didn't reach. They reached the fence, and Coiffure cut the fence with her hair. Figurehead likes to fall back on the playbook. When making up a crime, have the details be ones you already know. He went with the group, and then they began splitting up, fanning through the building. They asked each other if they'd talked about this one in front of me. They must have agreed that they didn't. They forgot that I've gotten drunk with most members of the team. I remember other people's drunk stories. Students on a field trip, during the day, not the evening. One person taking them and their teachers hostage. One of the kids triggered. It was a training exercise, or a trap. The trap made more sense. The moment the group had fanned out enough that Tristan wasn't inside of anyone, he took a detour. Down to the basement. Personal cell out. Backup. His insurance. The intensity of the moment made the sick feeling faint and ethereal. The trap meant they suspected. If he could just distract, maybe things could go back to normal. He had four names on his contact list. Three were local. Two fit for this situation. Basilisk. Zeds instead of Ss. And Throttle. In the dark, the glow of the screen was painfully bright. He saw the first message pop up, and then the second. He felt calmer than he'd imagined he would, as if everything going as wrong as possible meant that he had nothing to worry about. He'd already laid groundwork. The fourth name on the list was a tinker, one capable of behaviour modification with needles. He'd already planted evidence around his room, changed his schedule. If they really did suspect him because he'd been acting strangely, he could use that, create reasonable doubt. The alternative to that was losing his mama and papa. It was losing reach, furcate, figurehead, coiffure, tribute. It was losing everything. Still, he felt calm. Twenty minutes passed. Then thirty. There was no commotion. There were no gunshots or powers used. He heard people pass by and he knew they were looking for him. Come on! Another minute passed. His screen glowed. They were here. The insurance. He texted them his location in the building. They'd give him an out, an excuse, and time, all of which were things he needed. He'd get away, then he'd figure out his next steps. The sick feeling was bad enough he thought he might throw up. The costume and the armour helped more than anything. A wall between him and the rest of the world. 
Are we going out the way we came in? Basilisk asked, his voice a whisper cutting through the dark. Tristan turned. Is there a better way out? Not really. Usually people don't hire me unless they want someone to die, and going out that way will be quiet. Basilisk hissed. Basilisk was as tall as Paris, but had very broad shoulders, with elaborate decoration at his face, hands, and feet. Throttle was more unassuming, a guy with tussled hair, a helmet that looked like wood wound around a stump, gaps left for the eyes. His clothing was mundane and ragged, and he carried a rope. He would be Tristan's excuse. They're expecting me to run. They may cut us off. If that route works, it works. Just be prepared for an incident. You remember the outline? You want plausible deniability. We make it look like you're captured. Yeah. Do I kill anyone? Basilisk asked. No, Tristan said. Not unless... He imagined the tables being turned, losing his mind as Byron lived his life. Moonsong and the white picket fence, and the two kids with creepy Moonsong personalities. Not unless absolutely necessary. No, scratch that, Just let's just get out of here. I want an answer, Basilisk stated. I don't like grey areas or unclear jobs. Tristan thought for a long second. It felt wrong that Basilisk would be that insistent, but everything felt wrong nowadays. Everything felt like a trap, a statement left unfinished, hollow. It was as if he was playing a slow, careful game of chess, moving his pieces while only guessing as to the state of the other side of the board. Were they even playing? Or playing at a high level? Could he make a decisive move or confuse his opponent? What they never showed in the movies was that these games that masterminds played went with stomach-churning degrees of stress and consecutive nights without a wink of sleep. Performance faltered. All it took was one mistake. No deaths, no killing. Lead the way. I'd better make it look like I caught you, Throttle said. It also makes it easier to make a fast escape if I have my rope on you. Strangulation and fast movement, and he'd gone with Throttle. The rope and Throttle name didn't mesh, but the guy was supposedly competent. I'll do without for now. Just lead the way. I'm the one paying you to. He saw their hesitation. He ran. Crimson motes painted the area around him, providing dim illumination. Spikes like razor-tipped insect legs manifested just as he passed them. Throttle wasn't fast. Or if he was, he wasn't using his speed. Basilisk, fortunately, wasn't using his killing sight. His mercenaries had been bought out by someone else, and he knew who that someone else was. He had to get away. Boots tromped on hard floor. He didn't get tired even running in armour heavier than any medieval knight might wear, but there wasn't much he could do about the noise. Like an array of stylized drum beats, boot struck hard ground. Metal armour rose up, settled with a series of metal-on-metal sounds, rose up, settled. His heart hammered in a loose accompaniment. Until his foot came down, and he went too far up in response. Moonsong Silver strands barred his path. Coiffure. And then there were the others. An entire hallway was blocked by Steamwheel's mech. And behind him, he couldn't do anything except draw out spikes, buy himself a few more seconds of existence. Just a few seconds. Throttle reached him. The rope, now a hangman's noose, went around his neck. Through that rope, he felt a power seize him. Moats appeared, and he didn't summon them. His hand moved, and he hadn't moved it. Ah! ah. He made a sound, involuntary. Can you do it? Moonsong asked. Before Throttle could figure out how to make it happen, Tristan used his power, and he shifted out, slipping into the void within Byron. Because whatever else happened, however narrow the margin... He wanted to be able to tell himself he managed it in the end. I'm sorry it took so long, Boo. Moonsong's whisper cut through the dark, anguished. Byron's answering scream tore through the throat he and Tristan shared. Tristan's cut through nothing, limited to a dark void.
present. Tristan was patient. It was Byron's turn. Irony of ironies, Barcode hadn't brought their cape to test for brainwashing. All clear. Thank you, Byron said. He reached into a pocket. I have it. Byron swapped out. Tristan reached beneath his armor for an envelope, then handed it over. There was something of a relief in the fact that they'd established something of an income stream. The number man would fund them. They'd answer the favor with cooperation, a continued supply of information, and some of Lookout's devices. Without that income stream, this would have been harder to sustain over the long term, especially with the dropping dollar. Gonna count. Give me a minute. Sure, Tristan said. He leaned back against a wall. The barcode hitmen walked over to where the light was stronger and tore open the envelope to begin counting the contents. Bye, Tristan murmured. I was thinking about everything that happened two years ago. Been thinking about it a lot tonight. He swapped out. Mind whammies always bring up those days. Dark feelings, Byron said. Swap. Tristan, as soon as he had control, replied, I don't think you've ever given me a straight answer about why. Swap. I've given you answers, Tristan. Byron's voice was so quiet it was barely audible. Swap. Each finished statement was followed by one. Not satisfying ones. Why? Why didn't you push for harsher punishment? Why, let me go. Why not press charges? They wanted to arrest me for attempting to murder you. If it hadn't gotten snagged in the courts, interrupted by gold mourning. Your time in jail is my time in jail. I don't think you're going to do it again. Not with this. Barcode. Prevention. This was always more for your sake than for mine, Tristan. Is your punishment going to be you being frustratingly vague for the rest of the time we're stuck together? Byron shook their head. You punished yourself enough. I don't want to dwell in that time, so I'm letting it go. I forgive you, little brother. Little. Don't be that fucking cliche, by Minutes. I thought it'd get your goat. Ugh. Torture. Torture. How is it that we get along best when everything's gone most thoroughly to shit? Gold morning and we reconcile. You decide to give me this weird pseudo-forgiveness. Tonight, prison breakout, mind control, and we have a nice chat. Tristan swapped. There was a moment of thought before Byron shrugged their shoulders, then switched back. So vague, Tristan grumbled. It's not pseudo-forgiveness, Tristan. I have days when I'm angry and days I'm not dealing at all. You know I have nightmares, I freak out. But that doesn't make it pseudo. It's forgiveness, little brother. I might have hated actually going to church, but that doesn't mean I hated the lessons. I don't think it's supposed to be that easy. It's not, Trist. Let it go before I change my mind, you know? It's an ongoing work, but it's a work I do for me as much as I do it for you. So take it without arguing. Byron switched to Tristan. Tristan didn't argue. We're good, the barcode guy said. We'll see you soon, then. Unless you need something else. Tristan paused. What? The guy asked. I was thinking we might be able to do business. But I need to talk it over with my brother first. Arc 9. Gleaming. Interlude 4. The tower extended from the floor of the valley to the stratosphere, a gleaming testimony to the power of patience, persistence, and inhuman nature. Most would expect the structure to be sealed, or for the layers of overlapping metal along its exterior to be welded to one another. It wasn't the case here. The entire facility was channeling heat, 
air and atmosphere up while it channeled the lack of those things down, and the design of the facility caught the air in the same way the curvatures of an airplane's wings did. The edges of the tower seemed to glow, even because of the air that ran concurrent with the fanned-out plates that stabbed upwards, concentrating atmosphere and heat around the tower exterior, as well as its interior. High above, where the sky was transitioning from the light blue of day to the near black of night, the peak of the tower was topped with a diffuse, flower-like bloom of the lighter blue. The exhaust or output. The peak was so high as to be invisible, but the venting wasn't. As though it had been stabbed through the perimeter between sky and space, and the wound bled light blue. It roared, because the vacuum it gathered in its squat base drew in atmosphere and air. It screamed, because the very design of the facility defied physics, and the alien metals that formed the panels that caught the air or channeled ambient heat upwards were still bound by some laws of physics. Bound and tortured for their disobedience, she thought. I don't think that's going to help you. She turned towards the voice, arching one eyebrow. Sorry to break the spell. I meant your helmet, the guy said. He had a costume more sleek than most. The mask around his eyes was hard, but the back was flexible, tied in a knot at the back of the head, the two lengths of fabric loose and billowing in the strong influx of wind the tower generated. The costume was a similar mix of hard segments, flowing naturally into loose, flowing fabric, all red with gold trim. She couldn't help but see double when she looked at him, and his double was badly wounded, his costume torn. She decided she would call him the Wounded Man. She was holding her helmet in both hands. It was crafted of another alien metal, different from the tower's sweeping overlapping panels, and had elaborate wings at the sides, sleek and pointed back. She couldn't remember when she'd taken it off. And reverence? As someone would when approaching a holy place? No, she wasn't reverent. Her god was dead. She had wanted a better look at the monster that loomed before her, a beast that screamed, roared, and made the sky bleed. Glines, the switch thrower, she thought. The shadow manifested to her left, as if it was stepping in from another room, its feet still planted firmly on the ground. Young, he folded his arms, and in the shroud of his indistinct form, the line between costume and flesh were blurry. He could have been a reptile, covered in thick layers, with sleek, broad bands. Hi, the wounded man said. Glines gave him a small nod of acknowledgement, before turning his full focus to the tower. Valkyrie could have asked the shadow of a question, but she didn't. She let him study the distant tower and she turned her attention to the hero who had noted her helmet. One finger tapped the metal, producing a sharp sound. These things are more important than you would think. The wounded man smiled. No offense, Valkyrie, but I don't think that, whatever it is, is going to bop you on the head. If it does, that bit of metal won't change the outcome. The man in costume was nervous, she realized. He'd been here for at least a day. She looked back in the direction of camp, where tarps and tents were erected, positioned where they could watch the tower, still far enough away that it would take twenty or thirty minutes of driving a conventional vehicle to get close. At least a day that he'd endured the roaring, the screaming, and watched as the Earth's oxygen was slowly and steadily pumped away into oblivion, to no seeming point or goal. I don't think it's about to strike me across the head, she said. And this is still important. For other reasons. You know what it is, then? She shook her head slowly, turning attention briefly to Glines, who's still studying the thing. No, she admitted. Uh-huh. That's reassuring, the wounded man said. The helmet was heavy in her hands, and it felt even heavier as she shifted it to one hand, so that her other hand was free to adjust her hair, pushing it out of her face. It was possible that the events could have unfolded in such a way that the masks and helmets weren't necessary, but some of the first capes, including Vicar, who had worn a costume very similar to her own, had wanted to protect their identities. Somewhere along the line, 
The masks and the helmets had become synonymous with identity. With her hair sufficiently adjusted and pushed out of the way, she set the helmet down on her head. Anchor heavy. You look so calm, the wounded man said. You're not freaked. She raised a hand, holding it flat. The only tremor or movement was because of the wind, as air flooded in the direction of the vacuum-driven vortex of the vacuum at the tower's base. She was calm. No, she said. She unfurled her decorative wings and then wrapped them around herself for warmth. She stood straighter, chin raised. Her heartbeat was much as it always was. If her breathing was any different from usual, it was because the tower was stealing the air. I'm not especially worried. Some of the guys call it a space elevator. Which, you know, super cool, except it's clearly not helping us. And it has defenses to keep us out. No, Glein said. Not a space elevator. Jesus, they talk? The wounded man asked. What is it? Valkyrie asked her shadow. A gun. That's the barrel, Glein said. He extended his arm to indicate the length of the tower. What the son of a fucks would they need a gun that big for? The wounded man asked. Don't know, Glein said. But I don't think the target was important. If I were making a gun that big to deal with a specific enemy, I would have paid attention to targeting. Any attention at all. The targeting could be so large that targeting doesn't matter, Valkyrie said, if it filled half of the sky as it made its approach. Ugh, the wounded man said. That's a thing. Glines, though, was nodding. No need to worry about aim if you're aiming at the broad side of a barn. Don't know. Maybe. But if you were building a gun to shoot the side of a barn, wouldn't you want enough firepower to hurt the barn? You would. Uh, please tell me the sky-filling enemy is hypothetical. Valkyrie shook her head. It's real, but it's not an enemy we need to worry about again. When they came the last time, they left markers to ensure none of their kind wasted effort coming to the same places. To go against that procedure and habit would run contrary to their entire being. It won't happen. You said these guys are building a giant gun to shoot at things on that scale, and this is the gun. No, Klein said. I don't blame you for getting caught up in the attention-grabbing details, but we didn't say for sure that this was meant to shoot at anything. The ammo they're using isn't sufficient to hurt anything that big. The ammo is the point. What's the ammo? The wounded man asked. Explain, Valkyrie said. The air. Someone built a fucking 31-mile-long air gun? Technically, I guess. Glein said. Less technically, it shoots all of the air. Each shot is one Earth's worth of atmosphere, gathered up into a ball and superheated. The wounded man was silent, his eyes wide. One shot, and Earth, whatever this is, is emptied in about two seconds. Everything dies well before it can suffocate, with a sudden atmospheric and pressure shift. The next shot empties the adjacent Earth, probably. Earth bet, Valkyrie said. Sure. Home, huh? The shadow asked. Valkyrie nodded. Then the next closest Earth, or a share of all connected Earths. Enough to do widespread damage. The wounded man sat down heavily on the grassless hillside. You said the ammunition was the point. The best analogy I can think of is the idea we had of putting all the garbage on a rocket and shooting it into space, so we don't have to have landfills. This guy is shooting in the same way. Disposing of atmospheres, Valkyrie said the thought aloud. That helps. Thank you. No problem. It's really all I've got. Oh, and if you're going up, you want to go up through the tower, not outside of it. Most defense is aimed at protecting against external attack. Thank you. She dismissed the shadow with thought. Do you need anything? She thought, pushing the thought into the space where the shadows lived. No, came the distant reply. 
I'll get to you soon. I don't mind. I was never very good at asking authorities for help. I got patient. Why? The wounded man asked. I intend to find out. Will you walk with me? The wounded man nodded, falling into step beside her. Behind them, the tower continued to bleed out atmosphere, screaming the cry of a hundred thousand metal panels straining to their limits, roaring with the rush of wind and internal tinker technology. He was the first to say anything. We've got sixteen parahumans and twenty non-parahuman staff at the camp here. Nerves are shot, morale is nil. Nine of them got seriously injured trying to investigate. I need to know what to tell them. Telling them that a team of tinkers or whoever are aiming to shoot all of Earth's air into space isn't going to fly. Tell them nothing except that their job is done. My team will handle it. If I can't resolve this, there won't be anything your coalition can do. Eat the good food you are rationing out. Drink. The more you consume, the less you will need to take back. The wounded man nodded, but he looked worried. He hurried forward to get the gate and hold it open for her. The main tent was a gathering place and a dining hall both. People were gathered out in front and at tables within. Out front was fine, with only a few oddities, like a handful of people in costumes standing up as she approached. Within the mess of the tent was a different story. The tension in the room was palpable. The capes on duty took up three quarters of the tent, sitting at the tables or standing nearby. Cards and some of the food were scattered across the surfaces. There wasn't a buzz of conversation, and there was a noticeable gap between the people at the three tables and the denizens of the last table, furthest from the tent's openings. Silent stares accompanied her on her way to the far table, aimed at her from both sides. The people at the far table were hers. Not hostile, but not necessarily talkers either. They were uniforms with a fair degree of cohesiveness running through them, but they were more united by the masks they wore. A woman with striking tattoos around the eyes, in black, red, and yellow, the colors too solid and bright for an actual tattoo. She had been one of the heroes that had come after Valkyrie, back when Valkyrie had been Glass de Gouinier. Glass de Gouinier had broken the woman until she was only barely on the cusp of life and then pulled the woman's soul from her body. A skinny man with no hair on his skeletally gaunt head. She remembered him having hair when she had watched him die. A goon in the birdcage who had made a mutinous bid for power and lost. He had been turned away by each cell black leader in turn before venturing into the depths of the birdcage, where prisoners too dangerous for a cell block had been put. He hadn't survived his first run-in. A handsome man had a mark on his face, akin to vitiligo, but not quite the albino white that came with vitiligo. A loose representation of a skull, drawn on his face in a lighter brown. There were others, some had more extreme touches than others, a consequence of how information was stored. Longer-term storage reduced things down more, put information such as what people wore on their skin into the same categories as the skin itself, and there was no storage longer term than death. Cleo, Neje Haje, Voltrage, Third Execution, Edgeless, Forward Facing. The capes in question stood. Cleo's eyes glistened with opaque teal-green moisture, the fluids leaking out and weeping regularly the brilliant color a striking contrast against her olive-brown skin. Where she dabbed with the corner of her sleeve and napkins, the fabric was bleached or eaten away entirely. She wore extra layers, including a scarf to keep her hair out of her face, a shirt, sweatshirt, and jacket, possibly just to have the extra fabric, and possibly because she had other physiological issues. The sad fact was that they weren't Valkyries. She didn't know them, beyond what she'd seen the last time she'd had them. She couldn't know their needs. Voltrage was a recent piece of work, pale, with paler and drier hair than he'd had in his first life, 
a perpetually angry expression marked with arched brows and a pointed beard. He was skinny, his shoulders especially bony, collarbone sticking out a bit more than was natural. He'd ripped his sleeves off the sweatshirt he'd been given, but had later donned a white long sleeve shirt. Edgeless was older, unfortunately bearing more of a mask than a face, a consequence of a lack of personality in life, which was why she'd made him one of the first she experimented with. Dull in many senses of the word, he was big, bearing a combination of muscle and fat, and he obeyed orders. What about the rest of us? Milk asked. She was the heroine with the too bright to be tattoo marks on her face. Stay. Do you need anything? You've been fed? You're entertained? We are telling each other stories for entertainment, Milk said. Valkyrie looked at the other tables. There were cards there. Not at this table. To ask or demand would be a power play. She wasn't interested in that. Waggish, twelfth of the fabricators. The shadow appeared, short with thirty blemished-covered skin everywhere but his face, where he'd once worn a mask. The face was frozen in a serene smile, blemish-free. Waggish had to hop up onto the bench to reach the things on the table. He snatched up a piece of trash, then reached for another. Some people nearby began sliding him things. With two hands that were disproportionately large for his small frame, Waggish pressed the collected debris in between his hands. There was an acrid, burning smell as it reconsolidated. She could see the power work in the movements in the air. Waggish set two decks of cards down on the table, holding one up for her to see. Custom card faces, the upper left and bottom right of each card featuring a minimalist illustration of someone from around the table. If we don't return in three hours, assume we're dead or trapped. Use thinkers if you can. Verify our status. The mount a rescue or leave. As you see fit. Understood, Milk said. She had already picked up one of the two decks, fanning it out so people could see. She plucked one free and held it out. Milk's own. Thank you for the cards, Valkyrie. And can you tell what's-his-name thank you for not going the cliché route and making me a hearts card? He heard, Valkyrie said. She glanced at the three she had picked out, then started toward the door. They fell in step behind her. Nobody else in the mess tent spoke, except for the idle chatter from the table she had just supplied with the cards, discussing rules and bets. The only noises were the buzz of the lightning that had been rigged up at the top of the tent, the flap of the wind against the taunt tent fabric, and the distant screeching and roaring of the colossal gun barrel. Cleo, stay safe. Voltrage, Edgeless, clear the way once we're inside. There are traps. Tinker? Voltrage asked. Tinker, at the very least. Her phone buzzed at the sight of her utility belt, where pouches and pockets were hidden by the armor that covered her upper body. Dial back. The specter appeared. My phone, she said. The wardens, Dialback said. They said their thinkers read the situation here as critical and want to know if there's any news. What they want is good news. Let them know I'm busy and that we'll contact them shortly with that good news. They've complained in the past about my use of power to communicate. It reads as slightly corrupted and trips flags. Then ignore them, she said. She waited for the rebuttal, then dismissed the shadow. Mushroom, lead letter, esclavage, nalian. The four shadows appeared in a half circle behind her. Cleo, trailing behind, found herself right between lead letter and esclavage. The burly mushroom exhaled a dot of light, which flew forward. It traveled the quarter mile to the base of the tower, hit the closest thing the base of the tower had to a door, and blew it wide open. Valkyrie could feel the rush of wind from the blast. Lead letter opened fire, drawing her guns, shooting the fragments of the door in the frame that still hung on, to exaggerated effect. Esclavage couldn't act until they were closer. The leather-bound villainess produced bands of metal from her wrists. 
each studded with spikes. She wrapped the bands around pieces of rubble, then flung them to one side. Turrets began to spring out of the side of the tower, while drones began to emerge from the hole in the front. Some of the drones set to repairing, while others advanced. Weapons leveled at the group. There was laser fire. She had a functional team working in concert. Voltrage's electromagnetics caught the incoming fire, redistributing energy and stopping bullets. Edgela simply tanked the shots, while providing some loose cover for Valkyrie and Cleo with his power. What am I doing? Cleo asked. She tensed as weapon fire struck the dirt a foot and a half to her right. You're here if I need you. There was a rolling explosion as Nalian used her own power. Waves of the defensive and repair drones were obliterated. Hot scrap metal scattered at the corner where the edge of the tower met flat ground and along the interior floor, where they'd be sent flying back through the open door. Inside, there was vacuum, which the group had to fight past, using handholds and powers. They reached the stairs and climbed up a floor before the air was available again. The interior was hollow, with complete floors at set, clearly planned intervals. A staircase ran up the side of the tower, while a vortex of airless void plunged down the middle, as if the lack of air was a force unto itself, filling the bottom floor as air was forced out. The waves of defensive drones were apparently endless, minimal in their design with only two or four legs, and a basic weapon each, sometimes with their brain circuitry or batteries exposed, and often with some of the alien metal used in the tower's construction as extra armor. What was the distance, they'd said? Thirty-one miles? Then this was an ascent that could require them to travel for thirty-one miles up with drones every step of the way. Ten or twenty on every flight of stairs, and the firepower she'd brought to bear with Nalian and Mushroom threatened to destroy stairs, making the climb more dangerous. She dismissed them. Two others. Thirty-eight in gobsmack. Thirty-eight almost immediately matched up with Lead Letter, the pair of them shooting in concert, trading off drone executions. An uphill battle, in a sense. Edgeless took the lead, not out of any specific intent, but because he was the only one who didn't need to slow down as he pounded the villains with soft, doughy hands that could batter, but which could easily struggle to finish even a lowly drone off. Voltrage, however, could collect debris and absorb incoming fire, letting his electromagnetic shield charge up and then release it all in a burst that wiped out a whole flight or two of drones. One flight clear, 430 more. She dismissed Exclavage the Rack and called up Goose Down, a supportive ex-heroine who could buoy the team. She would climb 400 stories on her own if she had to, but the shattered remnants of drones threatened to sprain ankles or cause people to fall. With the lift Goose Down provided, they moved faster. With a bit of time, they got better at dispatching the drones. The things were fragile and stupid, prone to repeating the same behavior without learning from the destroyed drones. The faint and kick combination that worked against one worked against another. Beyond the stairwell, she could see daylight and the rush of the heated, condensed air along the tower exterior, being swept up and channeled up by the design of the tower. Zapator, the Underminer. The shadows she already called out felt the appearance of the fifth of their kind. They would feel a fraction weaker and slower. The net loss was much greater, but she did have Cleo, Voltrage, and Edgeless. Bombs? she asked. Traps? I don't want the tower to self-destruct when we're at the top. Quatero. Grazie, she replied in her accented Italian. The drones were numerous enough that they could come down the walls, now, or fall between the stairs and land on the stairs below, with just enough surviving the fall to be a problem as they attacked from the rear. Cleo threw a knife at one, knocking it over. Three more appeared at the same step a moment later. It was bad enough that Voltrage wasn't able to release his shield because the incoming fire was too incessant. The group would be riddled with holes in the one second it took him to regroup and bring his shield back into place. As it was, the lightning barrier rippled to the point it was hard to see past it. Niente qui. Vaisu? Zapator asked. Up, she replied. Be ready, Voltrage. The moment we stop. Away with thirty-eight the eye, she called on Yonder the Gatherer. Yonder needed to gather power. When they did, it was to gather everyone in a bubble of air. 
Beyond that bubble, the electromagnetic shield kept most of the enemies at bay. The bubble lifted the group with a suddenness that made the stomach lurch. They flew up ten stories, and then they stopped. The bubble caught them again as Yonder prepared to move them again. A good thing considered the mile-long drop beneath them. Here, undisturbed. The walls were so covered in the blinking lights of drones that a human couldn't put a hand flat against the wall without touching one of those lights. At least one light to each drone. No drone any larger than a medium-sized dog, many as small as a gourd. Voltrage released his power. Electricity in the stored accumulation of bullets and other weaponry was flung out in every direction. It crackled against railings and against the machinery inlaid in the interior walls. Sideways, she instructed. The air bubble floated over to the wall, and the assembled group was deposited on the stairs against that wall. Already there were more drones making their way down to fill the void. It was getting hard to breathe, because the burned electronic smell, the ozone, and the burned air from the laser fire the drone's output was so noxious. Oh my god! Cleo whispered. Zabator shook his head. Take us up further, Valkyrie ordered, or this will take forever. Forever. Even with the shortcuts taken, it took half an hour for them to reach the point in the tower where an attack had been made by heroes to halt construction. The tower, barrel, space elevator had nearly collapsed, but enough infrastructure had been at the top to hold it up until repairs could be made. She could see the scars and the effect it had on the air running along the exterior. Up another hundred stories. Her people were getting tired, so she tapped other resources. Diaspora served to turn drones against one another while masking the group's presence. Mudstreak slowed the drones down, turning nearby surfaces into goop the finer or less nuanced legs couldn't work with. But there was no substitute for a good violin. At least sometimes. In the absence of the gunners and mass destruction capes, the drones soon pressed in, until they were up against the electromagnetic field again. Voltrage was getting tired. This is worse than the fucking world ending! Voltrage screamed the words amid pans for breath. Where his hair had stood on end before, sweat now slicked it close to his scalp. No, it isn't, Valkyrie answered him, her voice nearly lost in the chaos. What can I do? Cleo shouted. Valkyrie wasn't able to answer, because the noise rose. Yonder was signaling that he was ready for another air bubble. Up another hundred stories. Zapator signaled for the group to go back down another ten stories, because he had identified the collection channels which captured particular matter and carbon from the air for the purposes of making materials. Centrifuges were sorting that material by atomic weight. Voltrage seemed happy to destroy something that wasn't replaced a moment later. The debris flew into the airless vortex right down to the middle of the tower and was cast straight down. The air was getting thinner as they ascended. Yonder's air manipulation turned toward ensuring the group had enough to breathe. The final twelve floors. Machinery tore free of the walls. Robots, loaded to bear with higher-end weapons and covered from head to toe in the hardest armor this structure seemed able to provide. Cleo's thrown knife and a slip of paper seemed to glance off. Voltrage's power rocked the military robots, but it didn't damage them. Edgeless threw himself into the fray, pummeling. Alone, the muscle-bound brute was able to keep two of the robots from turning their weapons on the group, though he couldn't stop them. Valkyrie added her own strength to the affair, unfurling the living wings that one of her creations had attached to her costume, then drawing her weapon. Her blade plunged into the first robot's head, and as she pulled it free, she used the force of the blade coming free to sink it into the neck of another robot. Relentless, dangerous, but ultimately lacking in imagination. She had an idea of what she was up against by the time her squadron reached the workshop floor. Drones were adding layers to the wall, gathering hot metal and beads that they laid into gaps as the workshop floor rotated above. With a continual rotation, gaps were exposed, and their platform steadily ascended. She pushed open the door. Not a conclave of mad tinkers. No lesser endbringer. A man was small and broken. Tinker technology riddled his body, not as a cyborg might do but as an invasive organization would. 
as a tree shifted its branches to work around in a moving object, like a fence or hydrant, the man's body had worked around the technology. His belly faced the sky, and he was almost naked, before the catheters and other tubes that festooned his nethers, much as they did nose, ears, and heart. He was moved as a quadruped moved, arms extended back as far as they would go, following the limping gait of the greater construct. There were shackles that were clearly bolted to bone, the flesh angry around where that bolt had gone in, and some of those shackles served as places for tech to hang off of, including clusters of miniature arms and manipulating devices. He, or it, was gathered around what looked like a motherboard, one arm hooked into a complex array of wires that stretched taut or ran between walls and from ceiling to floor. The small arms and tools handled the finest details, like soldering spots or on a computer board. The rigging of wires helped make the larger movements almost instantaneous, and the Tinker Tech festooned hands covered the remainder. A human eye watched them as the body worked. He called for no drones, drew no weapons. Still, Valkyrie knew she had to be careful. The entire body tensed. The man's body arched, belly reaching toward the ceiling, and then he gagged. With choking coughs and the smell of burned flesh, he deposited white hot metal onto the floor of his lap. Mechanical hands slid it across the floor. The scholar, Valkyrie thought, before she had even properly looked. Cyan had been the warrior, but he hadn't been alone. The scholar was long gone. But the fragments that had made her, her, were still out there. There were some with a more malicious design, intent on breaking their hosts. Specific, dangerous hosts. It was hard to divorce her line of thinking from the way she'd used to think, faced with one of the dangerous ones. She wasn't worried. She wasn't afraid. And she hadn't been for the entirety of the climb. Stressed, yes, but only that. Now, pity. The man's back was arching again. Valves in the tangle of catheters and other tubes were switching. It wasn't urine that vented out, but something colorless and cloudy. Long after it had finished venting, the man spasmed and twitched as much as he was able. His legs and arms were moved without his permission, dragging him here and there so other limbs and parts could work turned into his own workshop, his resource supply, and apparently provided all the care the agent could provide that would keep him alive. A Tinker Tech Tower, 31 miles tall, created by one monster of the most inhuman nature. Past a certain point, he would have created things like the resource collection vats that distilled carbon from air. He would have automated the creation of drones. Cleo. Cleo stepped forward. This is why you wanted me? Whoever or whatever it was, if they were angry enough to aimlessly destroy worlds, they needed to be put down. Cleo nodded. She drew a knife from beneath one layer of clothing, testing its weight in one hand, then spat on the blade. She threw it at the man, the blade sinking in where neck met shoulder. Flesh almost immediately began to die, turning black. The Tinker Tech set to work, gathering resources, kits of regenerative bioagent, making injections, and excising damaged flesh all at the same time. The poison was faster. Valkyrie waited, listening and watching. There. The broken man. She could identify him now. See the power he was given. When she created him as a shade, he was a man again, without the technology hanging off of him. He did stand with a hunchback, knees close together while feet were planted further apart, knobbly need. Even like this, existence seemed to be painful for him. Lingering psychic effects. How long were you working on this? <sighs> he made a noise. You don't have to answer. Idle curiosity only. Three years of preparation. Two years of work. The broken man answered. 
Were there any fail-safes or traps built in? He nodded. Show my people, she said. She called up the Mad Bomber and the man who stands atop. Explain to them. Disable it. The broken man nodded again. Broken trigger, Cleo asked, dabbing at one eye. She had cuts on the side of her face, but they were small and shallow. No, nothing broken. The group was left to recuperate, the tinkers working on disabling the tower before anything untoward could happen. As she waited, standing silent, her helmet removed and resting on the edge of a desk beside her, she reached out to dial back, where he had a position deep inside her. Phone. The wardens need help with things, and they're worried about your silence. Tell them I'm fine. What do they need help with? Samark, was the reply. Almost instinctively, another spirit deep inside her shifted, agitated. Eidolon. David. The man's battery was nearly spent, and the cost of replenishing it was high. Stirred to life by the mere mention of his longtime opponent. That, she said the words aloud, feeling the weight of them, would be the opening act of a tragedy. Heads in the area turned her way, curious at how she'd suddenly started speaking to nobody. She waved them off. They agree, came the response. The wardens don't want you engaging with the seamer. But they need help covering other crises and targets while they focus on her. They know you're tired, but I'll go, she answered. The effect fluctuated barely visible in how it distorted the air. When looking at any person or thing closely enough, the light distorted around the very outline of that person, shining brighter or appearing darker than it was. This was like that outline, wrapped around a wide area. People in very drab clothing were gathered as a mass nearby, weary enough that they had huddled together, parents gripping their children to keep them from approaching or getting too inquisitive. Two people had gone inside the effect, fallen, and couldn't get up. Attempts to rescue with tools had failed. Shadows bubbled forth, emerging just enough to use powers or prod at the edges of the effect. The earth had diverged a hundred years ago. It was very lightly settled, and even there, it was largely by accident. Disease had hit just a touch harder during some critical years, and the population had floundered. Now she appeared before these people as something akin to an angel. Time, came the answer from a member of her greater entourage. Slow time. It's easier to enter the field than to exit. The fit barely noticed, but the sick and elderly can push out. She had a wide collection of shadows at her beck and call, and a strong squadron of other capes supporting her otherwise. It was a question of finding the right ones. At least here, there shouldn't be any wounds to tend, nothing to delay her. This was better than a mercy kill. Tinker Tech left unattended, a power run rampant. She had other work to do. There was a source to this effect. She walked away from the scene, listening and watching. Two of her servants followed as bodyguards. Milk was one. Cleo was another. Ma'am, someone called over. She motioned to her bodyguards to stay where they were. She approached the woman, an elderly matriarch. Yes, what can you say? The woman asked. A very small fragment of a very mighty creature that died two years ago. It touched this place, Valkyrie said. Did you see a golden light in this world two years ago? followed by devastation. We heard it struck on the far side of the ocean here. Valkyrie nodded. That was him. A piece of him fell, like a drop of blood, but he was complex and intricate enough that a single drop of blood could be a living, wanting thing on its own. That droplet could be divided even further, and each division would be a life unto itself. Like gods of myth, a very small piece touched here. And it found root. The effect is slowing time. It grows with every passing day, little by little. Is there anything that can be done? 
Yes. You can come if you want. I can't promise it will be pretty or easy. I should, shouldn't I? I'm in charge here. Valkyrie walked through the quiet town, one metaphorical ear to the ground. The woman walked beside her, and the two bodyguards walked a distance behind them, talking to one another. The woman looked back. Uncanny in appearance. Two words were accompanied by a visible shiver. Touched by specks of blood, which found root in them. As I heard it, the wardens that we broke bread and cracked drink with were the same. They did a good job of explaining things then. They weren't so uncanny, ma'am, the old lady said. These ones, Valkyrie started, searching for the words. They died, and I brought them back with some help. In exchange for this life, they've agreed to provide me with assistance. Some strangeness is to be expected. In another circumstance, they might have been the worst or most alarming words to say. Here, the old woman seemed to take it as matter of fact. What was a resurrection when an active attack from a parent god and visitors from another world were only two years fresh in one's memory? Here, Valkyrie said. I feel them over here. The Valkyrie was a circuitous one, knocking and getting permission to enter and finding nobody else within. It was only when Valkyrie and the now impatient old woman stepped out onto the porch that Valkyrie had a reason to pause. Machina Valley. The specter took form. No traps, she instructed. Then she pointed at the porch. We'll want to put it back with the way we found it. Or better. Machinavelli nodded, mechanical mask twitching between modes each time the head stopped moving. Nails were pulled free and boards were uprooted. In a matter of seconds, the porch was in its constituent pieces. Beneath it all, matted and wet, was a large dog, breathing hard. She could view it with a kind of double vision, and she saw the rush of images, the flickering, and a collection of impossibly tall people with the faces scrubbed away. I'm sorry, girl, she murmured. The dog? the old woman asked. Things aren't as they should be. How are fit for beings of myth are falling here and there like litter? Sometimes it dissipates. Other times it swells. And other times it finds its root, the old woman asked. This beast is the cause of your mysterious deaths and incidents. It couldn't know what it was doing. The massacres? I would guess it trapped prey by accident and driven to the edge by hunger. It ate pieces of the accidental victims. I see. Valkyrie had to pick her way through the foundations of the porch with concrete settings for pillars the pieces that couldn't be uprooted. She knelt by the dog. She could tell almost immediately. Too far gone. Even if it wasn't, it's incapable of using the power it has. More would die. Settling down, sitting in the mud, she coaxed the dog closer. Stroking it, she spoke to it in a soft voice keeping her awareness tuned for any power use or flickering from the animal. If I could conscious it, I would bring you with me, brave girl. How scared you must have been. The tone was more important than the words. She lapsed into her native tongue, and the dog seemed to like the sound of those words better. With her awareness of powers, she studied the dog as thoroughly as she could manage. The dog was fast asleep when Valkyrie snapped its neck. She could feel a tension release over the entire area as the ravelings of time came undone. The ones that had been slain by this accident of nature wouldn't be coming back either way. The mess was tidied up, a means of communication established, and farewell said. She actually used her phone this time, rather than relying on an intermediary. Chevalier. It's Valkyrie. I found the culprit. They are not blaming us. We're their new neighbors. They must have a reason to be squirrely. No blame. They thanked us and invited us back. That's a relief. Thank you, Valkyrie. Chevalier? It was a dog. Pardon? A dog with powers. I tried to feel around it, see why or how. I looked at the moment of the trigger. 
The poor beast had a refrain of human words running through its head at a critical time, and the agent was damaged enough to try meshing with the animal, sick and diseased as it was. How much do we need to worry about this? One in a million chance. But it's chance, and that chance may grow. I see. It's handled. I killed it. Damn, Chevalier said. The disappointment was so palpable she could have laughed if it weren't over a dead animal. Take my word for it, Chevalier. Whatever fun you might imagine a dog with powers to be, it would be the opposite in reality. You'd think I'd imagine it to be fun, Valkyrie. I think you have the traits of the best little boys and the greatest of men, Chevalier, with courage to spare besides. I can imagine the thought crossing your mind. There was an amused sound on the phone. Then, more somber, he said, It's shit to have to put a dog down. I'm sorry, Valkyrie. It's our mission. Staying sane and on the level is part of that mission, so we don't betray what we stand for. That means acknowledging the shittiness of it. You hear me? I hear and understand, she said. It also means taking a break. Return to the city. Rest. Unwind. You fought an army of ghosts, staved off a potential world ender with the atmosphere gun, hunted down and dealt with an exponential class S threat that had gone exponential. You had a week off where you were supposed to be resting, but you decided to hunt down the breaker assassin instead, and you went straight from that to this. A dog with powers. This was easy, she said. A touch sad, but easy. You were dealing with the sea merc. She was restless, but we can't figure out what she was actually doing. It was scary, but it was easy, as you put it. Can't keep going like this. Why did you go back to the city and relax? Sit around in your comfortable clothes and watch movies? Go hang out with friends? I know you have a standing invitation from an old friend of mine. I've never watched movies that I can remember. I've never hung out with friends. In the city? I'll think about relaxing, she said. But I'm fairly certain I'll come to the same conclusion I have before. That I need to do this. Valkyrie, he said, voice stern. I'm fairly sure I'm older than you, Chevalier. Don't talk down to me. I need to do this. To help, to make up for past acts, and to gather the resources and contacts to attend to my flock. Your flock? I thought you had to stop. She looked back in the direction of Milk, who was talking to Edgeless. I did. I want to find a way forward regardless. She seized on the word like it had a deeper meaning, a power to it that she could draw on. Regardless... If I were to put my needs aside, I believe the rest of the world needs me to do this. Too many of these incidents are ones only I have the ability to handle. I could refuse to give you any information. You could. You won't. You and Legend work through injury and sickness, exhaustion and mild insanity. You'll let me do the same, because you recognize the need. He was silent on the other end of the phone. Is there something you need for me to handle, Chevalier? There was a prison breakout in the city. Frankly, we could use some eyes on that situation until things settle down for sure. Shin is... Stuff's happening, Valkyrie. I have ways suspect that you're telling me out of Canivans, Chevalier. Has the job corrupted you so quickly? I am many things, but I am not conniving. To get me into the city for a task where there is nothing meaningful to do, leaving me nothing to do but rest. I have a very hard time imagining that there would be nothing to do there. Something else, Chevalier. Send me somewhere else. They're going to forget what you look like. I think they're already talking about you like you're a myth or a memory. Something else. Please. The battlefront, then. The Tyrant Kings. Africa, bet. I'll go. Cote d'Ivoire for headquarters? Yes. I'll contact you when I'm there. Good luck. I may see you and your flock there. He hung up. She put the phone away. 
Her flock was waiting for instructions. Everyone on duty is in rest mode. Head back home. Relax. Everyone at rest is with me. Prepare for war. Clouds of silvery poison gas rolled across black sand. Soldiers in gas masks ran up a hill and slid down the other side to where rocks provided some cover. Valkyrie walked through the poison gas, protected by shadows that had granted her boons before fading away. Her eyes teared up slightly, but that might have been the silicate dust rather than the chemical weapons. Her flock was in step behind her, their feet scuffing in the fine sand. Her shadows were likewise in step, but they made no sound, left no tracks. They had their own boons, but some had decided to wear the gas masks regardless. They wore no uniforms, but there was a commonality that tied them together, because their clothes had all come from the same stores at the same stops, or because they'd all come so close to the foot of the mountain that was her power, and then they'd come back. Subdued, but not submissive. Quieter, not quieted. Each and all of them remembered dying. Many remembered dying at her hands. It was a select few of those that she had brought into her flock. Nineteen individuals, favoring the young and disciplined, the powerful and the needy. Then she'd been forced to stop. The umber horse disaster had reared her ugly head and made her imminent presence known. The soldiers that had gone down the slope were none the wiser. Valkyrie approached within fifteen paces of them, then raised her rifle. It was only right that she kill when expecting it of her soldiers. She knew which of her flock would kill, and which might aim just off to the side so that they could claim loyalty and let their consciences rest easy. She had brought the killers and capturers. The skirmish that followed was quick and brutal. They were matched in numbers, but Valkyrie's number included ten parahumans, eight being members of her flock, and six shadows. The power shared out among them to allow for greater number, intimidation and distraction, at the cost of less raw ability. The opposing group was twelve or so Europeans who had hired themselves out as mercenaries, scum who enjoyed hurting people, pillaging and looting to the extent that they were staying on bet for it staying despite dwindling food and climate, health risks, and diminishing numbers. Scum with powers. She scanned her eyes over the glimmers, images in violence and pain. For five individuals in the group, the images were closely mirrored. One of the groups that had figured out how to create triggers. She identified the powers as best as she could by looking at the glimmers and identifying the agents by name and title. The Solemn Child. A tall, broad-shouldered man with a red sash. She aimed to take fire, and someone on the enemy side raised the wall. Shoot the one in red first, she ordered. The man could undo powers. Given a moment's opportunity, he could undo hers, and her power wouldn't be the same again. There was a small measure of satisfaction as she watched the man die, the top of his head removed as it poked for cover. She avoided collecting him, leaving his power where it lay. As others died, one by one, her own side holding firm while the enemy dwindled, she inhaled and exhaled steadily. Calm in the storm, in the endless thunder of more than thirty weapons going off, then twenty weapons. Her hand was steady, her aim true. She had her rifle in one hand and a shield in the other, and she held her ground, shield out in front. When there was a pause, she brought her rifle around, firing off a series of shots. A bullet came close enough to touch her costume, though it left her untouched. One of her shadows was being cheeky, letting them get that close. She felt no fear. Her flock protected her, and her shadows warded off harm. One power remained on the enemy's side. She saw the glimmer, and she drew at her power, bringing her shadows closer, raising them into the air as floating images, fully clear. If he aimed at me and shot me in the heart, if the shadows I've instructed to protect me move too slowly, I could die right here. The glimmer proved to be truth when the man raised himself up, surrounded by a storm of black sand. Painfully bright slices of light lunged out of the ground and closed around him, with more sprouting out of the ground to make approaching him difficult. 
Of the sixteen powered individuals with her, none seemed able to break or disrupt the shell. The prism slowly rotated, its pointed tip aimed at the horizon. As it moved to the side, the ground under it was made jagged with razor slices of light. If he got away with this message, it could mean that the local warlord was alerted about what he was up against. Not disaster, but it could mean that the captives in the warlord's possession could become hostages or negotiation fodder. Better that he didn't know was taking out his forces and forcing them to keep his armies closer and closer to home. He can't get away. I want to fly, she thought. A shadow lurking within her responded, and it lifted her up. The crystal jolted into motion, going from zero to two hundred miles an hour in an instant. She only barely intercepted it, her fingers grazing the surface, bending painfully and burning at the brush with the light. But she made contact with something. She held onto that something with her power. He flew away, and a part of him stayed behind. He made it a few hundred feet before the power quit on him. His body tumbled into the sand, the gas mask coming loose. He didn't reach for it, scramble or gasp in pain at the poison he was inhaling. For all intents and purposes, he was in her grip. She'd taken his life the moment she'd made contact. She let that glimmer of life and the simulacrum of power and personality settle into being. A shadow. I need you to tell me where the captives from the raids in Rome are being kept, she said. The shadow shook its head. Tell me what you know about the people who tell me what you know about the people who can create the triggering moments. She saw and felt the surprise. He knew something. And again a head shake. You'll realize your position soon, she said. She looked at the pair of human that had come with her group. Any others? The woman shook her head. As they prepared to leave the area, walking through the sand and checking the bodies for any identification, Valkyrie plotted a course that took them past the body of her shadow. She made sure that he saw the corpse and the face. This is what you have wrought, she thought. But we will return to Gamel, that land of second chances. And you may, given in time, have yours as I had mine. There were other squads roving a village that had been evacuated in advance. Motley groups. They used chemical weapons to make fighting back in response impossible, then rove through the vulnerable areas where the only ones alive were gasping for breath. Three more squads. There were more parahumans among them, but it was closer to the conventional, with the normal soldiers outnumbering the parahuman auxiliary. She didn't collect the fallen. Valkyrie's group had two captives, bound and firmly sealed with powers, and those captives took the bulk of the preparation time as they prepared to leave, figuring out how to carry them out. Once the job was done, the group organized, powers were gifted and shared out, and they flew as a squadron, so close to the water that their toes could trail on the surface, and the spray of mist both drenched and concealed them. She breathed air with no traces of poison in it, and she felt anxiety. She drew near to the warden's base in Cote d'Ivoire, and that distant anxiety grew nearer by equal measure. On the horizon, a fan of blue-white lasers rained down on a territory. It was Legend who had arrived, not Chevalier. The portal to Gamel loomed as the centerpiece of their destination, well before they were able to set their feet down on solid ground again. People scattered with places to go, showers to take to get poison off, and minor wounds to tend to. The city needed help, but she couldn't do anything to help it. She could do this, ensuring that no one person would amass the power or the army necessary to seize the portal. This portal, and come through to raid the one lucrative settlement on Gamel. They would have to bring boats through, but there were boats here. There were too many human rights abuses, too many cities worth of people being prevented from leaving. There were pockets like this all over, and as winter approached, things looked grimmer and grimmer. Did it go okay? One of the capes on duty asked. A PRTCJ uniform. It went fine, Valkyrie answered. No casualties, 
Some captives. We'll get information on the powers they've been using. I have the spirit of one, and I think he'll tell me what he knows soon. Wow. That's pretty crazy creepy, the BRTCJ officer said. Perhaps, Valkyrie replied. Excuse me. I need to rinse off the poison before the adaptations fade. As she walked away, she could hear a whispered exchange between the PRTCJ officers. You can't just call them creepy when they're Valkyrie Crystal. Oh, just stole a soul, gonna interrogate it. Nothing wrong about that. Valkyrie paused. Oh, shit. The not Crystal PRTCJ officer replied before ducking away. Don't just run and... Hi, again, Valkyrie, PRTCJ Officer Crystal said. You don't like it? You've been on the front lines here, in the Northwestern American states, and in Russia. You've seen what we're up against. We need information. I don't like it, Crystal said. It will be more lives saved in the long run. It's capturing someone's very essence... It's deeply, deeply uncomfortable. If you're capturing guys on our side with permission to bring them back like I've seen, I'm okay with that. Otherwise, I'm not cool with it. I'm not going to shoot you or fight you or anything, but not cool. I've had at least one of these conversations every day for the past few months, Valkyrie said. Different points, different particulars. I have people telling me to take time off, but this... This is what wearies me. Am I wrong? What am I missing? You might be right. I just find that having the conversation constantly put before me is... Uh, it's hard. If I hadn't taken his life and automatically drawn him into me, he would have notified key people, and we would have lost the element of surprise. And many more would have suffered and died. I don't believe in ends justifying the means, sorry. I just think once you start thinking that way, you stop looking for this hard-to-spot answers. But I'm a flying blaster girl. Pew pew, it's shitty of me to judge you when I get the easy, awesome round, and you get the power with the built-in moral dilemmas. Valkyrie smiled. I'll think carefully before I press him. Can I ask, before we part ways, a fiddly question? Sure. Crystal responded, drawing at the sun in a hesitant way. Why, Crystal? Your power doesn't match, as far as I can see. I... I could be a fly-and-shoot crystals girl, for all you know, Crystal said, almost defiant now. But you aren't. If it's an issue, I can leave you alone. No, it's not an issue. It's just weird, you know? Crystal is my name, Valkyrie. My birth name. It's not a secret. Of course. I feel stupid now. Nah, Crystal said, smiling a bit. There's a small sort of rescue as legend dropped out of the sky, spotted Valkyrie, and flew over. Suddenly very intimidated, Crystal said. Wow, hi. I'm going to walk away. You've been doing good work, Laser Dream, Legend said. Take care of yourself. Mute, Crystal nodded, before flying off. Legend sighed. I have one captive. My team has two more, Valkyrie said. Doesn't matter, Legend said. What doesn't? The warlord of this area is surrendering. We still need to see how the politics fall down. But they think the army will return to its prior state, and they'll serve the state, not the challenging party. There'll be some tidying up to do, but they will protect the portal. We're done? She asked. There was that faint, anxious feeling again. The fear. The wardens? No, the wardens aren't done. But we are. They don't need people who can level armies or subdue errant nation-states. They need attention, resources, time, and a careful eye. We can keep things tidy here with a skeleton crew, he answered. Turn our attention to other things. For the specific moment, Valkyrie? Legend asked. There's nothing. 
the monsters are quiet or dealt with. The armies are hunkering down for the cold winter. The unrestrained power effects seem to be restrained and quarantined for now. There is only the city, which is seeing its first snow, just days after freezing rain. They're trying to find the equilibrium, and they're counting on our help. She pressed her lips together. I know you don't want to take a break, Chef told me, but I assure you, there's a lot of work to be done there. It won't be a break. I think, she started. She saw his eyebrows go up. If things are quiet everywhere else, I may take that vacation I've been told about. His eyes searched her face, looking for the lie or the catch. Hard to imagine. It'd be healthy if you did. I have errands to run, she thought. If there are no monsters to slay, warlords to oust or towers to topple, there are still things that need attention. I'll leave my flock with you, she said. A week. A week of searching, of flying through worlds with only her shadows for company and assistance, of finding the meat and vegetables for her own meals, including tubers and edible roots found in nature that were dim substitutes for the things found on supermarket shelves. Her shadows prepared and cooked the meals while she rested. A week. A week, a day, and four hours, and she found the first settlement. Shattered buildings had been repurposed. Graves were laid out at the far side of a field. Water, food, and shelter seemed to be secured. There were cheers and cries of excitement as they saw her, an eerie feeling given that they were people from the city. The Megapolis. And the questions, they came one after another. They wanted to know what had happened. The portals had expanded and then things had connected. People had been cast through and they wanted to know why. They wanted to know about the city, and if the city was okay. She felt as impatient as she ever had, and she forced herself to answer in as patient and measured way as she could. It might have taken ten or fifteen minutes before there was a break in the conversation long enough for her to ask her own question. The wardens. Did their headquarters come through here? Yes, actually, came the response from a younger member of the group but that answer was less of an answer than the exchange of glances, the silence from the people who had been so talkative a short while ago. A finger pointed the way, and Valkyrie flew in that direction, buoyed by shadows. Had the two sides switched, the remnants of the warden's headquarters serving the hundreds who had come through on the other side, the remnants of the one or two apartment buildings lying on their side for the patch of people situated here, it might have seemed more fitting. She released the shadow that was allowing her to fly and stepped to the edge of the ward in sight. Riley was here. So was Rinke. There was a thinker who had been kept in isolation because he found stimuli to be too much, and there were five members of the warden's office. Again, she was pulled into conversation when she only wanted to ask. Questions about the state of things and that sing-song rhythm that Rinke and Riley could pull her into, where they played off one another and seemed so natural, in a world that felt so hollow, shadowy, and unnatural. A siren call. Because they were Rinke and Riley, it took even longer for the gap in the conversation to happen. After twenty minutes, Valkyrie couldn't effectively interrupt. Rinke wasn't making goblins, he was making homunculi, and he felt that was an important distinction, because they didn't have personalities, and they existed purely for labor. Riley had questions and answers, and she'd been experimenting to figure out options. Rinke had things to say about being king, or not being king. But Jessica appeared, knees and hands grimy from gardening or farming on the small scale, and Valkyrie abandoned the conversation quite likely offending the king who wasn't. Ciara! Jessica greeted her, smiling wide. You found us! Ciara nodded. Emotions welled up, but she managed to keep them from overflowing. I've only had the chance to seriously look for a week, Ciara admitted. A week you've been away from the city? Ciara nodded. Still keeping your distance, I see. Venturing this far away from home when you could be there? It was meant to be joking. Light, 
Observation, not admonishment. But Ciara wasn't used to showing weakness. The tower and the atmosphere gun. The sea merg. The power effects betraying convention. Broken triggers. Ghosts. Tinker devices left unattended. Chemical weapons. Mutants. War. Being hated or treated as alien or creepy everywhere she went. Being judged for tending to her flock. Being judged for failing her flock. She could deal with that. She could stand tall and she could face it down. They were comfortable unknowns and question marks. The city. We've talked about it. Why, I'm staying comfortably away. Ciara said. The biggest threat. Jessica said. The biggest threat. Yeah. I'm terrified, Jessica. This was a production of Ward by Parahuman Audio. Ward and the Parahuman Stories are written and owned by J.C. McRae. You can find the original text and support the author at parahumans.net. For more of the Ward audiobook, as well as other community works, please visit parahumanaudio.com. Music for this chapter was by Evan Witt. Find out more at wittynotes.com. Editing by Tom Rickert. Find them on Twitter at T-E-E Rick. Narration by Robert Rain Ramsey. Find more of their work at our website. Thank you for listening.